All right. So welcome to the second hearing of Portfolio Committee Number 6, Transport and the Arts, for the additional round of the inquiry into Budget Estimates 2023-2024. I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the tra traditional custodians on the lands on which we are meeting today. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. My name is Kate Fairman and I am Chair of the Committee. I welcome Minister Aitchison and accompanying officials to this hearing. Today the Committee will examine the proposed expenditure for the portfolios of regional transport and roads. I ask everyone in the room to please turn their mobile phones to silent. Parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses in relation to the evidence they give today. However, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of the hearing. I urge witnesses to be careful about making comments to the media or to others after completing their evidence. In addition, the Legislative Council has adopted rules to provide procedural fairness for inquiry participants. I encourage committee members and witnesses to be mindful of these procedures. So welcome and thank you for making the time to give evidence. Minister Aitchison, I remind you that you do not need to be sworn as you have already sworn an oath to your office as a Member of Parliament. I also would like to remind all the other witnesses that you do not need to be sworn as you have been sworn at an earlier budget estimates hearing before this committee. Today's hearing will be conducted from 9.15am to 5.30pm. We are joined by the Minister for the morning session from 9.15am to 1pm, with a 15 minute break at 11am. In the afternoon, we'll hear from departmental witnesses from 2pm to 5.30pm, with a 15 minute break at 3.30pm. During these sessions, there will be questions from the opposition and crossbench members only, and then 15 minutes allocated for government questions at 10.45am, 12.45pm and 5.15pm. We'll begin with questions from the opposition. Uh, Mr Sam Farraway. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Minister. Good morning. Um, Minister, do you consult with government MPs prior to budget estimates hearings? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. And, um, yes, I, with government MPs, yes, I do. And um, non-government as well. Yep, so, so you meet with crossbenchers prior to budget estimates hearings? Um, well, like how much prior do you mean? I try to meet with people. Well, no, no, in relation to budget estimates hearings. Um, uh, maybe, yeah. Well, yes or no? Maybe yeah, is yes, I do. I think, like, it's not a planned thing, but if, if there's a question, I try and address it. Right. Um, so, have you, your Chief of Staff, or anyone from your office, consulted with government MPs uh, or on the witness list or a request to call witnesses for today's budget estimates hearing? Uh, yes, I think there was, you know, some questions about who was coming and who was being asked to appear. So did you consult with or instruct government MPs uh, to block certain I'll take witnesses? Point of order here. Um, take point of order has been taken. There's an invitation here from the members of the, because this, this line of questioning relates to the deliberations of this committee and the members of this committee, and there's an imputation there that the members of this committee are subject to instruction from the minister, and I take offence at that. And I want to withdraw. Yes, I, I, um, the questioning for budget estimates is always incredibly broad. Uh, goes, uh, you know, often way ob obviously beyond uh, the budget papers and sits within ministers' portfolios. That's always fine. But when it does come to the deliberations of the committee and the imputations about committee members, um, that so is I'll, appropriate. I'll, 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 I'll ask I'll the remove, member. I'll remove the word instruct then. Did, <laughs> did you consult with government MPs with regards to today's mm -hmm. committee uh, budget estimates hearing about, about witnesses to be called? I was, you know. Again, I'm going to take the no, point of order. I, 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 I didn't suggest that. There, there is a, there has been a point, another point of order taken, Mr. Dedan. I mean, the issue, this is the, this line of questioning, I think, is is problematic uh, from the perspective that the deliberations of this committee should not be the subject of a, a line of questioning to the minister. It's um, totally inappropriate. To I, the, I to the point on, of order. On the point of order. Have, excuse me, Mr. Latham, uh, Ms. Ward. Uh, to the point of order, um, Chair, the um, member rephrased the question to exclude that part of the deliberations of the committee and merely asked the Minister um, about what she had done and she started to answer the question. And we should answer the question and move on. 
um, I the the member is um, asking uh, the uh, government witness. Oh, sorry, the, the member's asking the witness about who was con who they consulted, who she consulted in relation to witnesses before this committee, which I think is in order. And can I say, ministers um, consult with government members in all the time in terms of witnesses on committees. So yeah, it's not a trick question. usual practice. It's, it's not it a is the question. usual practice, but I'll um, allow the um, question um, carefully uh, if the minister. Look, respond. Uh, Mr. Faraway, I, I understand there might be some concerns you had about witnesses. I know last time we were here, you asked an inordinate number of people to come. In fact, we could barely move in the room and sit in the room, and uh, a lot of those people didn't really get questions and didn't get them for the first session. And so, you know, the government's looking at the resources that are being put into budget yeah. estimates. It's something that um, you've been uh, very happy to use those resources to the best we'll, of your we'll, ability as we'll a Shadow Minister, the question, and I respect Minister. that. We'll redirect but the question. So, uh, specifically, why did government MPs, or why was it taken as a government decision to block two executive directors that were requested to appear today well, I'm going to take a, this a point of order on that as well, because the imputation okay, there wait, is just one, one, one second. So you've taken a point of order. Yes. Yep. Continue. Well, the imputation is that the, well, clearly the government don't have a majority on this committee. So it's not a question of the government blocking anything. That's, that's not a point of order, Mr. Dowden, with respect, that's not this, a this point of order. This is a question about the deliberation of this committee, and it's inappropriate. Right. Clearly, getting a response. Um, so continue with your questioning, um, but do be careful in terms of uh, anything that implies okay. the way in which this committee has made decisions, as the uh, member has said, and uh, deliberations of this uh, committee. Minister, have you consulted with government MPs or any, any members of the committee regarding calling Mr Peter McNally and Mr Martin Donaldson before today's estimates hearing? Mr. Faraway, I think there's, uh, you know, an issue in terms of how many witnesses have been called over um, these hearings by yourself, and whether, um, you know, that that is a good use of uh, taxpayer resources. I mean, there's no government position. You ask me what the government position. There's no government position. It's just the real so reality is to that. To redirect, you know, Minister, from that part of your answer where you talk about my requests <laughs> and resources. Um, noting that I only requested for two specific transport officials to attend today's hearing, and I also released one. That is that is public, you know. That that, that is not uh, we'll take making a, a reflection on right. the committee. Um, this is cabling okay. with well, the decision of, of this committee. This, yeah. this committee has made decisions mm -hmm. about. This. It's yeah. up to us about which witnesses get called. Yeah. A majority of this committee has determined that which yes. witnesses get called. Yes. You know. Yeah. Thank disagreeing, you. the minister okay, can I'll make suggestions. The, the government you. members can put forward the proposition. No, the committee, the committee decides. Mr. The majority da determines. Adam, I've, I've heard enough, and I, I don't think, just in terms of redirecting the question, that that language that coalition members have been using uh, for the last few budget estimates, which. Uh, if we can not ask questions about the deliberations of this committee in terms of how we um, uh, came to the witnesses that we came to, please, is that is a, that that is material in relation to I've made my point. the committee, I've made my point. not the minister okay. and her portfolio. Thank you, Minister. Who from your office briefed crossbenchers on my call for papers in the House relating to the Coffs Harbour bypass project? Um, look, Mr. Faraway, your, um, you and your colleagues in the upper house have made some very, um, I think, derogatory comments under parliamentary privi privilege around my staff. I don't propose to give up names, more names of people or any other names, uh, be who've been doing their work in good um, faith, not, and have been verbaled by. Well, Minister, to, to, so to redirect, are you prepared? Did, did your office did your office brief cross benches on the on my call for papers regarding the Coffs Harbour bypass? That is correct. Okay, so and I referred to the Australian article by Stephen Rice on the twentieth of January, and I'm sure <laughs> you are familiar because you are quoted in this article, Minister, and it says the Australian can confirm that a ministerial <laughs> official suggested to at least one crossbench MP staffer, and I, and I reiterate, Minister, that the Australian confirmed this, 
that Ms Hicks was mentally unstable, with the subtext being that it would be damaging for her to have material placed on the public record. New South Wales Regional Transport Minister Jenny Aitchison said, I reject the assertion, as I have said in Parliament media interviews multiple times, I feel great concern for Ms Hicks and members of staff, uh, and everyone should feel safe at work. Um, what was the strategy and what was said in these briefings to crossbench staffers? Mr Faraway, I want to put on the record very front up here that I feel enormous um, sympathy for Ms Hicks. I am Minister, could you just, sorry, just speak into oh, the sorry. microphone a little bit more. Thank yeah. you. Can you hear me? Yeah. I, I want to put on the uh, record that I, I really share so much empathy for Ms Hicks. I think she has done an incredible thing, which is call out behaviour when uh, it was being minimised at the first point, And that is something that no one should have to go through. And that is my approach to this whole situation, that, sh that no one should have had to go through that kind of bullying behaviour. And certainly my staff have uh, shared that view with me. I know I've held the portfolio of prevention of domestic violence and um, sexual assault. I have been a lifelong advocate around stopping violence against women, but in actual point of fact against anyone. I'm appalled by those threats that were made. Um, I've spoken to a lot of victims and survivors of so that Minister, kind of abuse. Have you spoken with Rochelle Hicks? Um, no, I haven't. Right, so Minister, just redirecting the question just with regard to your answer. What do you say who, to Ms Hicks who has publicly said to the Australian, I'm extremely distressed that the Transport for New South Wales and the Minister, meaning you, are resorting to undermining me? Well, that uh, comment is a really understandable comment and I have a lot of sympathy for Miss Hicks in so the situation. So why have you been undermining Miss Hicks? I haven't been undermining her. I don't then say that it's Ms. true, Hicks but that that's claim. her perception and that's fine. But, and I respect her right to frame these events in her own words. And, you know, I think about a lot of people who've been in a similar situation as her, who've been in the public sphere and had, uh, an extremely traumatic experience talked about uh, at length without with limited capacity f to her for her to mm. really engage in that and um, you know I think we ha there was an investigation ongoing at the time that the SO52 was called for and has that investigation concluded so do you want me to finish the answer that no I'm redirecting it from part of your evidence I'd like to know if that investigation has concluded uh, my understanding is that investigation. Uh, well, look, actually, I would. Put okay, that's that right. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to we'll come back to Mr. Murray maybe later in the afternoon. But uh, Minister, what do you say to these claims by that are made very publicly here in the Australian that your chief of staff implied to crossbench MPs that Ms. Hicks was unstable? I can say with absolute certainty, absolute certainty that that is absolutely incorrect. But further, I am so appalled so that, that those claims were made to, in to, Parliament to, to under redirect, privilege. To redirect, and if, I if am you very can say with sad and upset that it is untrue, who's lying? Are you saying that, that an, a crossbench MP or their staff are lying? I can say, as I've said, with absolute certainty, that is completely untrue. That if there is a crossbencher here that, or in, the Parliament, I would welcome them to come to speak to me, but there are aspects of that claim, all of that claim, which is actually totally untrue. And the thing that distresses me, Mr. Faraway, so is, is that Ms. Hicks with regard to Ms. Hicks thinks to that that is true because order. she yeah. has order heard order it from Peter, Mr. Peter Primrose. Um, in terms of the um, um, procedural fairness resolution 19, treatment of witnesses. Witnesses will be treated with courtesy at all times. Yep. I would argue that to ask a minister a question and then to supposedly whatever redirection actually yeah, well, means, um, to cut off 
um, her being able to answer that question and to allow the suggested allegation to hang in the air is not a, yes. a matter of courtesy. Yes, I'll, I'll kind of make this uh, ruling at this point or this, this, well I understand that the subject matter is going to have uh, uh, considerable debate time, discussion time during today's uh, <coughs> estimates and I would like to uh, suggest to uh, all members uh, that if they allow the Minister to be able to respond, it's a serious issue and I do <coughs> believe that the Minister deserves to be able to put this on the record as well, uh, this whole process will go a lot more smoothly. Uh, so Mr Faraway, um, having said that Minister, it's also not an opportunity for you to talk for minutes and, and waste time because oh, no, that's, that's also right. very frustrating for members. No, I agree. So if we could each allow each other a little bit of uh, uh, you know, respect here, let's see how we go. Chair, uh, Mr. Faraway. if I may, I just would yeah. point out this is a six point of order, sixth point of order taken by yes. the government in ten minutes. And this oh, will hopefully reduce the, the number of points of order if we can uh, uh, do what I was just suggesting. So, Mr. Yep. Farrelly. So, Minister, do you feel that it was fair and appropriate that that transport for New South Wales officials, Ms. Higgs's superiors, tried to job performance her role and remove her from that project and role based on her complaint? Ms. Farrelly, I'm really glad you asked that question. I think it is really a good opportunity while the Secretary is here for him to refer to what that whole process was so that you understand it rather than what has been happening which has been a one-sided conversation over in the well, upper house well, well, Minister, which I has have not Mr. done Murray any here. justice to I have to Mr Murray here Ms. all Hicks. afternoon and I do have limited time with you this morning so I will ask Mr Murray those questions okay. this, this afternoon but in the meantime as the Minister responsible for that $2.2 billion project for someone who takes domestic violence very seriously, and I respect that and I take and acknowledge your contribution earlier, I'm asking you, as a Minister of the Crown, as the Regional Roads Minister, do you feel, or what are your, well, do you feel it is appropriate and fair that Ms Hicks, it was suggested that her superiors tried to job performance her out of her role and off that project? That is not an appropriate response to someone who is undergoing such incredible trauma and distress as she would have been undergoing at that time. I agree with that. But can I <coughs> say that you know we are aware, uh, transport is aware of uh, you know things were not handled from the get go. Miss Hicks should have been supported. She should have been given that support and. Uh, that obviously was not what she felt and those kind of uh, actions don't contribute and tend to override any other support that might be offered and that's completely understandable. Um, it should have been reported earlier, it should have been reported immediately. These are all things we know in retrospect but can I make the point that I have enormous faith that the department and uh, the secretary are taking all steps to address those issues, both in the initial uh, threat, but also in the way that uh, Ms Hicks was treated, and that there was well-intentioned actions that were also taken at the time. And it's unfortunate, it's terrible, in fact, for her. Uh, but everybody is doing what they can to try to resolve this issue. Thank you, Minister. Do you feel it is appropriate, appropriate, a appropriate response and behaviour from the project director, in and in the call for papers, this has been revealed, which I'm sure you're across, uh, that her boss, Rochelle Hicks's boss, project director Greg Nash, told her that removing Mr Brown wouldn't, and I quote, wouldn't be an option as it may go political, which would cause project issues. Do you believe that Transport for New South Wales should be making decisions around employee safety based on political considerations? Look, absolutely that's not the case. That's not something anyone would endorse. I, again, I direct you to ask that question to Mr Murray uh, because, you know, the Secretary has been very clear around that is not an expectation of transport. It's in the documents. And, sorry, I didn't hear that, Ms Wood. It's in the documents. But I think the question, sorry to be clear, the question to me was 
whether I thought that was appropriate. I don't think it was whether I was contesting that that had happened. So what about to the point uh, of Mr Nash's superior, Mr McNally, and in the documents, uh, uh, and when, when Rochelle Hicks had pushed uh, or Mr McNally that if they accepted Mr Brown's violent behaviour because he was Aboriginal, Mr McNally, and I accept that this is allegedly replied, absolutely we do. They are treated differently and absolutely we put up with the behaviour because he's Aboriginal. Is that something that the New South Wales Labor government will tolerate? Absolutely not and I think we've been really clear at all points on here that that is not acceptable behaviour. So what have you done as the Minister to implement change in this space? I have been working with the Secretary and I'm very cognisant of the delineation of my role under the Government Sector Employees Act that it is not my uh, ability or jurisdiction to direct him to take specific courses of action, but it is my role to make sure that I'm satisfied that he is undertaking his role to manage those situations as uh, properly and appropriately in line with government expectations. Now, everyone has been clear throughout this from the very first moment that I spoke on this topic in the media, when I spoke in the House, that where there are mistakes that have been made, we will work to uh, correct them, to address them, to put in the time in training, in development, in supporting people to make better decisions. That is where we're at. With regard to that, have you specifically <coughs> spoken with the Secretary around Mr McNally's response, uh, which was he, the next day after Ms Hicks uh, raise these concerns up the chain, uh, up the chain within transport, that Mr McNally sought support within Transport for New South Wales to remove Ms Hicks, Hicks from that project. Have you specifically raised that concern on behalf of the Cabinet and the Government with the Secretary? Of course. And what was the response? What what have you been able to well, achieve how about, in that time? How about moment? Mr Murray as, gives as minister, you his response? As the Minister for Regional Roads, as a Minister of the Crown, uh, someone that has uh, been a big advocate for uh, ensuring that we have safer workplaces, what have you done in the last six months to address this issue? I have spent... Literally... Oh, right, sorry. Um, I have spent literally hours on uh, this issue in terms of, you know, getting myself acquainted with those issues, of working out, of challenging, you know, what decisions were made, at what time, why they were made, etc. You spent hours, but you order, haven't picked up the order, phone to Ms. Hicks. Ms. You haven't Ward, called Ms. Her. Ward, order. Um, okay, uh, Minister, oh, I just wanted to get an update on the... Um, this is also coming out of the Bus Industry Task Force's second report. Mm -hmm. Wanted to get an update on the um, 16 City Service Improvement Program, the Regional City Service Improvement Program, because I understand that your the uh, website says it's concluded. Is that correct? The, fu the funding was not uh, sufficient that was allocated by the former government to complete all the 16 cities, but I will, I'm happy to pass to the Secretary to give me That's more fine. detail yeah. on that. Okay. Mr Fuller will uh, assist with that thank question. You. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, that uh, at the moment, as the Minister said, the current funding allocations for the rollout of the program has meant that um, all of the services have actually uh, occurred. I know in the last 12 months, I think it's something close to a thousand new services have been rolled out across regional New South Wales. Um, and the department, uh, the team are currently working uh, on options for uh, the future rollout of growth services. Um, you've probably uh, seen in the bus task force recommendations uh, a number of considerations around uh, getting greater access and equity for regional New South Wales. So we're currently working options up to provide those to government for further consideration. Yeah, okay, thanks for the update, Mr Fuller. So, uh, Minister, in relation to this, um, I understand that, yes, the website says it's concluded, and that's what you've said as well in terms of funding, um, but there are five cities as part of that 16 cities where implementation was contingent on funding. So yep. the funding envelope 
just um, remind us, was that in the last budget or earlier under the previous government? I think it government? was uh, under the previous government, but I guess what our approach has been, uh, and you know, I've done extensive consultations around the state on public transport and uh, you know, road networks and regional uh, transport and, and roads in terms of getting to that excess and equity uh, that we want in the regions. And one of the things that we have been uh, working on and we are, are going to be rolling out this year is strategic regional integrated transport plans. So this is looking at not just the 16 cities, but right across uh, regional New South Wales in terms of giving everyone the chance to have good public transport. And uh, that might not be a bus in the first instance. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. We're doing a very big consultation. We're working with uh, like local members at the state and federal level, the councils, local Aboriginal land councils, CWA, New South Wales farmers, business chambers, um, disability groups, you know, just really trying to broaden that consultation to get those services. When we rolled out the services in Dubbo, for example, it was the first time they'd have a seven day a week service. It was the first time they'd had a service to the hospital. It was the first time they'd had a service to a retirement village. We wanted those services to be much more specific. So I think some of the earlier ones, we were just transporting more air. Um, we wanted to broaden that consultation base. So there's a funding issue, but there's also in terms of rolling out across the state, making sure that you know no community is left behind. And some of them will need bespoke um, you know, uh, responses, things like um, the Wilbur bus, which we've just uh, extended that in Burke for another two years. Can I check, because I'll, I'll get into some more of the detail, I think, in the afternoon. Um, so why was the program not costed or budgeted correctly uh, in the first place to have been, what is it, a 15 or 16 cities? 16 cities uh, and for five to be left hanging. From your perspective, uh, what, why is that the case now to have announced, and if it was your predecessor, yep. uh, 16, uh, 16 cities, five cities, as I understand, Armadale, Grafton, Parks, Port Macquarie and Tamworth, kind of just left hanging but I assume they've expected something to come for some time and they've just been told that's it. Well, what, what went wrong? Well, I mean, I will, you'll have to get more information, obviously, from Mr Fuller on the specifics of it, but yes, it does concern me and it's something that we're dealing with across the portfolio. Like, a lot of times in the last uh, 11 months, I've turned up to communities to look at a, you know, $200 million commitment. There was never that money in the budget for it, um, so. Was the budget, was it budgeted for each city? So um, was I'll it broken down to 16 cities yeah, I'll refer and you to was it part. overspends? I mean, it is a bit extraordinary, I think. I do feel sorry for those five regional mm. cities. But we will get to them, but yes, I'll put you through to the department. Mr Fuller. I, I think the short answer to your question is that uh, the original commitment dealt with delivery for a range of cities and planning for others. Um, so it didn't extend to allocate the full amount for delivery of services across uh, the complete package as you preferred. And so Minister, do you think that was a good program to continue to commit to put in a, a, a bid for this year's budget to continue as is um, in terms of the feedback from the cities involved? Is it a program that you, it looks like that you will continue for those cities, that that's your intention? Look, there were elements of the program that were really good and again it's down to that consultation piece. Some of the council areas or some of the communities, um, I've had feedback that it, you know, it didn't meet the mark. It should have been a bit more targeted. Um, you know, we had um, community feedback from Griffith that it was great having, I think it was six services to the airport, but when you have to take one of them back to the airport to get a hire car because it doesn't really go out much further or to where they want to go, that was a concern to me. Um, another area where uh, I think Bathurst, they were saying they didn't feel that there was enough uh, services to service the hospital. So I think there were some things that could have been done better and we, you know, that's something we want to look at and that's part of that, that wider consultation piece that we're doing. Because I understand, could, so this, this announcement but has come late January, but when the bus industry task force was looking into it, they were recommending that 
it actually be extended to smaller towns beyond the 16. Yes. So uh, considering the expertise of that task force, the way in which they've taken probably the deepest dive into mm. uh, the circumstances surrounding buses, um, but driver shortages, everything, both in the city and regionally, um, it certainly sounds as though they thought it was good. And of course, mm. as we know, with every, you provide services to anywhere, there'll never probably be enough and people will say it would be good if it went there and there. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I think people are after some kind of certainty and I'm yeah. asking today particularly about those five cities, yeah. but with the bus task force saying it should be extended more widely, yeah. um, when, can, when can those regional cities expect to hear something back from you about what they will get in terms of enhanced services at the very least. Yeah, look, this this is really the nub of the issue, right? You've got a program that was announced to 16 cities. We've said the whole state, all of the regions, all of the rural and remote areas deserve better transport services. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do since we've gone, come to government is really challenge um, the conversations around public transport. You know, if it costs $150,000 to put a bus on or, or you could have alternatively $95,000 worth of school drive subsidy, for example, with a school bus service, what's the better use of taxpayer funds? Well, if there's a safety mechanism if it ensures all those kids get to school rather than having parents who won't apply for the subsidy, then obviously maybe the bus is a better solution. We are looking at these smaller communities. That's a real concern. Transport's, I keep saying it, a social determinant of um, education, of health, opportunity and jobs. So we want this to be successful, like we want the bus task force to be successful, we want um, better rollout of bus services across the state uh, because we know that that can change. But it will be sometimes other um, you know, initiatives. We're looking at a variety of other things, particularly targeting those small communities. Okay. You know, community transport, for example, because it's predominantly funded by the federal government, has quite strict uh, constraints on it, and yet we know that that's probably a good you know, vehicle for delivering some of these services. There's also on-demand buses. So, yes, there's lots of yeah. yeah. So we, we we're really committed to it. I guess that's what I can say now. We'll have more to say, obviously, in the budget. We'll be, yeah. you know, Just going speaking forward. of the budget then, uh, can we expect to see uh, an increase in the uh, overall funding envelope, the overall uh, budget for regional transport, not roads, regional transport uh, in the next budget? Look, I'm hopeful. We are trying to do that. Um, obviously, that's a the whole of government decision and I can't uh, anticipate that in these conversations with you today but um, definitely I'm advocating for that because you know that I think is one of the significant gaps of the former government of not having those opportunities <coughs> in public transport taken up. Um, thank you I just wanted to move to the regional rail project a quick question I'll take it up next time but the um, so where is that project up to in terms of how long is it going to be before we see the first uh, trains from that project in operation? Yeah, so look, uh, I uh, I just want to be up front here. Uh, minister Halen's actually the uh, minister in charge of that procurement and uh, I don't want to take up the time of the committee here uh, with that. I mean, really the the Premier of the day was saying that it was too expensive to build trains here, they were offshored, it's been you know, a project with the Infrastructure New South Wales Deep Dive published last year saying that it was 35 months overdue, the former government had to allocate an extra $826 million to the project. So you know, we are trying and we have been as a government trying to rescue this project. I'm really frustrated because I'd love to have better trains out in the regions, that would be great. Um, mm -hmm. but Obviously, you know, and I know Minister Halen is working really hard okay. on this. Well, let's but leave that I think, then. Yeah, if it's, you should if talk it's to. I really would urge <coughs> you to ask um, uh, Ms. Drover about that yep. in the afternoon. Thank you. Uh, okay, move to questions yeah, from uh, Mr. Benazia. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, I might just start off with the Yarrawandra Mawala Bridge. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. That project. Yeah. Yeah. So, are you you familiar that it's been 30 years in waiting uh, for that community to? Uh, get a new bridge and you know, obviously you, you weren't in government for those whole 30 years but you have shared some of that time. Um, my understanding is that both the previous state government uh, in New South Wales and the Victorian government uh, support this bridge. Uh, is that 
the is that the same now with your your government? Do you support a, a new bridge over Lake Moala? And when I say support, I also mean support in terms of funding it. Uh, in part. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Venezia, one of the concerns I think uh, I've expressed a number of times uh, in the past and talking in consultation around um, the. Uh, stayed in those conversations has been you know the fact that we have not really had a significant program of big bridge building for bridges that aren't solely timber bridges and um, you know the fixing country bridges program was quite constrained and we saw a number of uh, areas where we didn't get some of the outcomes it was fantastic and I do give credit to the former government uh, for the number of bridges that were completed in a short time but it was focused on one particular asset class obviously there's complications when it is um, sure. across uh, thank, border. thank you for those yeah. sort of preliminary comments, but can I bring you back to the crux of the question? Does your government support the funding part thereof? Obviously Victoria has to partly fund it, and obviously the federal government will possibly kick the can as well, but uh, are you committed to New South Wales funding its part in building that, that new bridge for those two communities? Uh, Mr Vanaziak, I think the uh, issue here is we are really focused on uh, the whole of the state and we are looking at regional plans, strategic regional integrated transport plans. I don't want to give you a commitment today on that. I'm happy to take it up with you and to give you a briefing on it or um, get the department to give you more details about the constraints there. You know, when we're look at talking about a problem that's got a long tail, I don't want to just say in a budget estimates hearing that we're doing one thing or another. I would like to give you a fuller response at time and I know you'll want to talk to the, um, the staff about it, but not now. You're so. obviously aware that there's well, I hope you'd be aware that there's close to over 2,000 traffic movements on that bridge per hour. Yeah. Um, and it is also a bridge that's used by the Department of Defence for moving what would be described as sensitive, <laughs> best described as sensitive uh, material. Mm. Um, how is this bridge not a priority in, in, in being upgraded? Well, uh, given that it's also reasonably narrow, um, and over 100 years old and has that many traffic movements. How is this not a priority? What I'm saying to you is that it's probably best to get the detail from the department around what the constraints are in that. Of course, we would want to fix everything. Do you want to jump in? Mr. Yeah, um, Mr. Hayes uh, can provide some more information on that portfolio. Good morning, Anthony Hayes, Transport for New South Wales. The, um, the, the Malwala Bridge is part of a, a broader conversation regarding um, all of the, the Murray River crossings. Mm. Um, we're working on a business case now, which we're expecting to finalise by the middle of the year, which will incorporate um, a, a plan for how we, how we address that. The, the, Malwala, Malwala Bridge is currently unfunded, but it's part of that broader conversation. Has, that's been, going has the business case been funded? Um, we're working the final on that now. Business yes. case been funded. We're working on the business case now. That wasn't the question. Is it? It's, has it been the final business case has been funded? You've got the money to do the, the business case. Is that not? Not at this stage. No. Okay. Um, if I go to the, a document on on your website, 2018, it, it talks about yeah the broader. Uh, looked at all the Murray River crossings, and this is, let's for context, this was produced in 2018, and you had six bridges listed as the top short-term priorities, and then you had Yarrawonda and Moala <coughs> Bridge listed as one of the three medium-term priorities. Can you define in any quantitative terms what you mean by short-term and medium? Because given that this document's now six years old, one would hope we've moved past those six short-term priorities. Um, and we'd be looking at these other three medium-term priorities, which well, Yarrawonda and Mawala is one. So can you confirm that we, we progressed through that list in any shape or form, or were we still stuck back in 2018? No, there's certainly been a, a great deal of work done focusing on all, all of the crossings uh, on the Murray, which is why the business case is being developed now. Um, it's again part of a, a bigger conversation. Um, we have developed a, um, a, a timber truss bridge strategy with Heritage New South Wales um, and with the Victorians. 
Um, and you know, I was in a meeting just earlier in the week looking, you know, looking at or in a conversation with the Victorian government and the federal government um, talking about Murray River crossings because we're, you know, we, we want to approach this in a strategic way, understanding that a number of those bridges are, are coming towards the end of their life and we're going to have to you know, manage that process you know, efficiently. Minister, have you, Minister, have you had any discussions with your federal counterpart, uh, Ms King, about this, these bridges being priorities? Um, not specifically on those because they have been at that departmental level but uh, obviously we talk about you know the strategic corridors of importance that they are looking at at the federal government. I have spoken with the member for Murray about it and um, and also the member for, uh, well, sorry for that one more, the member for Albury and um, yeah have been in discussions with them. Like these are complicated issues or sometimes there's heritage matters, you've got that cross-border issue. Uh, we are trying to work towards that. Unfortunately, in uh, 11 <coughs> months, we haven't been able to undo, you know, quite it, a few it, it just, action. You would, you would appreciate the frustration of the community where they're hearing New South Wales government supports it, Victorian government supports it, federal government hasn't axed it as part of the infrastructure review. So we're all staring lovingly at each other. All, all supporting this project, but we're not actually we're not actually getting any traction yeah, and, and, and movement. Yeah, I'm understanding that. I mean, Mr. Benazzi, have you written to me on this before? No, I haven't. No, oh, right. Okay. No. So, well, I look. I really would like to progress it and uh, to see how we can work should, should on it. Can I can I just move to another? I beg your pardon. I, I, sorry, what did Mr. Faraway sorry, say? Sorry, I, 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 I didn't catch it, but it's my, it's my, it's my, it's my time. Because uh, it don't raise hands, so I didn't get it anyway. Yeah. Can I just move to another bridge that I did ask about last time, which was the bridge at Clarence? Um, oh, yes. Yes. Has there been any progression uh, in terms of a commitment of funding or any uh, progress on that bridge? There has been a lot of progress. I'm not in a position today to give you uh, the detail on that. Perhaps on notice, would you um, provide some detail? Yeah, well, definitely we could do it on notice, but I um, I want you to know I have been, I've met out with the council, uh, had a tour with the mayor, uh, John Connors, I offered to meet with um, Mr. Da uh, Councillor Dowling, uh, but he wasn't available that day that I did go out there. But um, yeah, definitely there are, is more good news to come, but just not no, probably okay. for an announcement. Sorry, is there another conversation? It's very distracting for no, me. Right. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just keep the, the, uh, the people uh, on this side of the table under order, Minister. Oh, sorry, um, sorry. They are allowed to talk oh, to okay. each other, mm -hmm. but if it's if it's uh, louder, I will bring them to yeah. order. It's it's distracting. Distracting. Um, In the wise words of Kathy and Tim, just But they me. do, yeah, maybe <laughs> just take the... It, I agree. Uh, keep going, Mr Benazio. Sorry. Yeah, so look, okay, so you've agreed to take that on us. Can I just, in the minute I've got, can I just draw your attention. There was an article in The Guardian that talked about the tragic deaths of four people in a ute roll over in Ballina. Um, I'm sure you were aware of that tragic circumstances, but I'm concerned about Mr. Graham, Minister Graham's comments in, that are quoted in the article where he says, we reference a small section of the community uh, becoming used to questioning the rules during COVID and in some cases outright flouting them. He's referred to them as cookers and he, he's apparently asked the department to research if cookers uh, are the reason for why we're having all these regional uh, deaths uh, on our roads. Has Mr. Graham spoken to you about his theory on cooker culture on our roads? Uh, thanks for that question. I know Mr. Graham, uh, Minister Graham is going to be uh, at a hearing, so you're probably best to direct your questions well, about what he said and well, why he said Well, you're in it. charge of regional roads. One would hope that he would have alerted you to this cooker culture that is apparently on our roads in, in the regions. Mr. Benaziak, sorry, I was going to finish that. Um, uh, Mr. Gra Minister Graham did uh, refer to that actually at the road safety forum mm. last week and I don't think it was in relation and certainly wasn't in relation to a specific uh, incident. Um, look, we heard from police from a number of jurisdictions about an increasing level of disrespect for authority, an increasing level of uh, aggressive behaviour on roads and of flouting rules. You know, it, it beggars belief that people still don't wear seat belts on in their cars, uh, you know, we've worked with yourselves and uh, our opposition to uh, 
get some more enforcement in that space through mobile detection, but there is certainly a change in the, um, I guess, behaviour and attitude of people on the roads. The lack, there's a lack of courtesy, which is leading to significant road safety uh, outcomes. Every single person who dies on the road uh, is you know, just an absolute tragedy and the number of crashes is increasing. It's something we take very seriously. When you hear of cases, you know, there was something in the paper today of people with 35 demerit points. Um, we've had actions Mr Graham has taken, Minister Graham has taken um, today in relation to, uh, uh, you know, closing loopholes that were left by the former government in relation to uh, international drivers. So we take it very seriously. If that uh, kind of comment is something that can get the attention of people to maybe think about their behaviour, well, that's a good thing. Oh, I'm thank you. Up, it up with the department in okay, terms questions of from the opposition again, Mr. Faraway. Uh, thank you. Uh, Minister, as the Minister for Regional Transport and Roads, uh, how many acts are you responsible for? Uh, all, I can't remember the exact number, but all of the acts are, uh, we jointly administer, I think, all of them. So, how many though? Because it would have changed, obviously, with a new government, because the, the responsibilities would have changed slightly as well. Yeah, I just said to you, I don't remember off the top of my head. I can oh, get so that. So you to take that on notice. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, excellent. How large is the regional New South Wales road network? Um, well, it covers you know something in the order of 98% of the state. Uh, there's 95 local government and council areas. Um, that you know, I can get you the. So it's in kilometres. What what is it in kilometres? Uh, I can't. You know what? I'm really bad at remembering those kind of statistics. I know I did eight and a half thousand kilometres in the first seven weeks this year, travelling around. The state, but I just can't remember the exact. So you happy number. to maybe take that one on notice? The work was done. Um, obviously, I, I know the work was done beforehand. So maybe you could update the committee and take that question. Yeah, yeah on sure, yep. sure. Excellent. Um, how many meetings have you had with your federal counterpart, Catherine King, since becoming the minister? Um, I, well, I've had a couple <coughs> of meetings. Uh, some face to face. Some, you know, just by the by. Some by phone call. Some by, you know, some at events. So. Um, I'm not sure, maybe... That's right, happy, like, obviously I don't expect you, if there's yeah. a few, you can take that on yeah. notice, that's fine. Okay, um, so happy to come back to the committee on yeah. that. Yep. Do you attend ITEM meetings? No, that's Minister Hayland's responsibility. So, when there may be regional roads or regional highways, or roads of national significance mm. um, that might be in regional New South Wales, and, and discussions with the Commonwealth, you're not in the room. Well, no, but we have briefing processes before those meetings. I mean, I'm sure when you were the minister, you weren't at Eton. Yes, then, yeah, I was actually oh, several you were. times. Yeah. All right, okay. Well, um, it hasn't been the case for me, and no. uh, but definitely we are briefed on what topics are allowed so to arise. So is it uh, Minister Halen or Minister Graham that attends Eton? Uh, generally, I think it's Minister Halen. Right. You have okay. to look at her calendar to be sure. Yeah. Right. Uh, do you support the previous funding commitment and agreement between the then New South Wales and Federal Government on an 80-20 funding split for state highways or, or projects of that could have a national significance in our state with yeah. Commonwealth? Yeah. So what meetings have you specifically had with Catherine King uh, to push back on the new model that the Albanese Government is pushing where it's only 50-50 funding split? I've spoken to Minister King about it. We've had um, engagement on that, yes, as she has had from the other ministers. Uh, we've pointed out, we've written to her, we've, um, it's been the subject of a number of conversations. Have you been able to get any agreement for her to reconsider? Um, these, co these conversations are ongoing, Mr Farrell. So, so have, you, have you had any indication that, that Minister King and the Federal Government would reconsider future funding models that would look at 8020 again? The conversations are ongoing. Right. How, if the Commonwealth uh, are proposing to only fund 50% of state highways or, or infrastructure projects into the future, how will you be able to secure uh, additional funding, an extra 30% on these projects into the future if the Commonwealth won't agree to the existing 80-20 funding split? Mr Farway, I've said to you that conversations are ongoing and I think that it's... But I'm, you know, I'm these talking are discussions, about conversations with your own colleagues now. Well, these stuff, discussions yeah. are, are ongoing and we, we've raised these issues. We have, um, you know, had those discussions. We are working on it. I don't think there's much point 
uh, interrogating it in this forum because I don't think it actually leads to any outcomes. I would prefer to get the outcomes with the uh, Minister, federal minister. It's ministers. been 11 months uh, since you became the minister. Well, not um, since that decision was made. Well, at the end of the day, I'm pretty sure you would have known about it. Uh, 11 months and you're trying to say you still don't have any resolution on funding arrangements for future road infrastructure builds in this state? I reject the premise of the question. It's not been 11 months since that decision was made or communicated to the government, and those discussions are still ongoing, and that's appropriate, entirely appropriate. Have you specifically... How do you go with getting you, your eight, million, you uh, 8 billion Minister, for the tunnel? Have you specifically written to Minister King asking her to reconsider? Yeah. Have you had a response? Uh, I'd have to check the records on that. I think I'm not sure that I have had a response, but I'll have to check it. Are you happy to take on notice whether one you've had a response and two what that response was? Um, I would have to check that in terms of where the negotiations are up to and whether it's. Yeah. So would you be happy states. to table the response if you've received one? That's what I just said. I'm I'd just have confirm. to check the status of the document. Yeah, so are you happy to table your own correspondence from your office to Minister King? Um, again, I think it was a joint approach and uh, I would need to speak to the other ministers, but generally we're pretty open to that. I would come back to the committee about whether that's the case. I also just wanted to go back to an earlier question that you um, asked me about the number of acts. There's actually 25 acts I'm advised yeah, okay. that are jointly uh, administered. Thank and you, Minister. And there'll be some time at the end if there's a couple of things, because if you if you can bring them up during the course of the day or at the end of the sessions, it yeah, would just be trying to help very that's helpful. Right. Now, Minister, um, I want to ask about the new regional fleet. Now, has the first new regional train departed the manufacturer on its way to, to Australia? Uh, look, my understanding is, but I really refer you to my previous response to Miss Fairman. I mean, I know you're... No, no, you, you... Well, no, Minister, the, I've had photos sent to my office of, of possibly this train on, on in transit. Um, is that the case? Yeah. So where is it? On its way to Dubbo. Whereabouts? Well, it's on its way. There's, it's in. It, it's not just one piece is it, of. Is it in country? Do you minister? remember? Do you is remember? Is it in country? Do you remember? Is it in the this country? Project? Minister? It's not just one. Is it in country? Movement, right? To get it here, right? But minister, I'm asking specific questions. Is it in Australia? Well, there is. It's complicated to answer that question. <laughs> well, it either is or isn't, minister. It's not that complicated. Well, yeah, it kind of is. But anyway, all right. Uh, you can't remember. That's okay. Um, I think there's. Two at Dubbo and one is one landed. Yeah, the other last bit. Yeah. Right, so it's all now. No, but okay. Oh, so, all now, so, so it's the all biggest, now at Dubbo. The biggest Sorry. regional transport infrastructure and rollout, and you don't know. No, I do know. You but don't it, know. Yeah, right. The XPT is a household name across this state. It is one of the best pieces of infrastructure servicing regional New South Wales. We're about to replace this fleet, put the trains into testing. Yes, it's been delayed and you, you don't know. You just say it's complicated. No, I didn't say it. I don't know. Look, the thing is there are three, there were three movements. And sorry, I couldn't remember off the top of my head if the last one had happened. But I knew that they were happening. It's been, like, this has been a project with a lot of delays. Yeah, so three movements. Can you confirm? So you're saying there are two sitting at the Dubbo No, no, they're all facility. there. They are all there. All three all are three sitting are in Dubbo. All three the Yep, sections. excellent. We'll come back in the afternoon with the bureaucrats to sort of delve delve into that a little bit more. But that is, um, that is good news. I'm surprised you haven't been um, singing from the rooftops on that. Um, Minister... Musselbrook Bypass, what is the current status of that project? We are going ahead with it. Um, there's been a decision, obviously, that we need to stage the project. We don't want to get in the same bind that your So what's the new completion date? Um, I will have to ask the... Hang on, I've got it in my notes. So I'll have a look for you. Hang on for a second. Is that still an 80-20 funding split for that project with the Commonwealth? I'll just get my notes, Mr. Faraway, sorry. Yeah, I think it it is uh, 80 20 still, yes, sorry. Yep. And the yep. new completion date? Yeah, that's date. right, of course it was. Yep, yep. Hmm? Yep, new completion date? Uh, the new completion date, I'll just. Find 
we're staging these projects because obviously we've got something like three and a quarter billion dollars worth of projects on the go in the Hunter right now. And that's right. We'll come, we'll come back to that because we can come back to that a bit later in the day. Just sticking with uh, obviously issues around. Um, the fantastic Upper Hunter area. Mm -hmm. um, so prior to the 2023 election, Minister, you accused Transport for New South Wales of lowball offers during the land acquisition process for the Singleton Bypass. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, what evidence have you found since making those claims that that was the case? Um, look, I think there was an increase in the funding that was offered to those uh, residents, but I think that's something you really need to speak to the department around that. Well, and in, in, in fairness, Minister, you're the one that made the claims, not transport. The, the claims were made against transport. Yes, but I just answered the question, so there you go. Mm, sort of. Uh, moving on. So on the 16th of December 2022, and I'm referring um, to the Hunter River Times edition, yeah, Friday the 16th of December, you are quoted. Shadow Minister for Regional Transport and Roads, Jenny Aitchison, said no one should be a victim when it comes to infrastructure and alongside Ms Watson and Federal Member for Hunter Dan Repicoli promised the system would be made fairer under a Labor-led state government come March election next year. Mm -hmm. Now, what actions have you taken in the last 11 months and more specifically, what changes to the Just Terms Act are you proposing? So this is something that we did take as a commitment to the election and uh, I still remember you telling a group of farmers that I should have to um, put up a private member's bill to change the Just Terms well, Act, which was quite Minister, laughable. Minister, it's not about me. I'm, I'm specifically well, No, no, I'm just remembering Minister, that that was Minister, where that I'm conversation was coming asking, from. As the Minister for Regional Roads and Transport, in the last 11 months, what have you done to rectify those concerns and the claim you made against Transport for New South Wales as a then Shadow Minister? So I have been working with Transport for New South Wales on that specific area, on the, on the Singleton Bypass uh, acquisitions, but across all acquisitions, I take it very seriously when a brief comes to my desk around any land acquisitions. I interrogate the department around uh, you know, what process has been in play. Obviously, as a government, we've got in place a review of the Just Terms Act um, going forward, and, the, and Minister Camper has written to all ministers of portfolio, such as myself, uh, asking for our departments to participate in that review to ensure it so is So what would you be proposing, as, as someone that's been involved in this and, and made those claims as a Shadow Minister, now sitting around the Cabinet table, what proposed changes would you be seeking uh, or proposing to put forward? Look, definitely around clarity and uh, that has been probably something which I think has been missing in that act for the people who are going through it. I mean, these are complicated issues and I never uh, said they weren't, but we knew that there were significant challenges and a lot of it is around that transparency, a lot of it is around the way we deal with uh, people who are going through that process. It's incredibly traumatic to be um, in a situation where your house but, is but, having but, to but be given up. specifically, Minister, what changes? Yeah, I, I know the context. I was very involved with that. You know that. Um, well, what, no. what <laughs> specific proposals as the Regional Roads Minister will you be putting forward as part of this consultation with Minister Camper? Well, we'll be having those discussions and continuing those discussions. So you don't have any? You can't, you can't inform the committee today of what that would look like? I've, and I've given you some of those directions. Transparency. Yeah, but giving how, people how, dignity, how will, treating them you, with more what respect. What will you propose? What will you propose in the Just Terms That is Act? part of that process. And also, look, well, that, they are things that can be achieved within the Act, Mr Faraway, and also... That's so why I'm asking how, Minister. Well, maybe you need to speak to the people who are going to draft the Act. Yeah, but surely your office should be... Should well, be as part a minister, I set this. the yeah. direction. So, so you have a lot to say, Minister, but when it comes crunch time uh, to actually have some proposals, take community concerns on board, you pass the buck. No, I don't. You're well, putting you just, words in my just, mouth. You just said you need to talk to someone that's going to actually propose, well, if you're uh, wanting propose the, these changes. I if thought, you're I wanting thought you, the specific you had made it clear legal the Hunter legislative River Times, changes. And I repeat, uh, that under a state-led Labor government come March, it'll be uh, much easier for this stuff. Well, how? No, I said we how? will be looking at reviewing. We how? made a commitment mm. to do that. That review is underway. I'm not the minister with carriage of that act. I 
I and my agency are having input into have that. Have you met with I, the yes, impacted have, landholders since yes, being the minister? I have some of them. And what commitments have you given those landholders? That we would work to do better. There's one in particular that we're looking at their um, situation again, but I would uh, not like to canvas their personal <coughs> situation in this forum. Right, okay. And I've offered to meet with all of them again at different times. Sometimes there's been constraints on doing that. Okay. Um, just with regard to uh, the country rail network, Minister, mm -hmm. uh, what does uh, what does a TOC stand for? Uh, oh my God, sorry, I've gone blank. Um, train operating conditions. So do oh, yeah. TOCs require approval from UGL or, or the rail operators? Well, they do require a waiver, yes. Yeah, but who, who do they have to get the waiver from? Um, I think it's UGL. Right, so what is being done to address concerns in the rail freight sector around UGL uh, removing these waivers um, come April? Yeah, look, we've been working really hard on this. It's been a great concern to me. Look, I, I concede we inherited a regional road and rail network which had um, some significant issues with maintenance and then of course the um, you know the fund underfunding of that by former governments and then uh, of course the uh, wet weather events of the last few years have not helped that at all um, we so specifically with the removal of these talks in April what is yep. being done in that space yeah so uh, we have been working on them we have I think um, we had got to a stage where uh, a number of the waivers have been extended, one way they've been withdrawn. Um, I can get you to speak to uh, Mr Croscoff because he would have the most up-to-date detail. Yeah, that's right, we've got Mr Croscoff in the afternoon. That's what I thought, but we have been discussing it and have been talking to them about, like to the department about this. Right, okay. So what is, um, um, in that space, what does tell me? Obviously. Total axle weight, uh, total, total axle le no. limit, sorry. Track axle load. Oh, track, track axle, axle load, load. okay. Yeah. How much funding is left in the Fixing Country Rail program? Um, so in that program where there had been, you know, a massive underspend under your government and that you were rebadging it as uh, new money at the election. That's incorrect, Minister. But again, how much money is left in the Fixing Country Rail program? Um, look, at this stage, um, that program, um, I would probably have to give it to you to, uh, uh, Brenda, to answer that question specifically. So you don't know, Minister, how much is left in the Fixing Country Rail program? I would give it to the department because it's a point of time. I don't have a, you know, rolling look at it. Right, got the answer it's there fully committed, so... Has Mr. Murray, has Mr Murray got that answer there for it's you? fully committed, but, I mean... What else did you want to know? How much? Hasn't Mr Murray got a comment there for you? He's passed your note. Do we know how much is left in this program? The program is fully committed, so... Yeah, but it's a program you've inherited from the previous state government of which you have abolished quite a few of those programs. Is this a program you have abolished? I'll uh, take that to... Surely you can answer that one, Minister. Order. Surely. Order. Is this a program that your government which you're a member of, have you abolished the Fixing Country Rail Program? The Fixing Country Rail Program is a program that has had a long history. It started off with you um, having, there were nominations that were called for from the community, then it was ones that were done in, um, were, were proposed by transport. We've had a lot of trouble, I guess, uh, in terms of getting that committed, you had that trouble yourself when you were in government of getting those funds spent. Minister, specifically, is this a program that is still in existence? It's the funds are fully committed for it. There are programs that are so rolling yes out no. now. Yep. So, so it is a program yeah, that is still in still existence going out. Oh, under your government. Okay. Yep. So, and and again, how much how much is left in that program? I think it's about two hundred. 50 million might be 249. Okay, so happy to take that on notice and come back to the no, community specifically? No, no, that's, specifically. It. that's the answer. Here we go, that's the answer, 249. Is that 249 yeah. million, Ms Hong, I think, you're, is that yes. correct? Okay, that's excellent. Correct. So how many projects 
if you inherited a, a program that still had 249 million of a 400 million program, how many projects have you rolled out in the last 11 months under the Fixing Country Rail program? So are you talking about new projects? Yep. Um, I don't believe there's any that I know of. Zero. Brand new ones. Zero. So, yeah. so in 11 months, you've inherited $249 million left over. There, yeah. there are so pro in February 2023, they, you announced, I think it was, the last yeah. latest round, which was $43 delivery. million the time for of two delivery projects, minister. right? And then um, the budget for this year allocated another, sorry, I can't read, $56 million. So in the 11 months since the New South Wales Labor government came to office, how many new projects have been announced, commenced, well, announced in the last 11 months. Country Rail? Yep. Um, none in the none. last okay. 11 months. All right, no worries. Um, moving on then. That one was pretty simple. Uh, Bathurst Bullet. Um, there's calls from uh, the member for Orange. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I believe you've been to the Central West and, and I acknowledge that. Times. Thank you. Thank you for visiting the region, the best region in the state. Um, is there currently planning underway? Is there currently planning underway to extend one, if or both, or any of the Bathurst Bullet Services storage? Um, look, thanks for that question. It's really good to hear that. I've got a great relationship with both those local members actually in Bathurst and Orange and uh, we've been in a lot of conversation around this. Um, obviously, you've got an interest now. I think you've got your pre-selection in Calair that you want to sort oh, of get along go. to. Didn't take long for you to that, bring that um, one. You know, that's fine. Good, good to see you keeping tabs on me, Minister. Oh, no, and I do want to say thank you for your work as a Shadow Minister. It's um, been very interesting having you in that role. And I also want to take this opportunity actually to formally congratulate Mr Lazell. I've passed that on to Good him man. directly. He's a nice man and uh, I hope he does well in the So issue. back to the Bathurst Bullet, Minister. Yeah, yeah, no, that's all right. That's fine. Um, so the Bathurst Bullet, obviously there has been a lot of uh, interest in that and we're looking at some of the logistical concerns. I was talking to the member for Bathurst about it and just a couple of days ago, I think, and then um, recently with Mr Donato, um, you know, they are very keen. I've met with Orange Council. There are obviously some constraints around um, scheduling and timetabling and then obviously with the delays of the regional rail fleet, we, you know, want to get it right. We don't want to put a service in place that we won't be able to deliver um, later. Uh, so, you know, that's, we are looking at it. There is planning underway. Um, I think it's had a bit of a a shot in the arm since we got into government, a bit more taken seriously than it was previously. All right, Thank you, uh, Minister. I do, just want, we'll go back to the regional rail uh, program, and I'm just curious, firstly, just to um, what your involvement is um, in oh, that project, because you said, uh, Order, you've said that uh, it's Minister Halen. So, is your um, are you involved in decision making? in any way in relation to that or I firstly yeah look um sorry just sure I try um look Minister Halen is the Minister with Carriage of Procurement in the portfolio so ultimately it is her decision on those things but we do tend to work very collaboratively as uh, the three ministers and it's been actually a really positive relationship and I think it helps transport actually in this space. I've been getting regular briefings on it from Ms Driver because I am very interested in it. We had a lot of... Uh, I just don't know where the train is. Order. We had a lot of interest in it. I mean one of the points, to me the first train um, arriving on the shore is not you know the big exciting um, moment because there is a lot of commissioning that has to be done and accreditation for the vehicle, for the drivers, etc., to have that fleet operating. Because it's bimodal, it'll have to be uh, tested in a variety of operating conditions, which makes it a bit more complex. Um, so, yeah, like. So, the Minister, Minister Hale is in charge of procurement, just to be clear, but you, as Minister for Regional Transport, I assume, have some say yeah, yeah. in yeah. what those. Uh, trains are, what the carriages are, what they need to have in them, the modifications, those decisions, uh, you would have some involvement Oh, absolutely. In. And the problem is because of the PPP model and the fact that it was overseas, it makes any amendments to the model quite complicated because you've got, you know, 
uh, obviously the former government took a decision not to have sleeper carriages, for example. I mean, um, and uh, that is something that you know you just can't undo. There'd been some, pardon me, issues with um, engaging with the unions um, under the former government. I think in terms of getting their feedback, which you know you want to get because they're a workforce that are going to be working with these trains, and safety is always at the forefront of everything we do. And I think Minister Halen's done an excellent job in getting them to the table and getting the um, you know as much as we can to get the project back on track. Um, obviously, Ms Driver can take you through the um, you know, finer details of that point, but it is, it is something I've definitely had a strong interest in. Okay, so just while, yeah, I will kind of um, just pursue a few more questions on this then. Yep. So the sleeper carriages that you've uh, just said, so basically sleeper carriages uh, uh, as you've ordered that sleeper carriages be on all the trains, so they're modified essentially, which no, is no, a no. big modification. No, no, what I'm, no, no, no. What I'm saying to you is that they were ordered without those modifications. Yes. And to do them would have been exorbitantly expensive. So we're looking at other ways that we can deliver those services. I mean, they have the requirements. So other chairs. ways, just to be clear on that. So um, which of which of course uh, is it? It is a key issue with regional trains um, having uh, the ability, you know, to be to be sleeper carriages. So, the I understand the the union potentially wanted those sleeper carriages that um, they've been built without sleeper carriages. Uh, you're suggesting that you're you're looking at other ways to allow people to sleep On those in the carriages or yeah. other yeah, other that's, train. Yeah, we're investigating different options for it, and happy to have a more in-depth briefing with you. I know there's been a whole variety of different options put forward and, and we're looking at that, but we're not really in a position to actually talk about that. Uh, okay, so to that. be but clear, to say that we are investigating. Not, okay, so it's not possible at this point, obviously, to be sleeper carriages, but did you say you're investigating potential changes, additional potential design options, modifications? Options. I, that's all I can really say. Is this part time. of the end of uh, December last year? Um, where Transport for New South Wales issued another set of design instructions to the trains at the end of last year. Is this part of that? Uh, no, sorry, that's not. No. no. So there could be further changes in terms of trying to make the carriages sleepable? What are we talking about, reclining chairs or something? Or? Uh, look, the recliner chairs are already in there, so that is isn't one option that um, is available. But there, look, I think you're really best to talk to Ms Drover about the specifics okay. of it, but we're not really in a position where we're at at the moment to to have more. So Ms Drebel, what are the options that have been considered um, in relation to uh, making these these carriages that don't have, they're not sleeper carriages, but making them a little bit sleeper carriage-like? Yeah, thank you. Um, as the Minister has said, um, the current the, the fleet that's in uh, um, manufacture and delivery um, doesn't include sleeper cars. Um, there is a premium seat, though, provided for in this new fleet of trains. What we are doing, though, is working with our colleagues in uh, New South Wales Trainlink to look at what we can do with the existing fleet of trains that do include the sleeper carriages. And that work is uh, progressing. Okay. But we won't be modifying the new regional fleet to accommodate sleeper cars. Okay, so what were the, what were the, um, what were the, why did Transport for New South Wales direct the manufacturer to make another set of d design changes to the trains late last year? What was that for? So um, we do continue from time to time to issue modifications um, to the PPP. They don't always relate to the design of the train. Um, for example, some were around the leasing of a facility for the simulator. Um, somewhere around timing of delivery of train carriages, so modifications don't necessarily relate to train design. Was the one in December related to train design? Uh, we did issue some modifications and we have since retracted them. Okay, so the, so the design modifications that were issued, so, so the design basically changed your mind? So the design um, of the train was confirmed with the resolution agreement that was done at the end of 2021. So the train that has arrived and is now at Dubbo, all six cars of it, um, reflects the resolution agreement. So there have been some modifications and discussions since then, um, but the current train at Dubbo reflects the resolution agreement. The current train at Dubbo reflects 
that, but there are still trains, I assume, in production yep, that's being right. manufactured because yes. this is going on for and they obviously are some years <coughs> to 2026, is it? And they are being uh, manufactured to the resolution agreement design and detailed design was achieved for the train uh, late last year. Okay, so there, was, there were some changes and the manufacturer, CAF, probably pushed back against those, it sounds like, and that's done. No more, no more design changes, that's it. Is that... Our, our intent is to uh, finish the production of these trains, the manufacturer get them all here and achieve provisional acceptance for the fleet. So we, this is, so we shouldn't expect any further modifications or, or dramatic increases in costs or then, and uh, we shouldn't expect any more delays if we have, we've got the, the six carriage train in Dubbo, the rest of the trains uh, will be built to that standard no more design modifications. So is that what you're saying? I'll go to you, Minister, because this is a budget uh, issue, but are you confident that there won't be further design modifications requested and therefore no increases, uh, you know, huge increases in costs that we've seen lately? Look, that's certainly been the goal. You know, this is a project that was really um, having issues before we came to government. It has been a mess. We focused on trying to rescue it. We are trying to ensure that we can get it landed here uh, at the right, you know, cost and and time. Okay, so this six so this six train six carriage train, the first, um, is that I know that it requires testing a, a hell of a lot of things. Uh, what's the expectation for that one and Firstly, expectation in terms of when will it be joined by its Spanish cousins? Um, when will that hit the country or hit um, New South Wales? Uh, and when can we expect the first of those trains to be on the tracks? Okay, um, so there's 29 new trains in the new fleet. There's three types of trains in the new fleet, long regional, short regional and uh, intercities. So the first one that's arrived at Dubbo is the first of the long regional um, trains. Um, as was always planned, uh, the focus now is doing on some of the internal fit out of the train. Um, it was always the case that to have some local content uh, in the trains, that internal fit out does occur at Dubbo. So that's the next step. When that's finished, um, it will need to go through a very thorough testing and commissioning process. Um, remembering that this train is a bi-mode train, so it works both on the uh, diesel network but also on the electrified network. So we need to test it in both those, on both those networks. So that will uh, occur. It needs to go through accreditation processes, obviously testing of the crew from New South Wales Trainlink, and only then, when we're satisfied that it's safe for operations, will it achieve provisional acceptance and then go into and what's your rough service. What's your rough estimate for, for all of that process? 12 months, 24 months? Do you have um, look, we, we are not going to share today um, target dates because we need to make sure that we do the internal fit out and we do the testing commissioning um, carefully. It's the first time in Australia, I believe, that we have a bi-mode train. So we are working very closely with all stakeho stakeholders. Our primary consideration is getting the train into first passenger service safely and as quickly as possible. Thank and I think we have good alignment to achieve that objective. Thank you, Ms. Drover. Mr. Latham. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Minister and uh, your officials present today. Um, you said earlier in evidence, Minister, you're absolutely certain that your Chief of Staff didn't uh, brief the uh, parts of the crossbench that Rochelle Hicks was mentally unstable. Mm -hmm. But what was the reason you thought that the uh, SO52 motion of Mr. Faraway needed to be defeated mm -hmm. in the Upper House? Um, Thank you for that question, Mr. Latham, and I appreciate um, your interest in this matter. And uh, I really, I think I did refer to this earlier when I said that there was an investigation ongoing at that time. We wanted, um, obviously, all of that uh, work to be done and the department to focus on getting the full and frank investigation undertaken uh, so that, you know, we could help to resolve the issue for Ms Hicks and to address the issues that have been found. And are you confident that's the only argument that your Chief of Staff put to oh, crossbench MPs? Look, the other issue for me was having this play out in the media and when Ms Hicks was um, quoted in the media as saying she felt that she'd angered me, which was certainly not the case. I, I, mean, I admire her very much. I, um, I have enormous 
respect for her in standing up for against behaviour which had been minimised and was quite would have been quite awful to go through. So I just didn't want to put her through more um, stress in that space. Did you ask her if she wanted the material, the information in the public domain or you just worked on the assumption she was already too stressed to handle it? Uh, look, I made a uh, public statement, I think it was in the media, that um, if she wanted to reach out to me, I would welcome that uh, contact. I had um, been advised that there had been a number of attempts to contact her that, that had not been successful and I didn't want to press myself on her. I'm very aware as a minister that there are delineations in my role in terms of directing staffing matters. But further than that, I think there's also, I didn't want it to be seen that I was trying to gag her or trying to stop her from telling her story. That's that's for her to do. And, um, and I, you know, wish her well in w whatever she does next with that. But just, I didn't feel it was appropriate uh, for the Parliament and also for the protection of other employers who might have been giving evidence in that investigation and in other um, things. You know, the problem is that you've got the initial event you've, that happened, which was terrible. Uh, obviously, <coughs> it should have been reported immediately. Action should have been taken immediately to remove Mr Brown from the site. More support should have been given to Ms Hicks and certainly support tailored to what she needed and she should have been listened to. Was that done malevolently or maliciously? I don't believe so from the you know things that I've seen and been in the media and been briefed on. But you know, there's, those processes were ongoing and I felt that they needed some clear air to be done so that they could be um, you know, completed and that we most importantly could get to a good resolution for well, Ms Hicks. Ms Hicks was an employee of Transport for New South Wales but you you made a decision not to pick up the phone and ask her what she thought was in her best interest. Because I wouldn't have picked up the phone to speak to an employee. Like, it's up to them to, to ask to speak to me because I don't want to be in a situation, like there's a power imbalance, Mr Latham, that you would understand, of a minister to employee. I don't want to be in a situation where I'm uh, you know, pressing her to take a call from me and then she might, you know, think that that's not the right approach and, you know, I don't... I'd Minister, your office lobbied against the SO52 being carried. Do you now acknowledge that Ms Hicks has taken great comfort from the debate in the Upper House, that, in her words, people were standing up for her at long last? Well, can I say on the debate in the Upper House? I mean, if I haven't heard Ms Hicks saying that... Um, you haven't spoken to her, that's why. Correct. But my view on this is that I, I want her to feel some resolution. I really genuinely want her to be able to... But do you now acknowledge she took comfort from the debate in the Upper House? People were standing up for her? Well, that, that's great if she has. But okay, that's great if I she I mean, has. the debate... So that, the position your Mr. office Latham, had... Mr that, that would have happened whether or not the motion passed or failed, to be honest. So... Well, no, that's incorrect. There was a further matter of public importance based solely on the carriage of the SO52 and the documents and the disgraceful information we became aware of, information you tried to suppress. I didn't so try don't to mislead suppress this committee it. to that effect. I didn't try to suppress it, Mr well, Latham. Well, well, order, well, order. What are you uh, saying Mr now? Latham, order. I will call you to order at this point, and if you could withdraw that. The minister was not misleading the committee. Uh, we have... Uh, sorry, but that is not going to... Um, uh, occur unless, you know, for good well, reason, also I'll, if you I'll, could I'll just withdraw. treat witnesses with but, respect, but, but please. Minister, when you're saying you, you didn't suppress the information, you're on record earlier saying your office lobbied against the carriage of the SO52, isn't that right? My concern has always been for Miss Higgs welfare and to get to the bottom of it and my view was that it would be best if the department was able to complete the investigation that I had directed to happen because I was concerned, as I've said repeatedly, about the initial response and the delay in providing support to Ms Hicks. One crossbencher put the argument in the chamber that uh, the carriage of the SO52 will further traumatise anybody involved. 
Is, is that an argument that your office put to the crossbench? Well, I think you have to really go back to the crossbencher and ask them why they said that, not to, to me. Well, you must know what your Chief of Staff was saying because you've had a discussion about the tactic. Mr Latham, you have repeatedly said things on the record that you do not know to be true and are incorrect, and I ask you to not do that. Well, I've got correct information because the SO52 was carried and we've got the documentation. And uh, how many discussions did you have, Minister, with your Chief of Staff? You said you spent a lot of time on the Rochelle Hicks matter. You had uh, constant discussions with your Chief of Staff about it? Mr Latham, my Chief of Staff has never briefed any crossbencher on any of these matters. So you are not correctly informed and that leads me to question what the rest of your comments are that must have been heard at second or third hand. Well, who in your office was lobbying the cross? I'm not prepared to do that. You've already named yes. one of my staff incorrectly. You've described it as stalking the halls of Parliament, and that is not appropriate. So I'm not going to go into that with you. I'm sorry, but that is the so limit. To stand up in the briefings with your Chief of Staff, uh, was it ever said that Rochelle Hicks was self-promoting herself in the media without approval, or words to that effect? So, Mr Latham, I know the email you're referring to. That was my notes taken on a contemporaneous um, discussion at the time when I was very first asking the department about the um, matters, when I very first got the media query back on, I think it was, I don't know, the 10th or 11th of, of November, right? The 10th of November. And what I heard in that briefing, that, that quick chat of what is going on here, why am I being asked about somebody getting a death threat? And I was so concerned, and the person who was reporting to me was so concerned about this. They were being full and frank in the way that this was being had been dealt with. And I asked them for a further briefing to come to my office on that Monday. And then I asked them, for, uh, I asked the department after that briefing for a full investigation to happen. So just to clarify, you're saying this email is your set it's of my, notes? My, my dot points. Okay. Can you tell the committee what else you wrote in the email? Yeah. You can? Yeah, I haven't got a copy of it here. Are, are you happy to table the email for the benefit yeah, of the committee? Yeah, well, there is a part of it that I don't want to because I think it relates to some matters under legal privilege and that's why we had withheld it. Would you ever have described uh, the Ian Brown death threat as an off-the-cuff remark? No, and it was not described to me as that. It was That was a phrase used, and I'm glad you've raised it. It was a phrase used to des describe how others had described it at the time. And this goes back to the very nub of the issue, that it was not treated with the appropriate gravity. Now, post that, there was a safety investigation undertaken, which put it as a credible threat. And I have apologised so many times on the record, in media, in Parliament, to Miss Hicks about that. I know that this was not the appropriate way for that initial response to Do happen. you accept, Minister, any normal intelligent person reading this email, which you've now said are your words, uh, taken no, down that in are my note dot form. points taken from a conversation. That's a bit the, clear. The, the, to, to describe a threat yeah. to kill a woman at Coffs Harbour as an off-the-cuff remark is completely unacceptable and inappropriate, and, and it would be attributed to you. When I heard that comment, and you can see from the fact that that was offered up in the SO52 that that was something, an internal note of... You know, we were very clear and transparent. We wanted to be transparent from the get-go. And when I heard that that was how it had been described at the time... By whom? By... by, Order. by no, no, And I don't know, it was third or fourth. It did, at that time, when I got that information, it was not clear who had said it at the time. It was... But what it was more general, that was how it was taken, that others perhaps in the room had felt that. There were other people that said... Um, they hadn't heard it properly or they didn't quite believe it. I mean, there's a shock. When somebody says something as shocking like that, you don't know how to deal with it. No one knows how to deal with it. But there are processes in place and they weren't followed and they should have been followed. But for you to... And this is the problem with the SO52s. Instead of any of you coming and asking me, not one of you, 
that got up there and attacked me and attacked my staff. My word, and we attacked, attacked you on the basis of this, which is completely Mr. disgusting. Mr. Latham. Mr. Latham. Mr. Latham. If you had have picked up the phone, that is not that would going have been to happen, Minister. Minister, if you could just, um, uh, we just uh, stop here. Um, it's uh, now uh, ten forty-five, I think, or is it ten forty-four? Ten forty-four. Time for one question. We'll go to the opposition. Uh, well, no, because that's oh, your time. Yeah, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah. Um, Minister, can you give any explanation of how you've now told this committee that you've written down that the inbound threat to kill Rochelle Hicks could be rationalised away as merely an off-the-cuff remark? What was the context and who provided you with that information that led you to record it that way? As I said to you, when I asked what was the way that this such a terrible threat had gone to the point where it was now a media inquiry, which is the first instance that I was advised of this, right? I, um, I was told that at the time it was not treated with the appropriate guarantee. My question is by order. Who? Order. You that's it. That's you don't have any more time. Sorry, Mr. Latham. Um, uh, I'll have one question as well in terms of uh, cross bench time. Um, Minister, just back to the Sorry. regional train. Is Sorry. there time? Sorry, that, point that, of order. That, that's at my discretion, isn't it? Isn't no, it, isn't your, no you had 30 seconds. Done. Yeah, like, we've got we 30 go, seconds. Yeah. You're the opposite. That's the, the, now it's me. So it's the yes. cross bench. Yes. 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 For safety for women. Thank you. Um, uh, Minister, in relation to the uh, regional so trains are uh, overrun. The time is clearly past quarter two. No, no, no. There was a minute left. Yeah, okay. Well done. Not on that clock. Yeah. It's a digital one. There was a minute left. We shared at half and half because that's what we do because we're fair. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll break. You just run interference. Yeah. yeah. Chair, there no We'll be back at 11. No government questions. Yeah. Oh, sorry, 11.15. 11.15.
Yes, thank you. Okay, all right, welcome back. We'll proceed to questions again uh, from the opposition, Ms. Uh, Sam Farrowway. So we're going to hand over just to Mr. Latham to continue his question for five minutes. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, uh, why in this email of the 23rd of November did you write as follows? He, Ian Brown, made an off-the-cuff remark to others that he wanted to kill her, her being Rochelle Hicks. Why did you write that as if it were true? Uh, Mr Latham, I, as I said previously, before the break, that was not a statement of fact for me. It was not even a statement of what I believed to be true. What it was was quick dot points I took during a telephone conversation around how we had got from a situation where a valued employee of transport of some 16 years employment was now in a situation where she was so distressed and I wanted to know why. Because to my mind, if somebody made that kind of a threat, it should have been immediately reported. Um, it, it, she should have been offered support and that person should have been ordered off site. So what that was, was um, a comment on the fact that it wasn't, which I think we're all in agreement, furious agreement here, that it hadn't been taken with the appropriate gravity or seriousness at the time. And that to me was the shock in that phone call that anyone could say that. Now, I know you, I'll anticipate your next question, who was that person? But it was a report of what was being said at the time by a number, like not by that particular number, but by the conversation, what had gone wrong, that someone had had that view of it. Now the safety investigation had been done previous to it going into the media, which had determined it was a credible threat, as it should have, as it was always appropriate. So, I mean, this is a problem with the whole SO52 process. You're dealing with complex employment matters, like with our approach here was that you're dealing with complex employment matters. You do a call for uh, papers, you make assumptions about what certain words mean when there's no context and you didn't have that context and you all stood up in the parliament and attacked me, attacked my staff without actually coming and saying what did this mean? Why did you have that email? Now we, we furnished it in good um, faith because we believe in the SO52 process and if it's the view of the House that they will want to have papers around these matters, then that's up to the House to do. But my, my point is there is a danger when you get a set of dot points and you ascribe a meaning to it that was never the intention. It was the thing which sparked <coughs> me requesting a briefing which I received and calling for a proper full investigation into it. Well, Minister, why doesn't the email say, I've received a briefing from so and so and this is what he said? Because it was the dot points I took on my phone as I got a phone call. And I wanted them to, to have it for clarity because I knew it was going to be an important conversation because I was horrified by that threat. Absolutely horrified. Why is it written as if these are your words? There are three sentences in the paragraph that has the off-the-cuff remark, mm -hmm. and the paragraph starts, I also noted, the I being you. No, that was, it was, I was reporting it, and I, can you show it to me again, because I haven't got a copy of it with me, but um, if you want... Well, I can, I, can, I can read you the first sentence. I also noted that she, Rochelle Hicks, was doing a lot of self-promotion and media without approval. Uh, uh, yeah, point of order is taken I mean, by Mr D'Adam. The, the, the Minister has asked for the document. The member is relying on the document. The Minister is at a disadvantage. If the member is going to insist on relying on the document, he should table the document yeah. and provide to it to well, the, the, the Minister. Point of order. The Minister can the respond in full point. knowledge of what's in the document. Yeah. 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 The point of order. Mr Dowden, thank you. It's true. not quite a point of order, but to the it, point of order. It goes to the procedural the fairness Mr. resolution, which is, this is not procedurally oh, fair. There is, there there is a, a of reason for it. We've got Ms Ward now responding to the point of order firstly. Chair, the Minister and her department produced this document to the Upper House. So, the, I'll just rule on the well, point. To the point of order. order. Like, we'll, the, we'll there, there were thousands of documents. So I'll rule. Oh, I, I, we'll hear from Mr. Latham and then yeah, let's yeah, just draw At the line time, I wasn't allowed to take a copy of the document. I could only take notes, and I have verbatim notes here in front of me that I'm reading out. That's all I have. I. Yeah. So you don't yes, so Mr. De Adam, uh, did you listen Mr. To De what Adam, I said? at the time order, I wasn't Mr. allowed De Adam, to take a copy of the document. Not, Mr. De Adam, that is not a point of order now. 
and the member is able to, we are all able to, uh, take notes of privileged documents, uh, but is it is it privileged, still privileged? Well, I'm taking it to be deprivileged because the Minister's volunteered it. The Minister volunteered in evidence. Previous contribution. So continue, and, and we aren't also required uh, to table documents that we're referring to. It would be good, but we're not required to. Well, I will when so, the House uh, makes Mr. Lake, most certainly. Most I'll certainly. just take the I'll take the question. Yeah, I don't, but, like but I don't. It says I also noted the I being you. No, Mr. that's not right because these are this is a file note. This is a note of a conversation, and it was looking at what was being said to me. So, you know, this is the thing, Mr. Latham. You've made a you know a lot of assumptions here which are not correct. And then you've gone on the public record and you've gone in the parliament and you've attacked me, you've attacked my staff for things that I didn't say, that I didn't think, but that I noted when I heard them said by others that were of concern to me, that kicked off a request for briefing, a request for an investigation Minister. into these matters. I took it very seriously, very seriously. Uh, Minister, well, can I just get a sense of what's happening where, now? Is this back to opposition time? time? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Continue. Um, Minister. What specific steps, given that you've said you were shocked and given that you were concerned, what specific steps and um, items did you direct your secretary to take in relation to this matter? I requested a full briefing. Who, who gave you the briefing? From the department, like for a departmental briefing. Who gave you the briefing? From the, secret, from the departmental briefing. From who in the department? I'd have to go back and look at the briefing. All right, but it's take it on notice. Um, Minister, can you understand that you say you've been attacked, you say you've spent hours dealing with this, but Rochelle Hicks is the one that should be at the centre of your concern. Do you understand and exceed and agree with that? I absolutely so agree you... with that, and that's what I have been focusing Thank on. You. And every action I have taken has been to get to the bottom of what happened Thank you. in I'll the redirect. initial event, yep. what actually happened in the way it was dealt with at the department and to minimise any um, of my contribution to her distress and by ensuring that Thank she you. knows that I respect and admire the stand she has taken. Yes, but you haven't picked up the telephone. You said that you've informed this committee that you spent hours on this, that you've received a briefing, that you've spoken to people about it, you've instructed your staff. The government opposed the Standing Order 52, the call for papers where we sought transparency on behalf of Ms Hicks about this. You spent a lot of time on that, but none of that has been directed to picking up the phone to Ms Hicks. You said that you're available for her to call her, to call you. You can see how all of this uh, comes across as minimising the impact to her, can't you? Absolutely not. And if you right. were in contact with Ms Hicks and you knew that no, no. she wanted the SOP, you need to pick up the phone to her, Minister. To you need to pick up the phone. No, like you're right. making assumptions here. A point of order, here point of order is being taken actions. by Mr Stop Cameron running cover. Murphy. Uh, Chair, my point of order is simple as a matter of procedural fairness. If a question is being asked of a witness, the Minister... I'll move on. The minister needs to be given a reasonable opportunity to answer. Yes. What's happening here is, as soon as the minister's a few words yep. in, the honourable Thank member you. is then yes, coming I'm, over I'm the top. Thank you. I work out what your point of uh, order is, and I uphold it, and also it. remind treating witnesses with Thank respect you. at all times. Thank you, Minister. Um, what was your secretary's understanding of this issue before the media inquiry? I think you would need to re direct that question to Mr. Murray, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the Secretary. Mr Murray, what was your understanding of this issue before <coughs> the media inquiry? Uh, yes, thank you for your question, Ms Ward. And let me first say that we recognise that this is an important matter and it should be addressed uh, in the House today. Uh, it is worth also making some points up front and that I acknowledge that Transport has let down Ms Hicks and we are sorry for the distress caused and in particular the length of time that has elapsed without her matters being appropriately addressed. Uh, the threat made, let me say this, to Mr. Rochelle Mr Murray, Hicks. we have very limited time with the Minister. You and I have all afternoon, so we can deal with those issues. What I want to understand from you directly is what was your understanding of this issue <coughs> before the media inquiry? Uh, the, when the media inquiry came in was no, the first... No, before. Before the media inquiry, what was your, your understanding was, He was issue? going to answer that, I, I think. I was going to answer the question. Give me a uh, second. In the time preceding the media inquiry, I was aware that there was a matter raised at Coffs Harbour Bypass. I wasn't aware of the full details of that. 
And what steps did you take at that time when you became aware of it? I was advised that it was being managed in the department. Did you seek to raise it with the minister? Uh, no, I had not raised it with the minister. It was an employment matter that I was advised uh, that was being dealt with through the department. And Mr. by that stage, by the time I was involved, there were discussions between legal parties for the department and Ms Hicks. Thank you. Minister, Rochelle Hicks was put on performance review. She raised a concern, a concern about her life being threatened in the course of her employment, and Transport for New South Wales put her under employment management and review. What do you say to that? Can I just clarify that? I don't think that's correct, Ms. It's absolutely correct. I think you should speak to the Secretary about that, ask that. I'm asking you why we have you here. I don't think that's correct. It's not correct. All right, Minister, I put it to you that as a woman that is concerned, as a leader, as the Minister, with many women in Transport for New South Wales and employees watching your response, I would have thought that you would be very keen to get on the front foot with this and very keen to demonstrate that you are A, apologetic to Rochelle Hicks, B, have taken immediate steps and C, are very keen to outline to the Secretary exactly what your expectation is as Minister. What we've seen is you've told the committee today that you were shocked uh, and that you have spent hours on this um, and that you've been transparent. But opposing the Standing Order 52 when the Upper House Legislative Council job is to seek clarification of this, opposing that and uh, having a staff seek crossbench support to oppose so the call for papers. Here? I'm getting there. Oh, great. You see, this is indicative of the attitude. We are seeking answers on behalf of Rochelle Hicks. And it seems, Minister, question? that you're not inviting the opportunity. I'm asking you why it is that you would oppose this, why this. you wouldn't have taken specific steps to pick up the phone to Ms Hicks and to direct your secretary to take specific actions. Ms Ward, as I have said repeatedly, repeatedly on the record, in the media, here today, and in all my conversations with the department, with the, minister, with the um, secretary, with other ministers that have been asked questions about this in the other place, I have enormous respect for Ms Hicks. I am very concerned about what has happened to her. I am sorry, I have said that repeatedly, that this has happened to her. Both the initial event and the other actions afterwards that were not taken. Now, you've put some claims there that she was put on performance, performance management. Review. Now, that was, and let's be very clear, there was a discussion about that, but that was escalated and not taken because it was not the appropriate response and should never have been a response. All right, well, I accept that. Let's move on from that then. Mr. <coughs> Murray, so, but, hang on. No, I've got limited time, Minister. Point of order, Chair. That point of oh, order no. the, has been taken. The I've question really? was exceptionally long. I gave <coughs> plenty of time for an parts. answer. I have seven minutes. There you are running cover. There ought to be a reasonable time for the Minister yes. to the answer the large than number than of things that were put to her. Yeah, I, I won't uphold the point of order. The minister did answer and was about to uh, continue and the member jumped in with a question, which I think is, is actually uh, appropriate, happens all the time. I'm fine with that, uh, Ms Ward. I have one specific question, Mr Murray, to you. Were you aware of the death threat prior to the media inquiry? I was not aware of the details of the threat. I was aware that a safety investigation had been conducted and that we were now dealing with it through... HR and legal processes in the department. You're saying, under oath, in evidence to this inquiry, you were not made aware of a death threat to an employee in Transport for New South Wales. Is that your evidence? I don't recall being made aware of a death I threat. I beg your pardon? We can't no, hear you. No, I do not recall being made aware that it was a death threat had been made against the employee. You don't recall or you weren't made aware? I don't recall being made aware of that. I. That's a very significant uh, piece of information that if it had been given to me in that manner, I was aware that there was an issue on the project that was then being dealt with, but I cannot recall the initial briefing. So your department didn't tell you about a death threat to an employee? Is that what you're telling this committee? I was aware that a safety investigation had been conducted on the project, that uh, it was now being dealt with in the department, and that the matters were being taken Mr. Murray, do you think that's acceptable, that a death threat occurs in your staff, in your department, and it's not brought to your attention? We've been very clear in, in our discussions with it's the yes minister. yes or no. Do you think it's acceptable? The processes have not been acceptable Thank you. all the way through. Minister, <coughs> how long did it take to remove Ian Brown from the Coffs Harbour bypass site after the um, 
after the allegation, after the incident? Look, there's been a lot of discussion about this, Mr Farraway, and it's a good question. I really would direct you to ask the Secretary so, around that. I'm asking you, Minister, because we only have you for half a day, so I'm asking you as the Minister for Regional Roads, you're across it because we've been talking about it. When? How long did it take for Transport for New South Wales to remove Mr Brown from the site? It was... Uh, look, he was... Would you like to take it on notice, Minister? No, no. It like to no. limited time. Well, I mean, this is the thing. Do you want... Okay. I think you should can, ask can, the Secretary of the 20th. I'm, I'm we'll, happy. we'll come back in the after. The Minister, obviously, for the record, the, we're going to ask the Secretary later this afternoon because the Minister can't answer. When, Minister, because when it's was not it reported appropriate, to the police? Mr. Faraway, when, under the when was the incident Act. reported to the New South Wales Police by Transport for New South Wales? Um, I think it was after Ms. Hicks had already reported it. So Look, these months, are these months later. These facts are not in dispute, it, it, Mr. Faraway. We have said it's the, the 16th of August. Okay, thank so you, Minister. So sometime after that, which we are in alignment, that thank that you, was too late. Thank you, Minister. Um, based on your earlier contribution, you said it was up to Ms. Hicks to contact you. That no, was, yes. I didn't say it like that. Okay, well, well, the way the way I interpreted it, I said it, I was giving is, her space. Do you, do you feel do you feel the victim should have to contact you? Like you've said that you haven't phoned. Ms Hicks, but have you sent a letter at, at all to Ms Hicks? Mr Faraway, the advice that was have given... Have you sent a letter, Minister, to Ms the Hicks? The advice was given that Ms Hicks would not welcome a an approach from Transport. Have you visited and the I Coffs Harbour took... Bypass project since the incident was reported to you? There hasn't been an opportunity to, no. Right, so no. such a serious issue and you haven't thought, jump in the car from Maitland, need to get to Coffs Harbour, let's find out what's going on? So you haven't been to Coffs Harbour since learning of this serious allegation and incident? Uh, not, not with work, no, right. not my mind. Okay, Mi Minister, on Friday, July 21, Ms Hicks sent an email to Greg Nash and copied in Mr McNally. And it was, <coughs> she was in that email, uh, obviously unhappy with the response and the handling from transport to date. Now the following day, so this will be the 22nd of July, Mr McNally sought support to have Ms Hicks removed from the project and in the call to papers, uh, an email, and I quote, uh, in an email to transport officials uh, from, Martin, from Martin Donaldson and Andrea Rook, Mr McNally wrote, we've, and I quote now, we've been aware of challenges with Rochelle's behaviour. Of greatest concern has been her open criticism of the project director Greg Nash, which has had a, a divisive effect on the team. So. Um, if we, if we move on, his email says, as such, I need your support to remove her from the project on Monday so that we can address what is develop, a developing rift in our team placing uh, on the project, as well as Greg and Rochelle personally at significant risk. Now, Minister, you categorically earlier said that we had got this interpretation wrong. The call to papers uh, uh, has, has, has happened. We've got the emails. I'm quoting to you what the documents you mm. and your office and your agency have supplied the upper house. Um, Minister, that, that is a job performance review. That is trying to job performance Ms Hicks out of her role and remove her from that project, is it not? What Ms Ward had said was that she had been removed. That email did not proceed because quite appropriately, as I have said in previous evidence, it should never have proceeded. Should it have ever been written? Probably not. But these are matters for the Secretary to address and I understand and have uh, faith in the fact that he is taking them with the gravity they are, but I will re correct the record if I'm asked about it. But Minister, but, what as I say steps, repeatedly, repeatedly, Ms Hicks was not treated so again, appropriately again, in this process. Based on that answer, Minister, on Monday, July 24th, another transport official advised, and this information is from the call to papers, now public documents, and I quote, I suggest we may need to seek approval under the EIR delegation's 3.21 suspension of employee with or without pay. Minister, these are public documents. I am quoting directly from them. Are you misleading this committee today with your contribution? Absolutely not. And Mr Faraway, I repeat again, I am very concerned about Ms Hicks. I am uh, sorry that she has been through this Minister, Minister, this is, if, Minister, if this is a woman. Up, this, a Minister, this is a, an employee of Transport for New South Wales, an outstanding employee who raised an issue after a death threat, uh, had her performance questioned, uh, had 
uh, no support whatsoever, four months, had no police assistance uh, via your department and has not had a phone call from you. Are you sorry that all of this has happened and do you now admit that you got it absolutely wrong? Ms Ward, I've answered that question in so many forums today in so many different ways. So say it again. Say well, it a hundred times. Apologise. Ms Ward. She's had to move house. She's had to relocate really her kids and order. move her jobs. Order. The victim has yeah. time in terms of the opposition's the time. The that is uh, done. Uh, Minister, going back to uh, the uh, regional rail fleet situation with the reported $826 million over budget, uh, are we expecting any more cost blowouts that you're aware of on that fleet? Um, look, as I said, I think you should really uh, direct that question to uh, Camilla, uh, as she is uh, the appropriate person to have that discussion at this point. I'm not the minister in charge of the procurement I'll, of the I'll model, so I think that's yep. a question directly to that point. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's okay. Yes, you're correct. Um, the project budget was increased by 826. That was done by the prior government. Uh, we're working within that budget envelope. Um, those additional monies allocated to the program uh, were to cover um, an increase in the enabling works that were required to support the new fleet, so not to do with the train themselves. Um, there were provisions uh, also for client costs and to sort out um, the implications of that resolution agreement. Thank you. Uh, Minister, I wanted to turn to the issue of the community campaign for um, train, uh, from Trains North is the community group to restore the rail mm -hmm. uh, that was removed quite some time ago between um, Armidale and the Queensland border. Um, there was a debate in Parliament, as you're aware, in terms of that petition being tabled. We also understand that I wrote a letter to the group uh, in response to the petition maybe, mm -hmm. uh, but you wrote a letter to the group uh, asking or instructing them to come back with a business case mm -hmm. in terms of um, in terms of that, that rail line. Um, is it appropriate to ask community groups to come up with a business case for uh, such significant transport um, initiatives? Obviously, you know, it... <laughs> there is a big gap in terms of transport in that region and for clearly the community cannot do their own business case. Firstly, is that appropriate? Secondly, um, what kind of assistance potentially can the government provide uh, in, in helping with a business case? Mm. So thanks for asking that question. It's an area that I used to live in and in fact uh, when I was in uh, the New England, we actually uh, used to use the train coming up. So we, it, when I had a tour operated business a very long time ago, we actually uh, worked with Country Link as it was then to get that train back open to Armadale and it, uh, at Walker Road at one point there. So these things can happen. I've seen them happen in my former business life. Um, that particular uh, track is a very old section of track, as you rightly say, it's been closed for a long period of time. Um, there are numerous proposals around uh, that, you know, people want to do different things, rail trails, people want to do heritage trains, people want to, I've heard stories about um, people wanting to do freight uh, transport there. And I don't know that in the letter, I know I have to would go back to it, um, to be 100% clear, but certainly my intention was not, you've got to come up with a business case, but it would be if there was a business case, it would be considered because I've met with these people a number of times, different iterations uh, in opposition and in government. And um, there's always another service provider that wants to get on the tracks and they're just around the corner, just out of sight. And what my view was, and you know, uh, Mr. Faraway, when he was the minister, put up the rail trails uh, bill, which we supported in opposition, and that was around uh, ensuring that old rail lines wouldn't be subject to the political vagaries of um, coming to have a debate in Parliament about closing the line, but actually put up a, a strategic business case for a use of them. And that legislation did include um, rail trails, but it also did include heritage trains or other, you know, economic or tourist uh, proposals. Now, 
that particular line, we, we had a meeting, I think, with Trains Northwood with some people of that group yesterday, and um, you know, there's I think something like 15 level crossings that would have to go. Like this is a track that intersects the New England Highway. There are very high costs about that. I think it would be a very unwise use of taxpayer funds to just say to a community group that says we want the train back to go yeah sure let's do it we would need to have a business case for a particular freight or um, passenger or tourism or whatever use to, in order to do that and that was really the tenet of that approach I take it really seriously like and that again to the further uh, point is around the strategic regional integrated transport plans of looking at how we can help those communities with their transport. I'm really aware they're very close. A lot of them get their services from uh, Brisbane. You know, we, when I was there, sometimes people would go to Toowoomba. Um, it is a real difficulty uh, getting transport in that area. But is the train the only approach? We want to have a mode agnostic, purpose agnostic look at those transport needs and see how we can best meet them with best value for the taxpayer, but also with better connectivity. Because there's a there's a number of people who have spoken to me <coughs> about the dire lack of transport services in, for example, Tenterfield, or yep. even the buses. I understand. Um, I think it's Tenterfield post COVID. They're just not operating. Was the last I heard. Yep. Um, what's let's move to that then in yep. terms of that Tenterfield and surrounding areas. Yeah. Our um, buses. Uh, you kind of making sure that those bus services get back. Uh, in place, subsidise, subsidising whatever you need to do. Can we expect that for the people of um, that area of New South Wales anytime soon? Look, we're trying to address these issues. You know, the former um, taxi debacle has left a lot of our you know, community towns without um, that point-to-point -point service because they don't have the uh, capacity. There's been driver shortages. We've been trying to recruit that. There's been a whole lot of succession in the area as well, in, in across the state in um, businesses. So we are trying to really drill down with those communities. I've had uh, conversations with the mayor of Tenerfield and um, and with the local members, and you know both uh, really are trying to get. To the bottom of that, I can probably the department can give you more information specifically on where that's up to at this moment. But there are a lot of areas in the yes. state where there is really intense transport poverty, and we are trying to address it. Yeah, okay, I'll come back with more detailed questions in the afternoon for the SOI <coughs> events. Um, I wanted I to, to just time, talk sorry. about uh, the active transport. Uh, grants, if I can find where this is, um, that uh, there was, I understand, an active grant, uh, transport um, grants mm -hmm. project program, sorry, recently. Yep. That um, there seemed to be a lot, many, many councils that missed out on that in terms of wanting projects funded. Um, can you give me the breakdown of how many people apply, like what the we, what the app, um, <coughs> number of applications were, and then how much of that was for regional versus city of Sydney? Oh, uh, sorry, versus Sydney. Yeah. So you're talking about the ones that have just been um, done yes, very recently. Recently. Yeah. Um, look, I would have to get that on notice, but I can tell you a bit about the parameters. We have been very concerned around. There's been a lot of uh, councils that would be getting a lot of. Um, grants and then others that were getting none and uh, this is an area that's administered in terms of the grants by uh, Minister Halen but there has been a quarantining uh, in discussion with myself of 40% of those grants to go to the regional areas to try and ensure that they are getting their fair share. The other thing that we tried to do is to really make it a bit easier for some of those regional communities because um, we wanted to ensure that there would be a limit on the number of projects that they could apply for. So I think they got a maximum of five they could apply for going forward. And also that they could apply for funds, not just for delivery, but also for development. As when you've got small councils, often they don't have the funds to put together a business case. And so that is an innovation to try and so, yeah, give so them that Thank capacity. you, Minister. So this was um, 
this was the get active yeah get new south wales active <coughs> last yeah. year I'm oh so it's the last year's grant sorry so yeah. this is the one i'm looking at it's 2023 but if there's yeah. 2024 info but this is the ones like sorry i just have to get there's 523 home. applications i've just yeah. got this in front of me for actually yeah. for the media release that you issued with the yeah. minister Halen. um that funding allocated for 44 greater sydney projects 40 regional projects so it's $13.6 million of funding overall, mm. and then 40% of that $13.6 million is going to regional councils, which yes. is, goodness me, that's not much when you consider that. Is that roughly the same amount for 2024, $13.6 million, which is, what have we got, like six, six million? I don't have, we don't, I'd have to get you that on notice, sorry, I don't have the exact details on it. Look, are, there, I, are there <coughs> other, so that's one grant yeah. for regional councils yeah. um, in terms of uh, active transport, providing mm. active transport infrastructure, are there yeah. other grants that they can apply for as well? Look, this is the whole point of these strategic regional integrated transport plans and when I say mode agnostic, we are looking at the active transport needs as well. One of the things I've found when I've been going out in the regions is you've got a lot of people who are um, you know, using uh, gophers and other kinds of active transport. We've seen micro mobility trials in the regions and, and all these sorts of things. So we do need to actually put that into our planning for our regional communities as well, because if you're in a uh, regional town and you lose your license uh, and you have to use a gopher, then where are you going? You know, yeah. I, I had it described to me in Mungandai by a transport planner from Moray Shire Council that had worked in um, Victoria that, you know, back in Victoria, the same width of road, there would be a cycleway, mm -hmm. a pathway, that's two lanes of traffic and a tram and the same on the That's good, Minister. Thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you. Um, where are we at? Mr. Uh, go back to questions room, the uh, crossbench, Mr. Latham. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, um, in the email that uh, you wrote on the 23rd of November, is there anything sympathetic in there towards uh, Rochelle Hicks? Uh, so, Mr Latham, it was a file note and it was really for clarification of thoughts. I, you are ascribing that to my view. It was really a record of what had gone wrong and uh, to my point of view it was the, concern, the concerns that stood out to me of why it had gone wrong. Well, I've read the email as you described it. You called it an email earlier on and said that you wrote it. Well, you were talking about it as an email because it was well, no, those it. points being emailed okay. that had been un. Yeah, but, but I've, I've, I've read it and, and, and thought it was totally unsympathetic to Rochelle Hicks from beginning to end. Is that a fair description? Because, Mr. Latham, I, I don't accept that. I just accept that it was a reflection of what was being said to me. It was not, I didn't write it as a reflection on what had been said later. I read it as a content, I wrote it as a contemporaneous set of dot points of the conversation as it flowed. Well, why, does it, why is it written in the first person where you say you noted such and such instead of the logical thing to do that Billy Bloggs told me this? Because blah, blah, blah. I was taking notes on a phone call and I wanted to not actually, um, you know, put in reflections. It was to get factual um, statements that were being made to me so that I had some clarity on it. I was horrified. I've said that a number of times. I was horrified by the comment around the death threats. It stuck out to me. That's why I wrote it down. It should never have happened. Who, whoever, it should never have been dealt with like that. Whoever said this to you, what was your response when they said that the Brown death threat was just an off-the-cuff remark? I said, that's not appropriate. That's not how... And then it was clear that that was... Um, there'd been the same... I think that... Oh, sorry, now I'm going to start extrapolating because that's the thing. I, I had those points. I know now, you know now, we all know that there was a safety investigation that had deemed it was a credible threat. The reason why that was a shocking comment was because it was that initial response to it. At the time, did you have any other account of what had happened that was sympathetic to Rochelle Hicks? You hadn't spoken to her, we know that. So who was telling you anything that was sympathetic to her? That, that conversation was also saying that it was a credible threat. I was, I'm, was writing down my thoughts, oh, not my thoughts, but what I was 
picking up from the conversation? Have you never written down notes when you've taken a phone call, Mr. Well, I normally had them, so-and-so told me such and such. I don't write them as if they're my own words and my own views, but if they're saying it's a credible threat, why have you written that was an off-the-cuff remark? Because that was the point at which this went terribly wrong because it was treated incorrectly from the get-go. Well, the email doesn't say that. At that time, did you have Rochelle Hicks's version of events or anything sympathetic to her? It was a conversation that said, this, was how, this is how it went wrong. And we are working on it. I will get your full briefing. Well, all, all the documents are unsympathetic to Rochelle Hicks. So is it unreasonable for us to conclude all the documents. on the 20... Yeah, in the, in the SO52, yeah. They're overwhelmingly unsympathetic, leading to the disciplinary action. That's what they say. So is it unreasonable for us to conclude, given the information you had on the 23rd of November, that you were unsympathetic to her? That's absolutely incorrect to assume. Absolutely incorrect to assume. I have worked in male-dominated workplaces for some 30 years of my career. I know what it's like to be threatened at work. And I know the minimisation that goes on, even internally, to try and keep going through the day. So I had enormous sympathy for Ms Hicks and I have had threats that I have reported. So don't please try to ascribe to me a lack of sympathy for her. But please why? do not do that on the basis of documents that I have spoken to you very clearly about what they were. They were for me an absolute spotlight that this had not been treated properly at the start. They're, they're written in the first person as if you believe that it was an off-the-cuff remark and there's nothing in the document that says it's totally wrong to describe it as an off-the-cuff remark. Mr. Why is that? Mr Latham, I took notes as I was on the phone. I don't apologise for doing that. I have enormous sympathy. I have respect. I have admiration. For Ms Hicks to stand up and say it is not OK to minimise this at great personal cost and I acknowledge that, is an incredible thing. And she has drawn a line. Our government has been very clear. We do not accept, you know, violence at work. Everyone deserves to feel safe, whether it's from a customer, a, a workmate or a colleague or a stakeholder. She has put this into stark relief. This is an area of emerging uh, psychosocial law in workplaces. And sometimes people are so shocked when they hear that something like that, they don't respond appropriately. She has given us all a direction. She has been very clear and brave and courageous. Well, I'm, I'm going to what was known and what was said and what was written on the 23rd of November, not conclusions um, and rationalisations Well, it was written, as later. I said, and, as and, a contemporaneous and I, I, and note asking, of asking, a phone call, who, the initial phone call. What, what information did you have from your department that was at all sympathetic to Rochelle Hicks on the 23rd of November? Had anyone had spoken the, to you that had said we should be sympathetic to her I've circumstances? As I said to you, Mr Latham, that is actually from the initial phone call that I had on the 10th of November, which led me to call for a full briefing note and which then led for me to um, get an investigation to, to get the department to do but, but a full investigation of it. The email came because I wanted a printout of what I had. Well, why is it dated the 23rd of November? Because that's when I got it. Like, you what's when I asked it for it to be emailed to me? Who in the, did, had anyone in the department, as of the 23rd of November, expressed to you Rochelle Hicks's side of the story? Yes. Who? And when and secretary, how? Secretary. I'd have the to secretary. go through my... The secretary my said he didn't know much about it. He, no, at the 23rd of November, yeah. we'd had a conversation about it. I, I what, think did you, what did you say at that point, uh, Secretary, that was uh, putting Rochelle Hicks's side of the story? Uh, Mr Latham, by the 23rd of November, I think that may relate not knowing the document, but it may relate to when that was printed mm, because the matter had already appeared in the media on the 9th and 10th uh, of November. And as the Minister has said, we had presented an investigation update 
at that point to the minister on the Monday of that uh, following that weekend. Mm. Had you spoken to Rochelle Hicks? Not at that point. Right. So where did you get your, any information that reflected her side of the story? Given that in all the documents that are provided, thousands of pages, the only person at all sympathetic to her was Tammy Hosking, who's the one who blew the whistle in the first place. Because the safety investigation report that was conducted that began immediately after the threat was reported a month after the incident had acknowledged that it was a credible threat and by that stage Mr Brown had been uh, removed from the project Two and wasn't to return. Two months later. Two months later. Order. Two months. But in terms of the mistreatment from July to November, what information did you have at that time? the mistreatment of Rochelle Hicks. What was emerging at that time was clearly, and I had referred to this slightly earlier, uh, was that a level of bureaucracy uh, and uh, lack of pace and energy in the department had enveloped this case because lawyers were involved, <coughs> media was involved, and people were not putting the victim at the heart of the investigation. Okay. And that's what had come to light by that stage. Right. You said earlier Still. that uh, when it got in the media earlier in November, you were only generally aware. Were you aware at that time of the professional standards assessment that had been undertaken and found against Rochelle Hicks and recommended counselling? Uh, I'm not aware of that matter. I'm not You're not aware, aware of, of that matter at all today? No. You're not aware of the assessment that was closed on the 7th of August, conducted by Martin Donaldson, that has found effectively forms of misconduct by Rochelle Hicks and recommended counselling and put this on her employment file and also said further consideration should be given to actively managing Miss Hicks's workplace performance. No, I'm not aware of that. I'm aware of the matter that was raised in the emails that have been tabled to the House where Mr Donaldson, as the responsible decision maker in that case, had declined any other actions being taken. Well, well, uh, which Secretary, was how thorough have you been if you're totally unaware <coughs> of a professional standards assessment that was undertaken against Rochelle Hicks, closed on the 7th of August, and found against her, conducted by Martin Donaldson, one of the three who've been trying to drive her out of the workplace? I'd need to look more carefully at the details of that particular element. We've obviously been that particular. You're confirming you've got no awareness of this, the key document. Your documents. I'm not aware of it in the manner in which you're putting it. I'd need to just well, see some which further. Is printed. I've only Order. got one thing we'll that are printed by your agency. questions from the opposition. Uh, my question to Ms Drover, with regard to the new regional fleet, can you confirm you said it was one long regional train that is at Dubbo, is that correct? Yes, yeah, six cars, one train. Okay, six cars, one train. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, are you familiar with the latest Coffs Harbour bypass bulletin that was issued um, the most recent bulletin um, to stakeholders and to staff on that project? Uh, not off the top of my head. Sorry, Mr. Faraway. Would you be able to, you may need to take this on notice, but mm. would you agree uh, that that bulletin says that the final planning regarding the effect of the most recent variations have not been finalised? I'd have to take it on notice. Okay, take that one on notice. With regard to the sound amenity wall for Coffs Harbour, you will know in previous estimates I've asked questions, uh, has there been any development from your office? Uh, I've been working with Transport to include that wall uh, as part of the Coffs Harbour bypass project. Uh, when you say has there been a development from my office, what exactly have you, do you fund? Mean? Have you found funding to make this happen? Right. Okay. I think I'll pass you to the department well, well, to answer that. I've because got the afternoon. I'm just asking you, Minister, about your knowledge. Well, there's been some changes in that space, yep. and so I think you would be best uh, to get the updated information on that. Okay, well, we'll come back to that in the afternoon. Um, moving along, with regard to the road reclassification report, your favourite. Um, with that one, Minister, have you received the road reclassification and transfer report? Yes. When did you receive it? Um, I don't know. I think it was, was it December? I can't remember. Off the top of my head. Okay. Yep, I've received it. When, Minister? I don't know. Could you want to go to the next question? I'll find it for you. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, with regard to that report, um, are the roads that were gazetted, the roads that were gazetted under the former government uh, as part of the priority round, uh, have they been accepted by government as transferred and there won't be any transfer back to the original council? 
Um, look, we're still working through that. I think you should actually speak to um, Ms Hayden regarding that. She's been working on that well, with well, us. Uh, but We're wanting is, to this get... This is a decision minister that requires ministerial direction. <laughs> Roads like the Northern Distributor in Orange have been gazetted and transferred back to the State of New South Wales from Orange City Council. I'm asking you, Minister, are there any plans afoot uh, to transfer those roads back to the original council? Look, Mr Faraway, this is, as you know, uh, a very long process that was unfunded when it was first committed by your government the priority in round 2019. Was the priority yes, round it was, was done and there was a limited amount of money that was put towards that and we uh, took that money that was left uh, when we came to government to uh, put out on the road network to put $390 million <coughs> into the regional road network to upgrade so the roads Minister, for everyone question, because Minister, we were my, in my such a situation. My question was about gazetting the, ro the, the roads that have already been gazetted. Mm. There's, there's a handful, half, maybe half a dozen roads that were gazetted prior to the election that had been transferred from council back to the state of New South Wales. Are you, do you have any plans to transfer those roads back to councils? Um, look, we've got no plans to, um, sorry, like, we have been working on this for some time. It's a complicated <coughs> process, as you know. It took your government And, and I'm only asking about this. the gazetted roads, Minister. Um, there's no plans to not proceed with the transfers that have already been undertaken. So we, like... So the Armadale Kempsey Road, um, that was part of the priority round, uh, where it has a lot of natural disaster funding attached to it, and there's commitments in writing from the former government and Transport for New South Wales, and it was one of the recommendations of the priority round. Is the New South, is the New South Wales government still going to transfer that road once repairs through flood and uh, flood and disaster funding has been expended? Look, that's obviously a conversation. That matter's been you know, at budget estimates a number of times now. And it, the concern is, as you say, it does have to have flood repairs done. Um, Armidale Regional Council's got apparently But at the end of those flood repairs, million. Minister, at the end of those repairs, uh, is, this, is your government going to transfer that road as it was one that was budgeted for, uh, was budgeted for by the previous government, is part of the priority round of recommendations. So once repairs are done, are you going to transfer that road? Well, once those works are done, we can we will sit and have a conversation with so there's council you, you, you about can't that. Confirm today? No, not because we the council are... is the council is under the impression that you that that road will be transferred at the completion of those flood repairs to that road. Right. Okay. Well, we'll have a good conversation with them about well, it. Well, surely a good surely the surely councils and mayors and, and surely this committee deserve better than a good conversation. No, no, like we will have a conversation because they haven't raised. Have you have you expended the money that was allocated? for the transfer of that road? Um, I'd have to take that on notice. Mm. When will you make that... I mean, our concern was that yep. it had some $408 million worth of works to be done mm. on it, and one of the problems that has so happened... it'll be a good road when it's finished. <laughs> should the, the transport should want that one back because it'll all be fixed. But the, the problem, Mr Faraway, is that, you know, in the time that elapsed from when this policy was announced to when the recommendation and when councils put in their applications and when their council, uh, the interim report came in, a lot of things changed. We had the renewable energy zones, we had post-COVID migration, we had the floods, we had a whole lot okay. of other factors that have done that. So I don't want to say... So, well, so you're happy it, to take on notice yeah. if the money that was allocated by the mm. former government and in the budget and as part of the priority round uh, has been redirected or expended. You're, you're going to take that question on notice? Yeah, happy to. Okay, that's fine. With regard to the reclassification report, have you been able to find a date of when you received that report? Um, no, actually. That's right. Uh, I'll, I'll help you out, Minister, because I'm such a nice guy. Um, the last budget estimates, you took this on notice, and I can mm. confirm with your response that the report was provided to Minister H and Minister Graham's offices on the 29th of June. 2023. Oh. We're now at the end of February, leap year, mm. 29th today, um, mm. uh, Minister. So when will you be releasing that report? So, Mr Faraway, we've been really clear as a government in opposition going to the election that we would not proceed with that program. That 
uh, report was provided as advice to government, it would have needed to go to cabinet to be released. So you, you don't the same have any as plans, it was for you. You don't have and any just, plans to release it. Well, the report, like there'd be a lot of good data there. The reason I ask, a lot of good data for councils, for IPWIA, for a lot of stakeholders that um, I think that would get a lot out of that report. Um, so you have no intention, even though you you, you obviously made lots of comments during the the, the election about me sitting on a report, you're <coughs> saying now that you, you've had this report since the 29th of June 2023 and you have no intention of releasing it. But it, the release is not the only action that can be taken with that report. It is also informing information for Transport for New South Wales in how we proceed with a reclassification process as a business as usual approach, rather than waiting, as has been the case for a very long time, to about every 10 years or so, and then losing all the expertise within the department around reclassifications. We also want to have a look at the complex arrangements which are there in the classifications of roads. Have you read the report, Minister? Yes, yes. Okay, have you read, so you've read the report, but in terms of releasing it, you wish to do that at a later stage or, or you have no intention of releasing it? Well, I'm just reserving my right on that. Right, okay. With regard, back to the Bathurst Bullet, you said you had a lot of conversations with local members out there and it's been in the media a bit and, you know, I'm, I'm a big supporter of the Bathurst Bullet. I think it's a great service. What, what is, where are you up to in terms of the consultation with the state member for Bathurst and Orange um, about extending uh, one of those services through to Orange or for it to start in Orange, one of those Bathurst Bullet services? So we've been having conversations with them, as I've said, and um, obviously there's, you know, different Because there's two very different opinions there, that's all, from those yeah. two local yeah. members. So that's why we are just having conversations, listening to what they're saying, and then the department is working in the background putting those together and we will try to come to a good outcome. Do you, do you support, as the Minister for Regional Transport, the people of Orange uh, having one of those services uh, initiate or start from Orange? Look, there's, um, obviously I support all communities having access to, um, you know, good public transport, having access to trains, etc. Um, obviously that then comes down to how can it be delivered in the best way? How can we ensure that, you know, provisioning of the train, maintenance of the train, staffing of the train, um, timetabling of the um, train, like it's not like you just go, oh yeah, that's great, you want a train? I mean, if it was that easy, Mr Farrowai, you would have done it. Well, at the end of the day, you're the minister now, and yeah. you've, you've visited the region. There's public commentary that you're, you're looking at this. I want to know, are well, you that, seriously looking at it? Is it going to happen? People, people... Yes, I think I've indicated we are seriously looking at it, and mm. if you want to talk to the... Do you have a timeline of when you'd make a decision? If you want to space? get the more specific information, you might want to wait till later on this afternoon and talk to the public servants about it, because I know you don't... Last know question, because I've got limited time, I need to hand over to my colleague. Have you had any specific meetings about lobbying for additional funding for the Great Western Highway? With whom? The federal, the federal government. Oh, the, the federal government. Um, I have spoken to uh, Minister King about that project. They want us to do a corridor assessment and uh, that is important. We are, and it's important to note, we are proceeding with the work that was started yeah, and the also... Former government contracted, yeah. I might jump in if I may. Thank you, Chair. That's how we do it. Uh, Minister, I just want to um, acknowledge um, your attendance at the Road Safety Summit um, and that you were there all day for the entirety of the summit and thank you for your contribution and, and making that happen and the Secretary as well. It was a, a very effective day and I just want to acknowledge that you um, you were absolutely committed um, to it on the day. Um, can I just ask about the Nowra Bypass? Um, what is the Government's position on the Nowra Bypass? So, what do you mean, sorry? like? We're doing funding, like we're looking at the business case and we are trying to work through that with the council and um, that's, that work is proceeding. I mean, that whole, uh, you know, Princess Highway upgrade is a really big project and there's some very big projects that we've just uh, started, the Jarvis Bay, which I'm I might sorry, just, Jarvis Bay. I, I've only got a couple yeah, sorry, minutes, so I'm okay. just that Good. one, but thank you. Um, and I can do some more yeah. detail in the afternoon, but just um, can you clarify how much money has been spent on the narrow bypass since the 2023 election? Um, look, there's planning for it underway. I think there's $8 million from the New South Wales government, but I can't give you the exact details. We need to get that from the All department. right, do you have an anticipated start date for that? Um, I think you'll have to get that from the department too. I mean, we're just trying really to stage these works so they can be delivered. One of the problems we have had on these projects um, as we've come into government is seen that there's a lot of um, pressures on labour and on costs and materials. 
and we want to make sure that we do these right and that we also do better consultation with the community because some of those projects have taken an inordinately long time. Okay. Yeah. So there, just to clarify, it's not a trick question. There isn't a start date yet. I think it's no, no. Between, I didn't say that. Yep, I said yep. you need to speak to the public service. Right. To and give I you think that there's detail. between three and five billion dollars. It's a big project. Acknowledging that, um, Milton Ulladulla bypass um, has the Milton Ulladulla bypass commenced. Uh, not to like there's planning that's been going on. We've got the um, the um, or the, the business case, the route sort of thing, that's all happening. Um, obviously, it's one of those ones where even when I was in opposition, there was a lot of very um, difficult consultation. And uh, I know that, you know, the member um, for South Coast, there was a lot of conversation from her. There was the Brewer Lakes, there was, you know, and then Minister, um, uh, well, then Minister Faraway was involved right, as well. I might so come I do to get it. Progress. It's very yep. complicated. So, um, so we also have that. some other issues on that project. Right. What's the anticipated delivery date for that one? Yep, I will have to take that on notice. I think we haven't got a date on there that you've got, no. Do you have no. a date on that? No. Yeah. Do you know when the project will commence? Um, look, that's the, um, what is it? It's 10 million. Yeah, 10 million is allocated in this year's budget, so. Mm -hmm. yes. And when will that commence, that work? Um, I'll take that on notice okay. for you. Um, the East Nowra sub-arterial, um, at the last election your party said that work on the East Nowra sub-arterial would start on day one. Why didn't that happen? Um, look, I think there's definitely been early planning, like you would know yourself having been former Roads Minister that doesn't just starting isn't shovels on the ground on day one. There's a lot of planning, consultation that goes into that and getting business cases, getting the alignment, working with council there. So, and I have had conversations with Nowra Council about um, that project and uh, as well as the bypass, as well as the bridge, as well as a whole range right. of other um, What things. planning money has been allocated um, toward that project? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. It's, we've, you'd have to take that on notice. Um, but all our election commitments will be funded, and obviously that is um, the case with us. All right. Um, can you outline what community consultations have been undertaken on that project? I'll have to take that one on notice. Okay. Um, so it's not an unfair conclusion because of the size of the project and um, the fact that a small amount, it would seem, of um, it doesn't seem we can be clear on how much planning money has been allocated. It probably won't commence until the next parliamentary term. Is that a fair assessment, given the size and complexity of the project? Um, I'll take that one on notice. That's uh, on oh, notice. But it's it, it, I don't agree. It's with unlikely your, that construction will start. I don't agree with your conclusion uh, at this point. I would like to take that question on notice. So, if you. I'll take the question on notice. So consultation, planning and commencement can all happen in this term? Is that a question? Yes. Are well, you confident that that can all occur in this term? I'll take that on notice. I okay. want to get the details from the department around where we're up to with okay. it. Okay. Um, Mossvale Road. Um, Minister, this week your department closed completely um, Mossvale Road over Camberwarra Mountain for maintenance work at night time. Maintenance included vegetation removal and cleaning of gutters. Um, given that it's almost two years since this road was impacted by heavy weather, when will repair work uh, commence on that road? Um, look, I'm really glad you asked about this. There's been a real concern in the community around the um, repair funding more yep. generally. I'm interested in when it will commence. Um, I, I'll have to take that exact question on notice. Okay. What communications have your department had with the local community given the concerns around it on time frames to deliver those works? Uh, I'll take. I think you should ask these questions of the bureaucrats. Well, I'm asking you because there's been no announcement uh, on the project. Mm -hmm. It's not listed on the project website. Yeah, look, Mr. Fuller can take that question. Um, th thank you, Ms. Ward. I That's mean, right. there's I can been. I'm doing that in the afternoon, Mr. Fuller. I'm asking the minister in the four minutes that I've got left, but I'm very keen to hear from you in the afternoon, mm -hmm. if I may. All right. So, we'll, have you been briefed, Minister, on when works will start on Lost Vale Road? Um, I can't, look, I get briefed on so many projects, I can't remember off the top of my head if I've been briefed on that. So you take it on notice? Well, yeah, happy to take it on notice. Okay, and have you considered providing any financial support to the Kangaroo Valley <coughs> businesses that have been impacted by the delays to the roadworks? Um, look, I will 
refer that one to the department. Okay. Um, you recall that the former government, you referred to a number of um, times the former government did or didn't do things, um, understandably, um, but you recall that we provided one-off payment to businesses in the valley when uh, Barangari Mountain was closed. This rope was on the western side of the valley toward the southern highlands. So I'm just asking if so you would consider there providing, are, yeah, uh, there given are as processes, precedent. There yeah. are processes, Ms. Wardy, as you well know, that are in place for providing that yeah. kind of assistance to businesses. Would you be supportive and of we, that? We, we look at the cases. They, all, I mean, I can't just sit here and say, oh yeah, they're going to definitely be funded because we have to get the scale of what the works will, the impact on their businesses and so we can go forward. Yeah, well there's been yeah. impact because there has been But there delayed. has to be processes, I think you would agree, in terms of taxpayer dollars that we actually ensure that everything is agreed properly. What, what, what are the processes? Process well, people can apply for, um, you know, assistance. Is this something they can apply for now, for that assistance? I will get you that information. And if businesses want to come to have a chat with us about it, we're more than happy and open well, the door. Well, they're chatting with us and they're concerned. This is affecting at a time of dire cost of living pressures um, mm. and they've been impacted. They'd like to know how they can apply, where and when. Yeah. Are you able to provide that we'll on get notice? That. Yeah. Um, okay, um, Mister, are you familiar with the Tripoli Way bypass project? Mm -hmm. You are. Okay. Um, how much was that allocated? Um, so there was some money in the um, fund already. That uh, I think it was sixteen point nine, maybe million, and then we put some more money towards it in the election campaign to bring it up to about twenty million. Okay. So um, since coming to office after the election, how much has been allocated? To the I'll project? take that on notice. Okay. Um, all right. Do you know how much money was allocated to the project prior to you coming to government? There was, uh, I think it was approximately 16 million in that fund that had been allocated, but I, in terms of actually at, to the project, I'd have to take that on notice. All right, I might assist. Um, it's $4.2 million was allocated by the former government in planning and 16.6 .6 million from the Accelerated Infrastructure Fund. Yeah. I'm interested in how much your government has committed to and allocated to the project since coming to office. Yeah, so I'll take that on notice for you until we get the right numbers. All right, do you know who's delivering the project? I will take that on notice. Okay, I think it's Shell Harbour City Council. Oh, sorry, I thought you were talking about something else. Sorry, don't worry. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. All right. Um, Minister, were you aware of a flyer produced by Dr Sarah Kane sent to residents of Albion Park claiming that the former coalition government cut funding to the Tripoli Way bypass project? Have you when got in fact a copy we funded of that to it? table it? I'm just asking if you're Have aware you got of it. The I'm document. asking if you're aware of a colleague tabling a document saying there were funding cuts. Well, if you're were not you going to table so the yes document, no. I won't answer that. Well, I'm not going to mislead this committee. Are you aware of a document which is misleading Sorry, what do you mean to... You're, you're Minister, not going to you aware of a flyer? tabling a document that you're alleging... I think we have our answer. Well, I think we have our answer. Dr Sarah Kane sent a document which was clearly misleading, saying that the former government cut funding when you've just clearly uh, confirmed there was 4.2 million and 16.6 .6 million uh, allocated by the former government. That doesn't concern you? You've put those numbers on the record. You haven't produced the documentation. So, no, I'm not going to confirm what... You just don't care that residents are being misled about a vital project that I think Ms. we all Ward, support? If you, again, I think we've established very well right. in this hearing that when you have so why not did got the, the former full Labor candidate for you are making oh, allegations, that you was cannot a, sorry, that was on the bell. That was on the bell. Okay, uh, Minister, I just wanted to turn to uh, questions about sorry, the Bruxner Highway upgrade uh, funding sorry, cut. Can I you understand. Say that again? I couldn't hear. Yeah, Bruxner Highway. All right, yep, yep. I understand that that was one of the casualties of the federal government's recent infrastructure spending review was the highway upgrade between yep. Wollongbar and to Gunnellabar. Yeah. Um, $6.8 million from the federal government uh, commit, was committed, and I think $1.7 million from your from the state government, but uh, my Greens colleagues who, who live up north, Tamara Smith and Sue Higginson, have told me that that's one of the most dangerous stretches of road in the northern rivers. Um, so what discussions have you had or what steps have you taken to advocate to the federal government for reinstatement of that funding? Um, look, we've obviously been very disappointed by the decision to cut funding to many billions of dollars um, in these projects and that decision is likely to see us as a state about $1.4 billion worse off over the forward estimates and our 
message to the state, ha to the Commonwealth has been very clear, every dollar taken out has got to come back to New South Wales. Now we're still <coughs> talking to the Commonwealth Government to get the best deal for those communities. And uh, in terms of that particular area, notwithstanding those proposed um, funding withdrawals, the budget committed seven and a half million to Lismore Council to construct a roundabout at Alphadale and Cowlong Roads on the Bruxner Highway to facilitate safe uh, <coughs> access from these roads onto the highway. We're going to be working and we are working with council mm -hmm. to implement a solution that will facilitate the safe corridors in that. I'm happy to brief um, your members. Uh, we've been in yeah. good conversation with um, uh, Janelle Saffin, the parliamentary secretary and member for that area. So, yeah. so I understand uh, this one is uh, Ballina. Shire mm -hmm. Council, not Lismore, so it's the oh, it's sorry. the section of the Bruxner Highway. That's oh, sorry, it's sorry. a section of the Bruxner Highway that um, Ballina Shire Council is responsible for. So between, it's, but it's Wollongong uh, and Ganilabar. Ganilabar is not in Lismore. I thought it was. So, so what I have got here is that um, that Ballina Shire Council has uh, apparently been working um, on this, mm. uh, they're keen to continue, you know, working, mm. I understand, yep. um, planning for this critical upgrade. I wanted to just check on the $1.7 million contribution um, that you've all, that the government's already made to that upgrade to see whether that's still there and whether that can, um, whether there's a guarantee that Ballina Shire Council can continue working with Transport for New South Wales at the very least on that upgrade. Look, those conversations with council should have been sort of clearer for them to know that answer. I'd probably take that one uh, to, oh, actually, I'd refer it to the officials so they can come back to you this afternoon. And, the, and what you just said in terms of the Alpha Dale thing, yeah, sorry. I can certainly help with that. Too. Oh, okay. Yeah, come, yeah, come later. Back, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, so time, the, yeah, just in terms of the Alpha Dale uh, road uh, that you just said the roundabout, yeah. you said that that was there was still funding in the budget for that. Was that what you just said earlier? Um, yep, that's right. Okay. Um, when will when is the government expected to announce its response to the community consultation for the Alston Bill bypass upgrade? Um, look, I think that's something you'll have to you'll have to take okay. on notice. All right, we'll come uh, take on notice or come. Like, or back like, sorry, to I'll go that. back to the officials. Let's do it that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Um, wanted to turn to the issue of speed limit reviews. So, I'm consistently informed by we've got a look decent number of Greens on councils uh, the, but and those who are on those councils in regional New South Wales say that their requests for speed limit reviews mm -hmm. are usually declined despite being well supported by evidence um, mm -hmm. particularly around uh, safety and uh, road deaths as we know and community sentiment. Um, do you know why those uh, these requests for you know to reduce speed limit obviously yeah. Um, are continually rejected by Transport for New South are Wales. Are you informed of those? Yeah, are you talking, like, this is the problem, I guess, if you're trying to talk about specific um, specific cases, like, it's probably better to be specific about them rather than go to a generic kind of conversation. Um, if there are councils that are having issues with that, obviously I'd welcome the conversation with them. Is there anything you've got on that, Mr. Uh, I could just say broadly, um, Chair, that uh, we would absolutely welcome any discussion that's been raised with yourself or other members uh, about speed zone reviews. Uh, they are they are complex. Uh, there's a number of them that take place uh, at any given time around the state, and uh, there's a number of factors that go into them. So I guess thank it's you. really just understanding how they relate to standards. Thank and, and to thank you, Mr. Yeah. Ford. So to not take up sorry, but to not take up your time now, I would I will absolutely commit to meeting with any of the councils that have raise those concerns with your, your members and also to raise with your members, uh, to brief with your members more generally around these uh, issues as I would with any member of parliament. Are you aware of the local gov, thank you, are you aware of the local government road safety program mm -hmm. um, which apparently has, uh, which apparently is unchanged since, the program has remained unchanged since it's inception in 1992 despite a commitment to do so to despite a commitment to uh update it i assume by the former government in 2021 um where's the status of that up to and clearly you know this is a big issue from regional councils but the impression that i'm getting um from my discussions is they just don't feel like they're being taken seriously 
Yeah. Um, look, I um, would have to take that exactly on notice. It might be something that I'd, I'd probably suggest it's something to talk about with the officials in the afternoon. Obviously, um, you know, we want to do everything we can to make communities safe and, um, you know, I've even been talking... So when I was out um, in the last seven weeks uh, of the year, I think I met with 20 councils and road safety was the top agenda issue for everyone. I mm. made sure it was. Um, we want that to be not just the one day, but to flow out. And so, um, yeah, it, it is definitely a concern for me, but we want to make sure that we're giving you the right information. And so it, where is that up to within, like in terms of you leading it within government for, for um, uh, this kind of road safety? I know that you've got road safety <coughs> action plan, is it? Yeah. Um, how does the local government side of it fit into that then? Because yeah. that's kind of what we're after, isn't it? There's the local government road safety program that they feel that that's kind of been ignored or, or left, yeah. you know, wanting in terms of some of their recommendations. Yeah. And I suppose what they're wanting to hear is how is there a lot of work, a lot of consultation, a mm. lot of, you know, energy mm. from local councils on this. How is that being fed into your action plans? Yeah, so this yeah, is again, plan. yeah, this again gets back to that consultation piece of having local government at the centre of it all. <laughs> and oh, I know you're looking at the clock, I won't take up that's your right, time. That's right. But um, I just, yeah, this is really where the rubber hits the road, and we do need to do better in this space. If we're looking at, you know, the regional road toll rising, we know that councils are struggling, we know that, you know, there's been increases in those urbanised. Uh, country regional areas so that's very much on council's radars we are talking to them about what we can potentially do um, we've got the road safety officers who assist with that but even when <coughs> I was out in Wentworth for example they, they'd been I think trying to recruit three times and hadn't been able to recruit someone so there are some challenges with the program okay yeah can I check um, when the questions were asked earlier by Mr Benaziak about bridges and one of the some of them were in uh, the Murray uh, mm. uh, area was were there questions asked about um, the uh, new bridges at Swan Hill and Tooley Book? Is that what uh, he, he was... It, he was asking about more different ones. Like, and OK, I'm yeah. going to ask about those but, two. But it's similar, yeah. When and there we is... expect <coughs> those two new bridges to be built? I'll get that one out. Yep, that will be... Um, I think you'll probably want more information from Mr Fuller or, or someone. OK, Hayes. so there's... Ms. Sorry, Ms Hayes. All yeah. right, so there's data there and... Yep. All right, OK, and then the other question is the... Um, Narandra to Tokemal rail feasibility. Uh, hang on, no, wait. This is about. So you get lots of questions from many people, and sometimes you got to decipher what the hell they are. <laughs> um, don't worry. I remember. Yeah, don't don't worry. don't worry about that one. One last question, maybe. Um, I have heard that. So if councils request speed limit reviews from mm -hmm. local councils, they go to Transport for New South Wales. I've got information in front of me that suggests that there are at least seven outstanding requests from councils for those reviews, but some of which uh, go back to as early as 2021 to 2022. Yep. And I can get the detail about those mm -hmm. later, but it would be good to know why they're taking yep. so long and can... Uh, we get some kind of a, a time limit or, a, 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 you know, a time by which uh, councils can expect to get a response by Transport for New South Wales. Yeah, so look, um, there was uh, a, a new sta speed zone standard um, published by Transport for New South Wales in July this year. There was a fair bit of work, I think, that was in the department coming up to that to have a more consistent safety-based approach to speed zone standards and then how you review the roads. Like, there's a whole... The complexity of the roads, you know, what sort of roads are they doing, what's the, the state of them, what's the safety risk, etc. Um, we want to do that work properly and uh, obviously there's been a delay in the implementation of that. I can't give you a time frame today but I'm sure the departmental officials might have a bit more of it but it is something that's on our radar because we're seeing, we wanted to review that standard uh, quite soon after it was implemented to see if it is achieving the objectives of the program. Okay, all right, might pursue that later. Um, Mr Latham. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, when the Australian newspaper first raised the um, problems with the handling of the Rochelle Hicks matter, did you ask Mr Murray to organise a briefing? Um, so on that day, if I remember correctly, I, I was travelling, so I think I, um, I asked my office to find 
someone in the department to get on the phone to me. Your office would do that directly instead of going through the secretary? Oh no, well I mean I think it was through the secretary. I can't remember, I was on the phone, oh, so on the, in the car I just said I need to find out right. what's going on. What's your recollection Mr Murray? Yes, the Minister uh, and her office made contact on that Friday and as has been said already, we organised a further briefing for the Monday morning. What, there'd been a briefing already and this was a further briefing? No, well, it's like was a telephone call. Yeah. Right. Uh, who, who provided that briefing? On the Monday, uh, Ms Drover led that briefing. Right. Say that again, Mr... Ms Drover. Ms Drover. Ms, Ms. Drover organised the briefing. And, and this is the one, Ms Drover, that's reflected in this email on the... Well, no, it can't be. That's on the Monday. That's the 12th. Who's, who, Minister, the information provided, you say, on the 10th of November. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from? So that was in a telephone conversation. And with whom? It was with Ms Drover. And with Ms Drover. And, but it was, as I have said repeatedly, her indicating to me what had gone wrong in the way that that threat was dealt with. Right, and Ms Drover, can I ask you, um, that's your recollection, there was a telephone conversation on the Saturday and then a more formal what sit down briefing on the, uh, on the Monday? No, um, the, the Minister and her Chief of Staff were travelling in regional New South Wales. Um, they rang me Friday afternoon. Um, just a bit of context, I was actually on annual leave. Um, I had been made aware the night before, which was actually was the last day of the last budget estimates, um, that immediate inquiry had come in related to the Coffs Harbour bypass. I hadn't seen the um, exact nature of that media inquiry um, because I was on annual leave, um, but the Minister and her Chief of Staff did ring me on the Friday. I gave them um, some high level information about uh, the incident. Um, I provided a brief to uh, the Chief of Staff the next day, Saturday, um, which was provided under legal privilege because it did include um, uh, some legal matters. Um, and then we followed up the following week with a formal briefing note on the matter to uh, the Minister at her office. Right, so you spoke to the Chief of Staff on the 10th of... And the Minister. No, and the Minister on the 10th yes. of November. And, that, and that's then reflected in, in the email. And, and where did you get your information from? Ms Driver, given that you're on annual leave, what, what uh, contact did you have with the issue previously? Um, well, I was obviously aware of the matter um, and had been having numerous conversations uh, with the head of regional project delivery and others across transport on the matter. Um, so I provided my verbal briefing to the minister and her chief of staff based on what I knew. Um, we were concerned about Miss, uh, Miss Hicks's uh, well-being and, and this is uh, before I'd seen the media nor the, and the article, I was very concerned and in fact I remember um, ringing, I was aware that welfare checks had occurred because as you may recollect Miss Hicks was due to return to transport on the 1st of November um, and I remember um, finishing my conversation with the Minister and going to check uh, with the head of regional project delivery, just the facts about the number and nature of the welfare checks that had occurred that right. week. Is that Mr McNally, the head of regional uh, project delivery, or Mr Donaldson? No, Mr Donaldson. Mr Donaldson. And there had been uh, five uh, welfare checks initiated, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. including one with the police. Yeah, there's a lot of sympathy and welfare checks. There's also a lot of wretched wrong things that were done I, I in the process. That. So, so did Mr Donaldson tell you that he'd taken disciplinary action and done this uh, professional standards assessment and found against Ms Hicks? He had advised me that there had been um, some um, uh, conversations within the project team, um, but he advised me that uh, on his decision uh, no further action would be taken against Ms Hicks and I thought that was absolutely appropriate and I endorsed and supported that decision. How do you um, explain this uh, assessment closed on the 7th of August that uh, said she needed counselling to be performed by Mr Donaldson himself? Mr Donaldson undertook the assessment. Uh, no, I don't think Mr Donaldson did ta undertake the assessment. Um, I think it was the Professional Standards Unit of Transport for New South Wales. Well, he was he's listed here as the decision maker. He was a decision maker, so how it works in transport, there is a separate unit within the HR department. Um, they undertake the assessments. They provide a recommendation, which Mr Donaldson rightly did not uh, proceed with. The recommendation was for him to have 
And look, I am conscious of this matter and I am uncomfortable discussing individual personnel matters out of respect for Ms Hicks and the others well, involved. Well, Ms Hicks is more uncomfortable with the fact she was left stranded with no one helping I, her or standing I, up for I her. acknowledge her, that. Her, her and if, if I can just put on the record you. that when I saw the media article on Saturday morning, um, having not seen the media inquiry, I was very, very concerned and upset. Um, Did you receive counselling from uh, the... No, but, was but, but if I could just finish, uh, when I saw the media article, I realised um, that there was information, new and additional information that Ms Hicks had that had not been shared with me um, to date. And I was also became aware that weekend of some errors within the transport process. Uh, hence why I wrote to Ms Hicks on Sunday evening, expressing my apology and my concern for her well-being and um, seeking to meet with her to progress and resolve this matter. I also uh, wrote to my colleagues, um, both the head of legal and the chief people officer on Monday, um, expressing my concern that I was not convinced that transport had properly taken all due steps and, and I was questioning whether we were satisfied with our approach to this matter and that along with the minister's um, requ request instigated another investigation. Yeah, on, on Saturday the 10th did you tell the minister and a chief of staff that Ian Brown had made an off the cuff remark to others that he wanted to kill? I did Michelle not Hicks. speak to the minister and her chief of staff on Saturday but I did provide an email which was um, a, a, an update issued under legal privilege from the legal department of transport. Does it which, use the expression off the cuff remark? I, I don't believe it does. I don't, I'm not... Well, where's, where's this come from on the 10th? Did you say... Sorry, Mr... Absolutely M Mr. not. Mr Latham, can I just clarify? You've said, you've asked Ms. C Ms. Drover whether there was a telephone conversation on the 10th of November, which was actually <coughs> Friday, and you've called it Saturday, which is a bit confusing. No, well, the 10th, the 10th was uh, Saturday. The Friday, the 10th of November, 2023, unless I'm in the wrong diary, but... Well, in, in the documentation, Stephen Rice writes to Peter McNally on the 9th of, of, of November. But I think that was a Thursday, the Friday was the, was the 10th. Okay. On the Saturday, the 11th, I don't recollect having any conversations with the Minister's office. You had the conversation on the Friday the 10th? Friday the 10th in the right, afternoon, okay. I recollect. And did you use the expression off-the-cuff remarks? Look, uh, I don't believe so, but I can't uh, recollect exactly what I said. I did so. discuss with the Minister um, that obviously there was a delay between the incident and when it was first reported to the project team. Um, and that, that gave rise obviously to this safety investigation. Yeah. I couldn't explain to the Minister why there had been that delay between the incident and the reporting. Um, and I did explain to the Minister that there had been um, difference of opinion um, as to what actually happened at the incident, right. hence why the safety investigation was undertaken. And as we've known, it did confirm that uh, the threat was credible. And the report to the, set the police was actually made prior to the uh, conclusion of that safety investigation, um, because by the time the threat was um, known to be credible, credible, even though the safety investigation was not complete, the report was made to the police. Right, well, Minister, um, Ms Drover said that she doesn't recall saying to you that it was an off-the-cuff remark, so why did you write that down? Because that's what I thought she did say at the time, or it was in the tenet of that? The tenet of that? Yeah. That that was how it was treated, and I think that's in alignment with Ms Drover's evidence that it had been differing recollections within the team, and that was the the way that the one that struck out to me as totally inappropriate. Well, you wrote it down and didn't say it was inappropriate. It's just recorded there, as if it's your own words, Mr. Draper. I did went you say from the action of writing that down to requesting further briefing, more detailed, and then requesting an investigation. Yeah. So, Ms. You know, Draper, did you um, uh, tell the minister that um, Rochelle Hicks was doing a lot of self-promotion and media without approval? No, um, I did. Um, no convey to um, the Minister the nature of my relationship with Ms Hicks. I had met Ms Hicks several, on several occasions, including Coffs Harbour. Uh, we'd done a live cross on one of our divisional live streams um, and Ms Hicks was um, uh, fe featured in that. It was a discussion between Ms Hicks and myself. She was giving an update on the project. Um, 
uh, I, I did uh, explain to the Minister that Miss Hicks had often represented transport in media articles, etc. There was one instance where I had seen a, a media article um, and I hadn't recollect approving it and I had just raised that with, with the Head of Regional Project Delivery and, uh, and uh, so that was perhaps what that was alluding to. Thank you. Thank you. I move to questions from the opposition. I understand about, oh, we've got three minutes each. Yeah. I'll be very quick if I may. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, just coming back to the Tripoli Way bypass, um, mm -hmm. why did the Labor candidate for Kaima say, and I quote, that only Labor will deliver the Albion Park bypass when in fact it was funded by the former coalition government? Because my understanding was that it, there wasn't enough money to complete the project. Yes, but there was no funding from, and you've not confirmed any further funding today for the project. Um, it is funded, uh, in fact, $4.2 million in planning and $16.6 .6 million from the Accelerated Infrastructure Fund. So that's but just there was additional it? funding that Labor has committed to that project at some $4.3 million um, from the Regional Roads Fund. So there was additional funding, which was not going to come from the Coalition Government. But Minister, why are members of your party misleading residents of Albion Park about the nature of the funding when the funding was in place? Shouldn't well, you just be up front with the community about the funding that was in place for this I totally reject, Ms Ward, the premise of your <laughs> scripted question then because it's not actually correct because I just said you had not fronted up the $4.3 million that was estimated that would be required to complete the project which we put in and made the commitment to. So you have provided additional funding, you're confirming that? Yes, that's, yes because that's per our election commitment. Okay. Um, and Under the Regional that, Roads Fund. Was that requested by the Council? Sorry? Was that requested? Um, look, I would have to go back and take that on okay. notice of how that was, but I know there was an issue and concern around sh funding shortfalls, and when I spoke to Council um, some months ago now, I'm sure they were... All right still raising concerns around that and how extra much sorry how much did you say you provided it's 4.3 million 4.3 so our government provided 20 million dollars and you provided 4.3 well it's not your majority money, of it was our done. money it's just no, that I'm we not had saying made it was our commitment. money i'm not saying it's yours i said our government provided 20 million dollars yours provided four so um, it's, it's a not little your bit money. Like, it's, it's a little not bit your like money. It's not our money i didn't say it's that the, they're you yours did, you said you no, said, I said our your government. government provided that money yes yes under our government it's yes. a little bit like painting the Opera House and then saying you built it, isn't it? Uh, Minister, with regard to the email that Mr Latham was referring to, who, was, who sent that email? Um, I think I took the notes on Miss Boyd's phone because I was using my phone to talk and um, I asked her to send it so we could get it printed out. Who was it sent to? Was it just directly to you or to the office or anyone else in your office? No, my understanding was just sent to Miss Boyd. I can't remember, but I, I'm sure that's all it was. Right, so you're happy to take that on notice for us? Come back to the committee maybe during the day? That who? Because obviously someone had to be the author of the email, and you would think whoever the author of the email. But it came off the phone. Of, oh, oh, yeah, but that's not what we know. We, we, there is an well, email. Well, it is what you know, there, because there, that's there what I've email. told you. Well, it's an email, and I'm going to. How do you get things off your phone to print them, Mr. Faraway? Well, at the end of the day, we have an email, and who was the author of the email? I was the author of the email, as I have repeatedly stated. So you use someone order, else's order, email. Order, Minister. Yeah. Uh, no. Time's up. Done. Yeah. Uh, Minister, um, you've acknowledged the risks that motorists pose to wildlife on regional roads. I understand a number of councils across New South Wales. I'm doing half of this time, just by the way, 1.5. Um, a number of councils across New South Wales are trialling innovative technologies to reduce wildlife road kills, yeah. um, virtual fencing, underpasses, stuff like that. So will you consider offering support to councils to reduce wildlife deaths on roads to support them in a bunch of really good work that they're doing? Yeah, happy to look at it because obviously there's you know an important um, you know animal conservation um, aspect to that but there's also a really important uh, road safety aspect so happy to look at that. Okay great I'll go back to this question I couldn't uh, get out before um, in the budget numerous announcements around state road uh, funding uh, one of the roads that has come to my attention Sturt Highway uh, being very dangerous critical uh, need of repair in various uh, areas um, recently been uh, deaths as well, um, a crucial freight link between Sydney and Adelaide. Uh, are we expecting more funding for this uh, much needed upgrade uh, to this highway? Um, look, we always look to prioritise safety 
issues on particular roads where there's uh, crash history, obviously that does create an extra imp um, imperative on it, but that's not just about crash history, it's also about the conditions of the road. Transport for New South Wales has got um, you know, significant funds of money, something in the order of more than $200 million on um, infrastructure road upgrades. Can we expect it for, Sturt for that? Yeah, I'd have to take that one. Okay. okay. All right, Mr Latham. We've got another one and a half minutes. Yeah, uh, Minister, um, do you now acknowledge um, the, the information you received uh, on that uh, Saturday that we've been on the Friday? Sorry. On the Friday, sorry, on the mm. Friday we've been talking about um, was uh, very biased against Rochelle Hicks, given that Martin Donaldson, who'd provided the information, had told uh, Rochelle Hicks on the 24th of July that he was supporting Greg Nash and not her and that as the matter was politically sensitive, it was likely Ian Brown would still be engaged with the project. Mr Faraway, I take that really seriously. Latham. Sorry, Latham, sorry. Sorry, Mr, Mr. Latham. I, I'm really focused on what I want to say here because I know Ms Hicks would be hearing this and I really want to say directly to her that um, I have always said that where there were mistakes made, we would look at them, we would try to do better, we would try to resolve them for her, and that I'm very sorry about what has happened to her, and uh, that I hope she can move on in time with her life in a really positive way, that I admire her courage, I admire her tenacity in uh, this matter, and that, um, yeah, as I said in the very first notes that I took of that conversation, I was concerned about how she had been treated, and that has informed where, every where single action. Where is that reflected action. in the email? Because the email is completely unsympathetic, based on Donaldson as relayed by Ms. Driver. Because Mr. Faraway, when I hear words like that, yes. having been a woman, I know that that is not appropriate, and that. Violence against women has been minimised and, you know, discredited for millennia, and that I understand what she would have been going through yeah, from my own experiences, and I feel very sad for her, and that is was not a reflection of my attitude. It was a reflection of what I heard, what shocked and appalled me. Thank you, uh, Minister. Um, we'll just see if the government has questions. Thank you, Chair. The government has no questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for appearing today. Uh, thank you to all uh, public servants who appeared this morning. Um, I understand everybody, all public servants are appearing later today. Uh, we'll break and be back at 2 p.m. Thank you.
Thank small. you. Okay, big smile. That's a, it's a smile at the thought of getting it underway. <laughs> Get it underway. No, you don't finish any sooner. Anyway, I think we're live. So uh, uh, welcome back from the lunch break. Let's go straight to questions from the opposition. Mr Sam Faraway. Uh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> My question is to either Mr Murray or Mr Fuller. Um, but I think I'll start with Mr Murray. In Minister Halen's estimates last Friday, I, um, I noted that you spoke about a restructure within Transport for New South Wales, correct? That's correct. So what... What <coughs> does regional and outer metro still exist, or as part of the restructure, that division has is gone under the new look restructure model? That's correct. Both the Greater Sydney Division, as it's called, and the regional outer metropolitan division uh, are gone in the restructure because the geographic approach of the organisation uh, is not the focus of taking the model forward. We're simplifying the operating model from 10 divisions down to seven, and we will reduce from three to two the enabling divisions that sit behind is those. That a, is that at your, <coughs> your discretion and direction as secretary or government? Uh, that's at my direction, right. and that's the work that has been underway uh, during this period. After I'd been three months in the job, we did <coughs> announce across the organisation that we would move to a statewide model, and then uh, what is a couple the, of weeks what, ago what, we why changed though? that. Why would you move to a model that has worked um, quite well, I suspect, at least for regional communities and for the regional road and transport network for some years now? Actually, Mr Faraway, the explicit feedback to me as I moved around the state was that in fact regional offices and regionally based staff were struggling with the model. They were struggling with their access to the uh, expert resources across the state uh, and they were finding that uh, measures were being boxed into geographic regions rather than being the best fit for transport. So Mr Fuller, is that true in, in, in I suppose, as still the depth sec for ROM, I suspect as of today, but maybe tomorrow a different, a different case, is that the feedback that is coming from the ground? Oh, I think there's certainly an uh, opportunity for us to improve and as the Secretary's talked about, uh, really take advantage of the skill set, the capability, um, the experience that sits across uh, transport more broadly. So uh, what we're looking to in the new operating model is um, I, I suppose to remove some of the um, siloing, for want of a better term, that's occurred and the, uh, the tendency to sort of do business do with other parts of transport. Mr Fuller, as someone who has lots of experience uh, working across transport in the regions in, in response to uh, natural disasters, road programs. Um, um, I don't need to go on because I know, obviously, your experience. But um, do you seriously believe that this model will best serve regional New South Wales? I think it's incumbent on all of us across the transport executive to ensure that the regional communities in New South Wales are represented in all of the work that we do. So I think uh, I think we can make any model work, and I think that uh, certainly uh, the way in which I've heard the secretary talk about it and the planning that we've done as a team around the executive table, uh, I'm sure will uh, ensure that regional communities still have a very so strong voice to, to, in the to work. To Mr. That we Murray, do. what do you say to? Um, regional <coughs> communities, mayors, any regional stakeholder who years ago felt that transport was such a large organisation that it was very city centric, that it was very Sydney orientated, what do you say and to comfort them that this new restructure you're uh, setting out on uh, won't leave at least that regional perspective and expertise and delivery? Because I think I think that, that's the big part, delivery, because they had people in the regions with a regional focus. How, how are you going to comfort those concerns? There will still be people in the regions with a regional focus and deploying that expertise. But to those exact stakeholders that you spoke about, that was a key term of reference of the work that we've done around the structure because that absolute crystal clear feedback to me was that our stakeholders, not just in the regions but around the whole of New South Wales, could not navigate a clear path into transport and when they did get in they were referred from a geographic business unit to a functional unit and back again and this is to clarify those lines by streamlining us into a smaller number of divisions with clear leadership and accountability. So with, with that in mind Mr Murray, uh, have there been any staff redundancies due to that restructure out of regional and out of metro? We not in regional outer, outer metro, so as you correctly all, said, all, Mr. All Fuller. Will redeployed or will be redeployed? We are working through now the design that sits under our new 
operating model, top structure, that was unveiled to the organisation in the last two weeks. As you correctly said, I spoke about it last week. The work is now ongoing into placing the key leaders underneath those new structures. So where will the freight division, or does freight branch still exist within Transport for New South Wales, or, or will you have a, a uh, dedicated team still looking after freight within your agency, Mr Murray? Yes, we still will. The freight uh, division will sit under the client uh, division, the one client division, rather than having a geographic base. That's a great example. Freight obviously impacts both Greater Sydney and regional and outer metropolitan, but it sat within regional in its previous incarnation. That's right, because I put it there. I understand that. It was a good team. They knew what they were doing. But so as a result, they were forced on. to deal with two, two masters when they were deploying policy. That's right, there's only one. Um, Mr Murray, um, moving on, when do you expect the full changes to be implemented? Uh, we will be working through the, there will be an, a number of initial lifts and shifts within the organisation uh, because of the functional changes. So that will happen over the next few weeks and then further uh, changes will pan out over coming months. And we anticipate having this done by three quarters of the way through the year. So will the regional directors and I suppose Ms. your team, Mr Hayes, will your, where, will, where will Mr Hayes' team, team be positioned within the restructure? In th that design is ongoing at the moment, but in most cases, the regional uh, the, the resources that currently liaise with those regional communities mm. will report through the client model, which right. as we're calling so it, which is, is there any, passengers and customers. Is there division. any plans to remove any of those those roles that are uh, incredibly important, especially in the regions with stakeholders, councils, road projects? Um, is will it be purely just a redeployment and where they sit? Obviously, are there any plans to, to disband in those roles? I think I'll refer to my response to you on this last week, but there, last week. there will be uh, matters where across our organisation we are part of the government's commitment to reduce senior executive roles by 15%. That will be factored into the change in our structure. Uh, however, I have been very clear through this process that our regional footprint and our access and the people having access to us is one of the absolute paramount considerations of the new model. Um, question, I just want to move on. Coffs bypass uh, to Ms Drover, um, might be hopefully best placed. Um, with regard to the Coffs bypass and the sound amenity wall that we talk about most estimates now since the change, um, the Minister mentioned earlier that there could possibly be updates in that space. Uh, so one, I suppose, with regard to that, the latest bulletin that I referred to on the Coffs Harbour bypass, uh, there is obviously it can be it can be assumed that the final planning uh, regarding the effect of most of the variations means that it's not finalised. Is that fair to say? And where does the does the sound wall amenity wall uh, is that still being considered at all uh, as part of the project? Okay, um, I think you're referring to the noise wall outside a particular. <coughs> Proposed development. Correct, so yep. outside the proposed yep. film studio or Pacific yes. Bay. Yes, okay. Um, so I think I'll refer back to my response at the last budget estimates. Um, as you'd be aware, the planning approval doesn't require us um, to put a noise wall in that location. Um, and it is still a proposed development, is my understanding. Um, the other issue is in the detailed design that was offered by the, uh, the contractor which is delivering the project. Um, one of their design innovations was actually to move uh, the, the corridor for the Coffs Harbour Bypass further west. So it puts it even further away from that proposed development. So, so the Minister mentioned earlier though that she had a further update. So I is there any further update about that corridor or specifically is there any update um, or can you update today's hearing of when Transport for New South Wales will determine <coughs> if it will be removing any of the trees and bush along the boundary or and when it will occur? Yeah, look, I'm not clear what the Minister was referring to. Um, I can tell you that 30% of the earthworks for the project are complete and you may be aware that we started tunnelling uh, at the end of January for the project. The three tunnels, the short tunnels, six tubes in total. So that work is underway. Um, I'm also aware that 90% of the clearing for the project has already occurred. Is there any way that, uh, that some of the vegetation, some of the trees and bushes that are along that boundary can be retained 
which may act possibly as uh, a, a amenity or sound wall uh, for the hundreds of residents that actually live in and around that development. Yeah, look, I'll, I hope you take that on notice. Um, but what I can say is we don't clear trees if we don't need to. Um, we have a protocol where we check every tree before we do clear it, even though it was proposed in perhaps an EIS or, or other prior planning document. Um, and yes, if there is an opportunity to ret retain any vegetation, we absolutely will. And that may be the case if we've moved the alignment further west, but I'd need to go away and get that level of detail for you. If, if you could, Mr. Drive, that'd be very helpful. I've been approached not, you know, by a lot of uh, uh, members that live in and around those developments, not just the owners of um, Pacific Bay, for instance, um, but it's actually quite a few people that live in and around that area semi-permanently and they have huge concerns about the noise of decelerating you know, de de -accelerating, accelerating trucks and vans and buses and heavy vehicles that actually will come be coming into Coffs Harbour uh, and exhaust brakes obviously um, for people needing to pull up at that intersection and I suppose that the, you know, the former government made a very clear commitment in this space at the election which I know you can't comment on policy but can you come back on notice to see if there is any way that retaining any vegetation, trees, bushes along the boundary and that corridor would serve possibly as a wall without having to build a wall. Yeah, absolutely. Most happy to. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Great Western Highway, yes. um, Cox's River Road and Medlow Bath. I drive the road all the time. Lots of work going on. Um, how is that project proceed? How is it running and are you still on track for your proposed completion dates? Yes, we are. I drove uh, through there myself just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so both the Medlow Bath project and the Cox River Road are proceeding as planned. Um, lots of local engagement. So there are new uh, community consultati consultative uh, committees that have been established for each project. Uh, it's going really well. So w what is the completion date for Cox's River Road? Uh, just have to... Just give me a minute and I'll yeah, yeah. come back to the... That's right. If you could also come back uh, on Medlow Bath. Yes. Um, but I'm happy for you to come back a bit later, Ms. Drover. Uh, I, I can probably give it to you now. So I've got lots of questions on this. Mid-2020 drive. Cox, Cox, yeah, mid-20... Yeah, and mid-25, I think, for uh, Medlow Bath. So mid-25 for both? Uh, yeah, mid-25 for Cox's River Road and 25 for... Um, Medlow Bath. Okay. Obviously subject to weather, given um, yep. significant earthworks on the Cox River Road project. Okay, excellent. Um, <clears throat> with regard to the work transport undertook, um, with regard to the EIS for a proposed tunnel, um, are you aware of what the results were of the submissions? Um, so you'll be aware that obviously we did the EIS and it was displayed. Um, we had prepared a submissions report. Uh, given the project has been cancelled, both at the state and the federal level, uh, we have not gone back to the community with that submissions report. But we did obviously assess all the submissions received from the community. Um, that was considered. Um, but no, that has not what gone were, back. What, what was the majority view of those submissions? Uh, I would need to take on notice because um, I haven't seen the final report. It was never finalised um, given the project was Was, was there cancelled. an interim report com completed? Uh, um, or, well, or a draft? Well, it, the, the report was um, pursued but, yeah. but it wasn't finalised because the project was cancelled. Happy to take on notice what I can share with you out of those community feedback and the submissions. Can you take on notice, Ms Drover, uh, whether you can table to the committee uh, on notice uh, a copy of the draft report? obviously bearing in mind the project never proceeded, but what the conclusion of all the submissions were? I may take that on notice, but I uh, suspect I will also need to liaise with my colleagues in the Department of uh, Planning or, yeah. or uh, DFI. Mi Mr Murray, would you, be, would you be prepared to also, with Ms Drover, take on notice mm. that um, if that report can be tabled to the committee? Uh, yes, I'll take that on notice. And apologies for my distraction there. I should just point out there water dripping onto power cables in front of the oh. Hansard table. Oh, yeah. There's water dripping in this room. Good point, Mr. Murray. What's going on upstairs? Yeah, yeah I'm someone's having a bath. 
Right. So, keep going. Yep, all right. Um, let's hope we don't get something else happening here soon. Um, so, Mr Murray, obviously, with regard to that report, do you see an issue, uh, do you see an issue in tabling or making public uh, the draft or interim submissions report for the EIS for the proposed tunnel? Oh, I'm aware of the process. I just have to take advice on tabling that and we'll come back on notice. Okay, excellent. Um, moving on to... Um, country rail network so this might be Mr. Cross Conference here. Yes. I still remember who does what. <laughs> uh, Mr. Crosscoff, um, just regarding the TOC waivers, where is that process up to in reviewing reviewing those waivers uh, prior to their proposed expiry in April by UGL regional links? So the TOC waivers, um, what happened was UGL gave notice that they were going to withdraw the TOC waivers. The TOC waivers were then reinstated through to the 28th of April. In doing so, we've come to an agreement with UGL to undertake a range of monitoring works uh, to understand uh, the current condition of the track and the ability of the track to continue to operate under those top conditions. Uh, that work is underway now. Uh, some of that work has been, some of that early work has been completed, such as the LIDAR surveys, ground penetrating surveys and AK car running surveys are, are underway at the moment as well. We're expecting to receive from UGL Regional Links a uh, a report on the condition of the track and then how that track will be maintained, what investments are required in order to maintain the track. Is there the a future? view to remove the TOC waivers altogether? Because they're essentially waivers for something that has basically become permanent now. So is there a view from Transport for New South Wales that there needs to be a negotiation with UGL regional links to make these TOC waivers permanent? The view from Transport is that these TOC waivers should only be used as a temporary measure and that those top waves have been in place for far too long, that between UGL regional links and ourselves, we may need to make the right prioritisation for investments and, and investigations in the track condition so that we can continue to provide the level of service that the rail service operators have been working on so, but under to, today. To, to my point, Mr Groskoff, that means that you want to, uh, does transport, is transport looking uh, to vary the contract with its provider, UGL regional links, uh, to uh, make to, to remove these TOC waivers because these waivers have essentially become permanent and there is an expectation uh, and rightly so that if we want more freight on rail if we want to maximise some of the rail investment on the CRN over the last five years um, why have we got waivers on a network in parts that we've upgraded? I, I expect that what we will do is issue uh, UGL regional links with <coughs> further directions to undertake modifications to the line to allow those top waivers to move into the top menu. Will that require will that that will require a variation to the contract, won't it? No. So how how can it not be a variation to the contract? It's, it's it's simply a principles directed modification to the service provider to undertake further works. We do that under the contract framework. But they the the, the contractor pays for those additional works. No, if it's a principal directed modification, that work is undertaken, that, that payment is made by the principal transport. Yeah, so to my point, there needs to be obviously some level of agreement um, in order for UGL regional links um, to be paid to ensure that the maintenance to, to carry 25, you know, TAL for instance, yeah. yep. um, um, becomes a permanent fixture, not a one-off waiver. Correct. There are there are a variety of ways of achieving that that TAL uh, threshold because it is a bit ridiculous where we where government has spent money on upgrading uh, parts of the CRN uh, to get from, you know from 21 um, uh, track axle load limit up to 25, but then you've got a waiver. You now have a waiver which has been in play for some time, which I accept. But I, I take it, and correct me if I'm wrong, from what you're saying, that there is a view from transport to try and address this longer term, and that will mean a variation to the contract with UGL regional links to allow them to maintain the track and to remove top waivers essentially longer term. 
Mr Farraway, we are absolutely aligned in that transport will move with UGL Regional Links to make sure that the train operating conditions and the, and the uh, track axle load limits are there and provide that service to the rail service operators. I think the only issue we're having is, is that in the, in the way that we administer this contract, we don't have to make a contract variation. What we do is issue a principal's direction, principal modification direction, and then um, UGL Regional X will undertake those works. That is done under the existing framework of the contract. Mr Farrow, could I just add, um, I'd, I'd just like to say on the record that um, it's absolutely our intent to have it converted into the train operating manual as Mr Groskos outlined, but I'd also like to just thank the operators for their patience and working with us. They've been uh, incredibly um, constructive and it's been, uh, you know, a lot of really good considerations with the operators that uh, have supported that. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, ask about bikes on trains, regional trains. I asked about this at the last budget estimates uh, hearing as well. Uh, Mr Murray, I think you were talking, I'm just finding it, saying that you were looking at a solution to allow the bikes in carriages, um, some kind of engineering solution, looking at it early this year, I believe. Is there an update on that? Uh, yes, thank you for the question, and I'll ask Mr Merrick to come in as he's been looking at that proposal. Great, thank you, Mr Merrick. Yeah, thanks, Secretary, and thank you for the question. I think, as I shared in the previous esti estimates, the procedures we use today on the XPT um, that went into service in 1982 and the Explorers into 1993, so that the procedures we use today largely is a reflection of the design of the trains, a and also. Um, to do that safely, we use a boxing procedure. So a passenger that would like to transport a, bi a bike on one of our services is required to box them. But as I also said in the last estimates, we were looking to trial some prototypes mm. or some capacity, additional capacity, or different ways of having roll-off, roll-on, roll-off configuration. So what we're doing right now is working through um, a number of options with the intent of trialling those over the coming months and as we speak, we're in conversations with our health and safety reps, our union reps, um, our staff and our stakeholders around what that might look like. And we're going through a risk assessment process to ensure that that trial or that prototype that we use is done safely. Okay, because I, I do think that, or feel that that was similar to the response last time, was yeah. uh, safety uh, issues were mentioned. Um, which is what we're four months ago I think uh, we're, we're, we're talking um, are there issues is there resistance from cer certain stakeholders is this what's happening um, it just sounds like there's uh, people pushing back in terms of safety is that is that I, I wouldn't categorize it as pushing back what, what I'd say is that all of our stakeholders are being involved in the process which is largely is, is a safety a safety or a risk assessment so as you can imagine, um, or as you can appreciate today, boxes used to transport bikes is the way of transporting bikes. So to have a roll-on, roll-off configuration on a train that's not um, designed to do that um, is a considerable change. So I wouldn't categorise it as resistance, but making sure that it's safe to do so. And okay. as I said, we intend to, to trial that in the coming months. Okay. So. How long have discussions been going on in terms of these safety issues with these uh, stakeholders that you're talking about? Obviously, there's been campaigns, uh, there's been requests for some time yeah. for people to be able to essentially hop onto a train with their bike, hop off, hop off with their bike. The government's clearly supporting rail trials everywhere. Um, this is just, I think, something that a lot of other jurisdictions do. How long have those discussions been going on? Were they have they been going on since the government came into um, into power? So March last year or before then? These same discussions. So discussions with our bike user groups um, started back. I think it was in April of last year, where we got all of our stakeholders, including the bike user groups, I into a um, into a single discussion around <coughs> what the desire or the need was. 
With regard to our employees and our health and safety reps and our union colleagues, that's occurred over the last two months in that we now have a prototype design that we can actually show people. So that's why that's occurred in the most recent times. Uh, what I would say, it's absolutely our intent to explore every opportunity to get additional bikes on. But, but as you can imagine, for 11, 14 hour journeys, um, we need to be sure that a bike is safely restrained within the train so that it's not a potential safety risk to other passengers. When you're saying prototype, what is the prototype of? Yeah, it is roll on, roll off. So it's the ability for a bike to, to roll on, be yes. safely secured. Yes, yes, I'm aware of that. But yep. then the prototype is something that the bike attaches to the wall of the carriage. Um, it's, you're clearly trialling something in that way in terms of within the carriage itself. The intent is to, yes, yes. And so you've got one prototype. What, what we would call like what we would call a low fidelity mock up. So that is um, wow, a, a con some a computer. jargon, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a configured. It is a it's a it's um, it's a way of restraining a bike, uh, not the final product, but it's a way that will allow us to actually trial that process on one of our expertise. Have you got any deadline for this? I mean, these things. I mean, they take a long time. This just a trial. This oh. takes a long time. Well, it has taken a while, but as again, I can only point back to the safety, um, the safety argument or the safety comment. Um, it so is you're trialling the prototype because this was what this, the safety, the safety thing was mentioned. It was it was mentioned last time. It's pretty much the same thing. So you've yeah. got a bit more detail this time yeah. uh, around the groups and a prototype. Yes. Uh, so is there say the beginning of um, next financial year, say July? Do you have any idea when? Uh, it looks like we are going to be seeing this, and again, this is just on existing the existing stock, isn't it? It is. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I'd be expecting. And I don't want to give an exact date, but I'd be expecting in the next two months we would have had at least an opportunity to trial the prototype. Okay. The slowly slow steps. What about the the new trains, Ms. Drover? I can't remember if I asked you this last time. What, what's the expectation there? Those six new carriages at Dubbo, do they take roll-on bikes? Uh, there is some provision for um, roll-on bikes, but, um, but it is low numbers. Uh, I might just pass to my colleague, uh, Ms Hayden, for further details on, on how Come that on work. down. <laughs> Thank you, Ms Hayden. Um, thank you for that. Uh, as um, Ms Drover spoke earlier, there is three types of regional rail services or mm -hmm. regional rail um, trains that are coming in, which are the long and the short regionals and the intercities. The intercities do have um, bike um, facilities uh, and we're looking at the outcomes of the trials on the XBTs for how we'll look at that in the regional services on the new trains as well. So at this stage with the, uh, I think Ms Drover said, a car, uh, they can take a few bikes, sorry, so what's the expectation around how many bikes? So for example, you get a group of people that want to travel to some regional centre, Orange, you know, to do the rail trials and want to take their bikes, group. and there's like 20 of them. Um, I, we'll have to come back with you with exactly what the capacity is um, and if it's a stepped improvement from XPT, but what we're trying to look at is can we go further than what the current arrangements under XPT are, which may see beyond boxing storage options that allow... You know, we, I will say that just to be clear, I'm yep. talking about roll-on bikes here. Yeah. Yes. So at the moment, the design of the short and long regional train does not allow for roll-on. We're wow. using the XPT trial to look at how we could bring that into being on the short and long regionals. Wow. These are the new trains, and they're still... Is that, that, that right? The new trains didn't have a requirement the, the to... In the fleet, there's the intercity types of trains yep. within the new fleet. They have some capacity, but I acknowledge it is a low number. But I think if I can just reflect on Mr Merrick's comment, um, given some of the, the long regional trains will, will be a journey of 14 hours, um, you know, safe storage of the, the bike is important. But it was never going to um, address the sorts of issues you were talking about. A group of friends, you know, taking a train trip, 20 people up to a rail train. Yeah, which you think, which you only think is going to increase 
uh, that I assume in terms of the, um, in fact, rail trials, I did want to um, ask a question about rail trials and the funding and promotion, how that's going. Who do I direct that to? Mr. Fuller can take that question. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Fuller. Uh, so, in relation to that, in terms of the projections uh, that the government has around the use of rail trails and how they're going, I mean, are we? What are the projections? Say, for example, by 2035, has the government forecast what it hopes uh, to see in terms of people using those rail trails, or should I be directing this to the tourism minister? Do you think? Uh, we, we don't have formal projections, so let me start with um, there are projections within business cases that have been uh, the premise for yes, some of, of the rail trials and how they've been created. So say in the Northern Rivers as an example, um, the current work that's being undertaken that was uh, you know talked about this morning in terms of Trains North and the proposal between Armadale and Glen Innes um, and obviously the one down near Tumbarumba. So we don't have numbers on hand and what the, that, whether that's shifted since those business cases were implemented, but um, that's something um, uh, we could connect, connect back with the operators of those rail trails, the mm -hmm. organisations. Generally speaking, they're not-for-profit groups, so they don't tend to do a lot of um, long-term, long-range forecasting on visitation, but it may be something Destination New South Wales has undertaken. Thank you. Uh, Mr Latham. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, to um, Ms Drover, uh, when you briefed the Minister on Friday the 10th of November, uh, did she object to anything you said, uh, as in you can't use that phrase? Uh, no, I was giving, conveying to her factual information as I understood it to be at the time. Right. Um, as I said, it, was, um, it wasn't, I didn't have notes in front of me, it was just some, some basic information because I did commit to give her a formal briefing note, which I did provide the first step of that on the Saturday. Um, and look, just to confirm, put on the record, I, I haven't seen the, the document that you're referring to. Um, I understand it was the notes of the Minister. Um, but I can confirm that it was a very neutral conversation with the Minister, stating the facts of the matter as I knew them at that time. And obviously, as we knew them before, the Australian article had come out. Uh -huh. So it was just a case of you providing factual information and the Minister saying, yep, yep, OK, yep. noting yep, that information. Yeah, because I had committed to provide her a full and thorough briefing mm -hmm. on the matter, and there were elements of um, the matter which uh, I w uh, that um, other parts of transport were managing, for example, the legal component. Um, so that's why I committed that yeah, briefing. Is that where your briefings to the Minister ended, or did they carry on past uh, Saturday the 11th? Well, as I said, I spoke to the Minister and her Chief of Staff on, Saturday, on Friday. I did not speak to her over the weekend. I had numerous conversations internally with my colleagues, uh, which led to me writing to Ms Hicks on the Sunday evening. Um, and then on the Monday, the, the, uh, um, the briefing note was prepared. Uh -huh. I think it went to her later that week. Uh, I think we sent a draft to her perhaps on the Monday or Tuesday, and then it went through the formal approval process. Right. And to the Secretary, uh, to the best of your knowledge, when was the Minister first informed that the processes had been mishandled regarding Ms Hicks? Uh, thank you, Mr Latham. Before I answer that, could I just be clear about the matter we discussed before the break, which was the uh, investigation that you asked about? We were referring to the same email chain in that discussion. I think, as Ms Drover said, the Director of Regional Project Delivery was the decision maker not the instigator or the... Who, who did instigate it? Uh, it was done from the project and it was conveyed to a relatively junior member of the compliance unit. When it reached that decision maker, it was terminated and it went no further. But and who, I would also who instigated add, the complaint? Well, the, those documents were provided under privilege, I understand. On the, that was from the project. You've, you've read some of that onto the record. Are you saying already. Mr Nash or Mr McNally? I'm not able to comment on that. What I would say is that when those Can matters, anyone say who instigated the complaint? What I would like to say is that when it was terminated by the correct decision maker, which is Mr Donaldson, as referred to, uh, there are very few people who could have enabled that process to keep going and it was not put in front of any of those people. So uh -huh. I, I just want to be clear that that investigation yeah, that, 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 that was, was said, not... That was said before uh, lunchtime, but what about my question as to uh, when the Minister was first briefed of problems with the handling of the Rochelle Hicks matter? 
I believe that would have, uh, I couldn't speak exactly to that matter, but I believe that once we got into the discussion that Ms Drover has already referred to, we were certainly concerned at the length of time and the quality of information that had flowed through in the early part of this process. So what, what date are we talking about when the been, ministers first told there were problems? That would have been from, beginning from that week after the weekend of the 10th. Right, so like around the 20th or no, I believe later the, in November? No, the initial briefings were that week. It would have been in that week that we would have said that we had some concerns. Right, and what were the problems identified? Well, as I said, we were concerned about the time taken and then there were elements that were covered in the Australian newspapers reporting that weren't, uh, weren't known to the executive team. Okay. Uh, you mentioned earlier the professional standards assessment. Uh, is that going to be rescinded now so it no longer sits on Rochelle Hicks's employment it, it record? Is, it is not on Ms Hicks's record. It went no further. It was an email chain that emanated from the project and went no well, further. It's a, it's, a, it's a four page assessment that makes a whole series of allegations against Ms Hicks that, that are wrong. For instance, it says that she's, um, you know, they're, they're investigating that she's unreasonably likened the conduct of concern to domestic violence. Well, if Brown turned up at a home in Coffs Harbour, it's very domestic. What, what's wrong with her saying this is not a lot different to um, uh, domestic violence, given that Ian Brown made a death threat? None of that should have occurred. Uh, it, was, it was a misguided and poorly judged uh, approach while during the heat of the complaint that Ms Hicks had already been made when attention should have been focused on that and it was correctly terminated by the regional leader who is the decision maker. Well, why was it accepted by the assessment team? As I said, it bounced around in that discussion and it was terminated by the correct decision maker. It was an internal HR discussion that shouldn't have originated but I completely accept that by the time Ms Hicks became aware that that had happened that would have been incredibly distressing. Right. And have you read the entire file and all the documents that uh, relate to the Hicks matter? I have read through the file and I have been presented with the investigation reports, yes. Right. So how's Greg Nash still working for Transport for New South Wales, given that he put way ahead of the safety of uh, a woman, um, a deputy on the project who'd received a death threat, put downgraded that safety concern in favour of uh, politics and um, the uh, delivery of the project? Thank you for the question. We have got a lot to do in the wake of this inquiry and the investigations that were lodged on the back of what we have learnt and the treatment of Ms Hicks who didn't receive the appropriate support at any stage during this process. Uh, those matters will be followed through. I'm not going to talk about individual employees and I don't believe calling for uh, processes in this house against employees is the correct uh, form of approach. However, I can assure you how seriously the whole of transport is taking this. Yeah, matter. well, in, in terms of correct approach, I'm representing a constituent who's been shockingly treated by your agency, disgracefully treated by your agency, and all the documents a demonstration of that, and someone's got to be accountable for it. And you would have thought, especially given they've lodged you know, it's complaint after complaint, blame the victim, blame the victim, from Nash and, and McNally, it's incredible to think in a government that talks about safety for women in the workplace, that they lasted five seconds in their jobs after all of this was known. How, how can you explain that? I agree with you that mistakes were made up and down the chain in terms of assumptions uh, and uh, actions, misguided actions that were put in place that work to address all of that is continuing. And when will that be finalised? Well, it will continue until we can be assured to people like Ms Hicks that uh, we can look them in the eye and demonstrate that we have the robust system that wouldn't see this never happen again. Yeah, eight months after the death threat was made, what has changed inside Transport for New South Wales because of this disgrace? Well, I agree that it has taken a long period of time. It is a long time since the original approach. Uh, what I would say is that doesn't mean that work hasn't been ongoing for that entire period and work is continuing to round out some of those actions. Uh, I did want to cover off a number of elements that have been put in place and that is that we've reinforced across the agency the expectations in dealing with sensitive or difficult matters like this, unacceptable behaviour, bullying and that there is zero tolerance for such issues. We have implemented measures to escalate significant behavioural matters to the correct places within 
the organisation, which didn't occur in this Does case. Does that mean that death threats in future will be reported directly to the police immediately? That's exactly what we all know now what should have happened in the, in the case at Coffs Harbour. Immediately that that threat was made, the meeting should have been stopped, the staff should have been supported to make a full report, an investigation should have been launched immediately, and once it was ascertained that that is exactly what happened, it should have gone to the police. Mr Brown should have been stood down, and then when that matter was confirmed that that in fact had happened, he should have been dismissed and prevented from ever coming back from the project. We know that now. We need to ensure that that's what happens if this ever comes up again. So that directive has now been given to all staff? That's right, and we are working across the organisation on other processes. For example, I am now briefed weekly on any sensitive or high profile matters that may cause concern to our staff members. Right. Do you think there's been a cultural problem inside transport for New South Wales? Because the call for papers reveals uh, Nash writing of how these practices, meaning the Brown death threat, have been historically accepted and there's reference to your agency holding a threatening behaviour incident folder, a history of Ian Brown. So this wasn't new. This was part of a pattern of behaviour that had been accepted at Coffs Harbour. And are you confident, Mr Murray, it won't be accepted in any part of your organisation in future? That's one of the elements that we are absolutely reinforcing. I am also concerned that in the initial reports, and one of the reasons why it took so long for this to, but to get to the right level to be discussed, was that there was a culture of acceptance of poor language and behaviours uh, in some parts of the project. And that has come through in the call for papers. Yeah, I've just got one. Sorry. OK, uh, questions from the opposition. Yeah, thank you. Can I just follow up on one matter there, Mr Murray? You um, talked about the notification to all staff educating them, and I welcome that. That's a good step. Um, can you table that notification to all staff uh, for this committee that you referenced about educating staff on sensitive matters? Yes, I can. We're working through that at the moment. We'll have a formal report back to our executive committee in March about the measures that have been put in place. Mm -hmm. But the notification that you said has gone now to all staff and is in place, you'll um, table that? There's not a direct notification, but we have worked through the leadership team to embed this thinking and to also progress this case. Well, how does staff know what the steps you said that we've learnt from this circumstance, um, how is it clear to all staff, any staff that are in a meeting of that kind, uh, that these are the steps they are to take? Because these are the processes that we are putting in place, of which I'm personally leading through the executive team, and as I said, I'm briefed now weekly on any matters that are outside of standard <coughs> HR matters. I appreciate that you're being briefed, Mr Murray, and I welcome that also, but you just said to this committee that all staff have been told. We'd like to understand um, how they were told and have that tabled so it's very clear that what you're saying has been implemented. Yes, and those matters are being implemented at the moment. All right, so there has not been a notification to all staff. Is that how we're to understand your evidence? Uh, I would say it's more that there are multiple methods that are being employed about the training of individual staff, um, the work that has been done, for example, on the Coffs Harbour project where there has been a specific intervention uh, around the team there and then other measures that are both in place and being put in place. It's a broader range of initiatives. With, with respect, Mr Murray, that's spin. That's not implementing and making it clear to every staff member about the steps that you so clearly have outlined that need to be undertaken. Ms Ward, let me assure you and this committee that each staff member will be, if they are not already aware of our uh, commitment around this, and the executive team and I have discussed those matters, and Ms Drover has further reinforced those with the project delivery community. Certainly, but you would expect that everyone in that meeting, you indicated that um, that meeting should have been stopped immediately, your words. Um, how do you educate and make it clear in writing to all staff that they are the steps that should have been taken? Perhaps, perhaps I can invite you to brief this committee on the actions that have been taken once um, they're in place. I'd be happy to do that. I would state that it is compulsory for staff to be trained in exactly the matters that you've just raised, which is the conduct uh, should a meeting uh, ever have such uh, consequences as the one that occurred in Coffs Harbour in June. Who was the most senior person in the room in that meeting? I'm not going to go into those parts of the investigation. What steps were taken by that person? As the most senior person convening or the chair of that meeting or whoever is in charge of that meeting, um, who, 
who failed to take that step? Well, I'm not going to go into who is in the room or their actions, and I certainly wouldn't seek to blame them uh, because the people in that room had a range of reactions to the threat. Some heard it, some did not. That was part of the original uh, concern that came through the investigation. What we are doing is working with that project to ensure uh, the right culture exists and to uh, establish that everyone would be supported should they raise a matter like that, which is what should have happened. What about supporting Miss Hicks, though? I mean, are you seriously saying to this committee, if you don't hear the words said, you don't need to act on it? That's essentially the takeout, that if you're in this meeting, you, know, you don't hear the words, I'm going to kill you, um, you don't have to do anything about it. Can you see, Mr Murray, our concern that we'd like to see in place, the briefing to all staff, what steps they're required to take, and that's not an executive level I'm briefing you, it's briefing every single staff member at every meeting. What I'm informing the committee today is that our central tenant has to be that the victim is at the heart of every investigation, of every intervention on a project for a behavioural matter or whatever else emanates, and that was not the case in this matter. Uh, in the room on the day, I can't speculate as to what was heard and what wasn't. Certainly, the biggest issue we had is that it was a month until Ms Hicks found out from another staff member what she had heard, the other staff member had heard in that room. Ms Hicks wasn't there and she heard that from a third party a month down the track. And so it's her fault? That's not what I said. Well, who's being held to account, Mr Murray? Who in this room should have taken steps and who is being held to account for not taking steps? That's the what this committee would like to understand. The people on the project, the people in the room, the project leadership have been spoken to as part of these investigations that have occurred and we are working through the organisation to ensure that all areas where we fell down are being picked up. We certainly did. I'd, I'd welcome a briefing to this committee, um, Mr Murray, about the steps that are being taken. I um, accept what you're saying about dealing with it, but I, um, I think it would be helpful if this committee were able to be briefed on those steps that are being taken, um, other than just briefing the leadership team to ensure that this does not happen and there's not another Rochelle Hicks having to go through this experience in transport. Ms Ward, given the extraordinary nature of this case and what Ms Hicks has gone through since June last year, I would be happy to return a briefing to this committee so that you can see the level of change that we will implement at transport to pick up on these matters. Thank you, because but for the Standing Order 52 and the call for papers by Mr Faraway and Mr Latham and the diligent work that they've done, this may not have received the diligent attention that it now does, um, which is the right thing <coughs> uh, and sadly far too late and should not have had to have been done through this house. However, uh, I'll move I would on. also add that it has been Ms Hicks who has constantly advocated her own position, which shouldn't have had to be in the case. Mr Murray, did you advise <coughs> Minister Aitchison or her office that she should not contact Rochelle Hicks? Uh, no, I did not. Uh, we did have some discussions that was conveyed during the period of the investigations where there were some concerns or certainly some discussion about was it appropriate to contact Ms Hicks when we were already in contact with her legal team. Did the Minister or her office reach out to your office, <coughs> Mr Secretary, to offer to offer to contact Rochelle Hicks on behalf of the New South Wales Government? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Can I ask some questions? Um, how many times have you been in contact with Rochelle Hicks? I don't want to go into my discussions with Ms Hicks here. I'm not um, asking about what was said, I'm asking how many times have you been in contact with Rochelle Hicks? Uh, I have had several conversations and other written communication. Have you visited Rochelle Hicks? Yes I have. Or more than once? Once. Thank you, I might turn to some other matters um, now um, regarding the bypasses, um, whoever perhaps Ms Drover on those, if I could just come back to the Nowra um, bypass, can I just clarify, no number of questions were taken on notice by the Minister and I accept that, but um, can I just understand um, what uh, are the next steps in the planning process for um, Nowra uh, bypass? Is that the question to me? Yes, I'm sorry, Who, um, yes, Ms. Yeah. Drover, yes, um, thank you. Yes, sorry. If that's um, yours, it takes time. Um, 
We are in the planning phase for the Narrabup bypass. Yeah. I think we said before the break uh, that we have $8 million um, allocated um, for that planning phase. Um, but I can confirm we are in the early stages of the planning. Okay. Um, and when do you anticipate the planning will be complete on the Nowra bypass? I don't have an exact date for that, but I'm happy to take that on notice. All right, thank you. That would be helpful. And um, uh, is, there must be a project schedule, surely, for the for the project. I'm sure there is. Um, so, as I said, I haven't got that in front of me, but I'll take that on notice. Okay, so that would set out what the planning steps are and where it's anticipated that that planning process would be completed. Um, well, sometimes it's not a definitive date. It depends what you find in the planning Ambitious stage. Date, yeah. Um, but there will be some um, target dates. All right. <clears throat> and can we understand what the results of the most recent um, community engagement, community service engagement was on this project? Um, look, I don't have that in front of me. It, there may be some information on the website. Um, often when we've done engagement, we do um, um, give back to the community what we found during engagement processes. Um, but I'm happy to take that on notice again. Mr Hayes, can you assist? Uh, I can add a little bit to that, if I may. Um, so during 2023, um, we did consult with a range of stakeholders from freight operators, the broader community. Um, feedback has been compiled um, and the consultation summary report will be released publicly um, probably within the next three months. Okay, and that process is complete? Well, it's an ongoing, I, I guess the part, part of the, you know, the, the initial consultation, but then we will obviously absorb that and then go back out to the community to discuss what their feedback. All right, so within three months we'll have that compiled and then you'll anticipate going back to the community when? Uh, I don't have a firm date. Um, but that would be the next logical step in the process once we've once we've reviewed the feedback um, to make sure that we are fully engaged with the community to make sure that we're delivering uh, a, a product that they that they want. All right. So, um, uh, 29 February now, three months. The report. Do you anticipate going back out? I, I don't want to guess. Of this I don't want to guess on a date, but that would be the process. Is that the, within sorry. the next few months? The consultation summary report will be released publicly uh, and then there would obviously be more discussion with with the community yes but understandably the community would like to have input and understand when they can be engaged um, again yes. so um, can you anticipate that that might be this year yes all right thank you um, can I move on to the um, back to the Milton Ulladulla bypass um, uh, Mr Overall Mr Hayes um, so can we have an understanding, um, again understanding that some of these questions have been taken on notice, but um, about the projected commencement for this bypass project? I haven't got that information with me, other than we have got $10 million allocated for this year's um, budget to, to progress the planning for the project. For plan that's also allocated for planning? That's planning is my understanding, yes. Okay, and um, can we understand what the, what stage of the planning has that commenced? Um, well, you'll be aware that the work was done previously. The project has had quite a long um, history, um, but much no, I take that on notice to give you um, much more yes, detail. Yes, so perhaps what stage it's up yep. to and what, yep. and what the next steps are, um, and when we can anticipate that, and um, in terms of the project schedule, what the anticipated delivery date is for that one as well. Thank take you. take that on notice. Uh, thank you. The um, East Nowra sub arterial. Um, so, um, what's the planning money that's been allocated to that one? I need to refer that to my colleagues because that's not one of the projects in my portfolio. Anyone responsible? That would, yep, that, I'm that trying was. to engage everybody here, but <laughs> no one's putting their hand up. Mr. Hayes, looks like it's you. Um, yes, so I, I'm happy to lead off with that one. The um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to refer to refer to my notes if that's sure. okay. Some thank of these you. questions are quite specific. The um, the, the New South Wales government allocated $12 million in the in um, in recent budgets. To, can I just dollars. clarify to planning? Um, yes, correct. Thank you. Uh, well, to Shoal, Shoalhaven City Council. Yes, it's yes, their yes. Project. Yeah. So it's a million dollars, 23-24, 7 million, 24-25, and 4 million for 25-26. Initial funding provided to Shoalhaven City Council for, their, for them to undertake the planning and early works. Um, I think it's, it's an important part of a broader conversation because that's obviously um, uh, an important growth region 
um, and very. requires a very coordinated approach between council and state. So um, while this specifically refers to a, a council-led mm. project, um, we're very much engaged in, in, those, in those discussions to make sure that it's, it's built into a bigger picture. That's pleasing to hear, thank you, um, and a much anticipated project. So what further community consultation um, uh, is anticipated? What has happened to date and what further community consultation do you anticipate being involved in? I can't provide a lot of information because it is a council council led project um, um, but you know the, their goals are obviously are very focused on reducing congestion at the Princess Highway and the Calendar Street intersection um, and the flow of traffic through through the CBD area yeah so but my question is have you been involved sorry I should have been more specific have you yeah. all the department been involved in that community consultation or has that been council led uh, been council led only yes okay and as far as as far as I'm aware getting nods from the, the crew there great thank you um, and so in terms of that consultation there will be more there's some allocated funding and um, it would appear that however that that won't really start construction in the next in this term no my understanding is there's no there's no funding for delivery at this stage yep. but that would be um, the planning needs to be refined first yeah and so when will you anticipate that will come back for that delivery budget bid I don't have a date here. Um, our funding deed was sent to council in December. Yep. Um, so it's a it's a relatively new project. Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you. Can I get going? Yeah. Or you want to go? Um, I've just got. Okay. okay. Uh, yep. Um, the DAPTO on off ran. Um, I'm getting lots of enthusiastic response here. Um, when, uh, when will the work commence on the promised access ramps for the M1 at DAPDO? Oh, thank you. See, there we go. I, I kept trying. <laughs> I tried to get Mr Hayes to answer them, but... Uh, <laughs> thank you, Ms Hayden. Um, sorry, let me just refer to um, my time. notes, but we're currently in planning. We did undertake community consultation uh, last year, which was actually a, a, a very good community consultation. We've got really great feedback. Thank you. Can I interrupt you there? Because yep. you've anticipated my next question, oh, helpfully. Sorry. Thank you. No, no, not at all. When you say that, so when, when you say last year, when did that occur last year? Uh, let me just get it from my sure. notes. I can also contribute something. Thank you. Um, there was a community drop-in session um, for the, the project more broadly, uh, which was on the uh, 8th of February. And that was for the um, Mount Oosley Yalla Integrated Transport Plan. Okay. Since um, the election, um, what com community consultation has taken place? Let me just pull up the notes. So I haven't got information on what occurred last year, but I, recently there was that drop-in session, um, and there is ongoing work uh, that will occur this year. Um, I can take you through what that is. Sure, that'd be helpful. Thank you. So in 2024, um, there'll be traffic surveys undertaken, um, traffic modelling, uh, environmental and heritage studies, and we're also doing a movement and place study which supports uh, the integrated transport plan. And part of that will be community engagement, of course. Okay. When is that likely in 2024? Uh, well, all that work will continue this year. Okay. Um, are you... Ready to go, Ms. Hayden? I can keep going if you're still looking. Keep going, I'll, keep I'll get going. the details for you as well. Good, okay. Uh, and so the planning, what's the funding that's been allocated for planning for the project over the next four years? Um, so I can answer we've got one million in the current financial year um, for, 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 for planning. As part of a $10 million um, commitment in relation to the, the planning for. Uh, the ramps. Um, we are leveraging off the early community consultation that we have done and I believe we're expecting to go back out to community consultation um, following what we learnt from the last consultation this year. Okay, so one million is allocated. This financial is, year, yes. Okay, there's the ten million allocated in the four years. If I can just take that on notice and we'll get back to you this afternoon just to confirm okay. the cash flows. All right, that would be helpful. Um, so given that, um, that's in the four years and the need for community consultation to go back again, do you anticipate that this project would commence in this term? 
Um, I, I wouldn't put a date on that yet until I've um, seen the details, but essentially the next part of the community consultation is going back with what we're seeing as uh, essentially recommended options to get feedback directly on those, mm. um, and that will then inform the next steps. Uh, so that will also be part of a investment uh, request through to government. So that doesn't have an investment decision yet either? Not for de not for construction. Delivery. No, that is that will be part of okay. the outcomes of the ten million. So planning money's in place, but we don't have delivery money on that one either. No, we will go back to government based on recommendations um, and a proposal for investment. All right. Good luck with that one. Um, Princess Highway. Um, just in relation to the funding of that, is that still anticipated? Um, to be an 80-20 split with the federal government, or is that now a 50-50 proposition? Mr. Uh, the Jarvis Bay Intersection Project, which is in delivery, it was awarded uh, recently, that is 80-20? Yeah. Oh, actually, no. That was saved. Uh, I do, actually, we just need to clarify whether it is 80-20. I'll just check that. Okay. Um, I can confirm though, uh, Ms Ward, that generally speaking on the Princess Highway, the previous commitments have been retained uh, and as Ms Drover said, the Jervis Bay Road intersection has been recently yeah. uh, awarded and as has the Mount Oosley interchange. Sorry, what was awarded? The Jervis Bay Road intersection yes, and yep, the Mount Oosley interchange. Yep. So. yep, that was taken off the kill list as well, pleasingly, which is great. Um, all right, so then um, when do you anticipate that the Princess Highway will be duplicated to Bega and hopefully beyond? Uh, I think at the moment the uh, the focus is on the individual projects. So we've got <coughs> some obviously priority works as we've just outlined at Jervis Bay Road in the section, Mount Oosley Interchange. Uh, you've um, mentioned a couple of the other projects including Milton Dulla Dulla. So those projects uh, start that progression but we don't have an end date for a final duplication through to bigger. And are there any steps in place in terms of allocation, planning, anything in terms of the duplication? The steps or? that are in place are the identified projects that have been in place now for some time. But that does include a number of really important safety upgrades um, south of Jarvis Bay. Of Burra Lake to the, to the border, yes. Okay, I might come back to what those are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to turn to the issue of the um, councils requesting speed limit reviews again. Um, so what is the current number of, of councils who have requested speed limit reviews that have? I think it's you, Mr Carlon, is it? Uh, look, the, the actual number currently um, don't have to hand, but I do have the numbers for the last four years, and we've had um, a total of 1,053 speed zone reviews completed, um, uh, 586 on local roads, so that would involve local councils. Um, just to the matter of the advising of timeframes as well, so the new standard, as a result of the Stay Safe Committee recommendations last year on uh, regional speed uh, mm -hmm. and regional road safety. Uh, the standard now has a specific measure for the preliminary review. Um, so up until step three, shall be complete within four months. Um, so that's, you get a request and there's a preliminary review of that request for a speed upgrade, um, a speed review, sorry. Uh, and that needs to be completed within four months from the date of the request um, when it was received or where a need was identified for a speed zone review. Uh, and this includes in the standard notifying local government of the outcome uh, and outlining the next steps in the review as to whether it will progress. Um, and if it will progress, the timeframes for the completion of the comprehensive reviews um, and that's all identified as part of that next step in the new standards. So councils should be expecting that once they've lodged a um, request that within four months they're getting feedback about the progress of that speed zone review request under the new standard. Have you got, thank you, have you got data there, statistics there in terms of uh, those requests that were made, 500 and something were regional did you say? Uh, so what we've, um, so the data is what's happened over the last four financial years um, and we do see a fairly significant increase in the last two financial years following COVID um, but yeah a total of 586 um, speed zone reviews that were completed during that period. 580 um, and that's that, sorry for the whole New roads, South Wales. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, yes. So uh, we could take on notice. Uh, there was a backlog associated with um, that period of time, um, and you know, that's why there were significantly more reviews done in the last two years. Um, do you have an idea, or do you have um, the information there in terms of how, how many of those reviews are proceeded with? So I think you, you just spoke about a stage process. Uh, That's so that, correct, five, isn't it? that 586 are completed um, speed zone reviews. Yeah, okay. So they, that's where speed zone has actually been adjusted. Uh, perhaps uh, you know, I can oh. add some. That's the, that, so they've actually been adjusted, I assume. Most times, well, I can't assume that. I was about to say most times reduced, but that's. Uh, depending on whether an upgrade has been yes. conducted, and so on those, in those circumstances, you know, it may be an increase of the speed. It, um, um, if I may add, add to that, Thank um, you. Um, Mr. Garland's exactly right. COVID was a challenge and then the floods were a challenge. There was a significant backlog um, of doing the speed zone reviews. Um, we have added additional resources to try and help us to clear that backlog, um, but it's not a, it's not a, quick, quick, um, a quick process. Um, for North Region, for example, in the last 12 months, we've completed 481. Well, can I just reviews. check with the COVID, like uh, with, with COVID as a delay, hmm. is that because people couldn't travel there to assess the... Yeah. The, right. Okay. Yeah, it's as, sim as simple as that, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and new proposals kept coming in during that time. Um, you, you asked a question earlier, earlier today. The, um, as an example of our, our West region, in, in recent months, 44 completed, 25 currently being assessed, 72 were triaged um, and were not completed because they'd either been um, assessed previously or they were deemed to be not appropriate for a formal review. So we go through a triage process to try and make sure that the team are, uh, are using the best, you know, the, be the best amount of time to focus on the important the reviews. Okay, thank you. So uh, I suppose I'm just wanting to uh, get a sense of, uh, with all of this, we've got councils that are uh, applying to the department to get uh, their speed limits reviewed. We've had the audit office and their report uh, at the end of last year, which has found that obviously significantly, uh, proportionally more uh, uh, deaths as a result of speeding in, in regional New South Wales than in Greater Sydney and that there is no, um, uh, the Transport for New South Wales has not articulated or evaluated a strategy for implementing road safety policy in New South Wales to assist in guiding targeted activities to address regional road trauma. And then the, the uh, key factor is speed. Um, I was wondering if the department had an update on what it is doing in this space beyond uh, the requests from councils to alter speed on local roads. Yeah, so I would um, point to the response in the Auditor General's um, uh, review that was conducted from Transport for New South Wales. Um, so um, we have actually in the um, road, sa road safety action plan do have a strategy for um, advancing more high pedestrian activity area. Um, 40 kilometre zones across the state, um, in particular in regional areas as well. Um, and you know, we've done an evaluation of the impact of those, um, which clearly shows the trauma reduction that's achieved where you um, do implement a 40 kilometre an hour um, high pedestrian activity areas. And those evaluations show you know, um, pedestrian casualty rates reducing by 49%, serious injury casualty rates by 33%. 40% um, for all crashes. So, um, although the um, report may have said we we haven't evaluated, we actually have done evaluations of those specific measures and in, in regional areas, um, and also the reducing risk on regional roads. And that program is a combination of um, treatments for you know, um, barrier systems, uh, audio tactile. Um, widening shoulders, but also speed zone reductions um, in those areas where we have high levels of trauma. Um, and out of, and we've evaluated um, a preliminary evaluation of 256 of, um, of those projects, which were all regional, 
um, and there was a 44% reduction in the overall number of people killed and injured, um, a 33% reduction in fatalities. And that program continues to be funded, um, around $211 million this year in the regions been allocated, of which around $44 million is allocated to local roads in that Safer Roads program this year. So um, you know, there is a, a program in <coughs> place. Um, certainly in the forum that was held last week, um, there were um, lots of considerations that came forward from experts who, who gathered at that forum around how can we accelerate those programs, get more of the, the activity that we know works to reduce and tackle the problem of the increased trauma that we experienced over the last 12 months. And Thanks. Chair, the, yeah. um, in the forum that Mr Callan's referring to last week, there was a really great example where the team worked very closely with Orange City Council. So the entire <laughs> CBD of Orange now, whether they be state roads or the locally gazetted roads within Council, are all a 40 kilometre speed zone. And they've done that on the basis of not just safety outcomes, but uh, place making, encouraging people back into the CBD, vibrancy and also uh, yeah. obviously economic uplift. So there's been some really great examples where uh, the teams have worked together um, and, and that was also to support with funding as well as the work for the reviews. What's the percentage of um, the deaths that are occurring on regional roads, Mr Carlin? What's the, the percentage of, of deaths that are occurring in these city centres, for example, that are, that are, that are part of uh, these 40 kilometre uh, per hour zones and what are the deaths on uh, the roads when you leave the towns and people are um, driving 90, 100, 110, 120, 130, 140 kilometres per hour. I would think that that's the majority of the deaths, isn't it? Um, so what we did see last year, and certainly that has been the case historically, 70% of our fatal crashes have happened in um, regional areas. Um, what we did see last year was a really significant increase in the um, rural uh, and regional urban locations. So um, a significant increase from um, 71 fatalities up to 120 fatalities in those regional urban areas. Do you have the stats? That's in, that is very interesting in the last 20 seconds. So the, the, the breakdown between the, well, so you're talking urban, regional, I don't know what the, 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 the language is, yeah, but when so you get out of the 40, yeah, 50, so 60 country, kilometre zone, Country non-urban last year, 124 fatalities, country urban, 120, and metropolitan, 107. Um, and there was, a, as I said, a significant increase in that um, country urban fatality number last year and that is part of the um, review that's taking place as a result of the forum to see how we can work with local government to tackle that issue. Mm, okay, thank you. Mr Latham. Uh, thank you Chair. To the Secretary, um, Bree Gallagher, the Senior Manager of Professional Standards and Conduct, signed off on her assessment of um, Rochelle Hicks acting on the McNally Nash complaints on the 7th of August. Is there a document thereafter where Martin Donaldson is the decision maker sets out clearly that he's rejecting these recommendations and findings against her and uh, not acting on them? Uh, I couldn't point to the document, but I know that Mr Donaldson dealt with that matter at the time. He dealt with it at the time. Can you take on notice and, and, and provide the document? Because I'm worried maybe it's the case that because Rochelle Hicks has not returned to the workplace, he didn't have to act on them because she, she hasn't come back. No, uh, that was that was <coughs> declined by Mr. Donaldson. It was it was the instruction was given to the team, uh, and he formally took that decision. And I've discussed that matter with him right. in the course well, of. Why is there no documentation details. in the call to papers? Well, I can't speak to that. Answer. Okay, you can take on notice to try and yes. find out what what happened there and the documentation that's relevant. How many threatening behaviour incident folders or similar documents uh, and folders does Transport for New South Wales hold? I couldn't answer that question. I would say that regrettably our staff, because they are on the front line, do come into contact with threats that are made against staff uh, on a, uh, I won't say a regular basis, but this does happen in dealing with some of the high profile frontline issues that our staff deal with. Obviously the Coffs Harbour matter is different to that, but we do have files on threats made against our staff, yes. Right. and. Is there a culture and history outside of Coffs Harbour of sweeping it under the carpet if the threat comes from an Indigenous person? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So you think it's 
this is a Coffs Harbour only problem that's been identified. No, I would re return to what I said earlier about failings made up and down the chain in managing this efficiently and with the victim prioritised and communicated with at every step of the way. Um, the right escalation, these are the matters that were missing in this case. In regards to other threats made against frontline staff, which regrettably is increasing, particularly when we look at our, uh, for example, uh, staff on the regional train network uh, conducting their activities late at night or the Sydney trains network, um, we have got clear uh, protocols in place and we spend a lot of time managing those elements through to protect those staff. So it is something that the organisation prioritises, as I say, that does not help Ms Hicks in her experience of the last year. Right. In the call to papers, uh, there's a document where Mr McNally is saying there have been some matters over time in which hindsight could have been seen as antecedents to the threats made by Ian Brown. For example, the design a change related to Grandma's Scrub project. Grandma's Scrub. Grandpa Scrub project, okay, not the grandma, the Grandpa Scrub project. Has that matter been investigated, the threats that were made there? Uh, I can't talk to that matter. What I can say is that the evidence in the reports and the call for papers shows that there were a number of tensions that had existed on the project over a long period of time. Right. And, will that, and that exacerbated will the Will Grandpa scenario. Scrub threats be investigated? I'm not aware of any specific threats. What I am aware of from that paperwork is a culture of needing to get on with things rather than the correct behaviours that we would expect in meetings, in particular when it comes to raised voices, poor language, aggressive behaviour, etc. Okay. And in terms of reporting uh, threats of violence to the police, is there a new protocol where these are going to be direct serious reports where there's an, ex an expectation within Transport for New South Wales that the police take action because it's very alarming in these documents that Jamie Tuff, the safety manager on the uh, Coffs Harbour bypass, emailed Greg Nash and Peter McNally on the 16th of August saying, we've reported the threats made by Ian Brown to Rochelle Hicks to the Coffs Harbour Police Department. We have asked the Coffs Harbour Police Department to leave this as a report only and as such we do not anticipate that they will contact Ian Brown. Uh, Transport for New South Wales, we're constantly telling the media we've reported this to police. It turns out it was a, a report on the basis of just take this as a note to file and don't go talking to William Brown about it. There's no expectation here that the police would take it seriously. Thank you for the question. It's an important follow-up and I appreciate that you tabled this uh, in the Upper House previously. The staff member involved has been spoken to and has been clear to us that that was not uh, that was a poorly worded email and the context of reporting that to police was in fact very factual and no such instructions or the like would ever be given by transport to the police. Right, there'll be no soft peddling in future about these reports? I'm assured there was no soft peddling in that instance and well, there why, certainly why did he, will not why, be why did he write this? Why did he report it's a, it's a report only? and we're not anticipating that they'll even contact Ian Brown about the death threat. As I said, I think it was right to raise the wording and we've followed up on that and have been assured that that wasn't the, what occurred inside the police station. Right. Uh, when was Matthew Kelleher, the um, heritage or archaeological um, uh, advisor, informed of Ian Brown's threats against him? Uh, I understand that Mr Kelleher found out about the incident through the media. Well, what, what, what's being done about that? That sounds appalling. Uh, Mr Kelleher has been followed up with and on several occasions has, has indicated he did not have any concerns and does not wish to be part of the process. Right. He, he's not active or living in Coffs Harbour. He's I can't speak to his, I can't speak to his detail. Okay. But has, has that been investigated as to how a threat was made against him and he only found out about it in the media and the, the, the people uh, negligent of um, being cancelled or disciplined uh, about their failings? As I say, he has been followed up and he does not believe that there is an issue to follow up on. Okay. Uh, Stephen Rice in the Australian newspaper has uh, reported that Tammy Hosking, who belatedly blew the whistle, um, feels that she's been punished for reporting Ian Brown's threat to kill Rochelle Hicks and she had a fear 
at the time of the Brown walkover of the site. Is it true that she's been punished? And if so, has that punishment been reversed? And while she did it belatedly, there's a recognition she's the only one who stood up? Uh, absolutely. As the Minister highlighted earlier, across transport we have discussed uh, our admiration for the fact that people came forward and continued to press this issue um, through some difficult times and not being treated in the manner that they would have expected. So no, I would not accept that that has happened. I'd be concerned that Ms Hoskins feels that way and we will take steps to ensure that that's not the case. I might ask Ms Drover in this case to discuss some of the elements dealt with on the project to ensure that those matters are protected. Thank you, Secretary. Just before I do, I would like to just um, record um, uh, one of the facts. Um, and I appreciate this doesn't provide any comfort to Ms Hicks nor help her, um, but someone did stop the meeting. Uh, there is evidence of this um, and did reprimand uh, Mr Brown during the meeting. Um, and that the meeting did not continue until that was done. And uh, obviously that was appropriate. Unfortunately, it doesn't help Ms Hicks. And unfortunately, it did not leave lead to a reporting of the incident in our system. Um, it was a local Aboriginal Land Council meeting, wasn't it? Wasn't it? The, the there, there were for New um, South Wales meeting. There were so, yeah, I saw that in the document. Yes. Someone did tell him to Yes, so I think that, that out, out of respect for the person that did yeah, stop but, the meeting, uh, that needs to go on the public record. Sure, but it, di it didn't sort of it didn't mitigate in his complaints. He subsequently said, yeah, I meant it 100%. I agree. And yeah. that's why I said it doesn't help Ms Hicks or the situation, uh -huh. but someone did stop the meeting um, yep. and, and okay. uh, yeah, raised the issue. Uh -huh. um, so I think you are asking me Ms. to to go Ms. through. Ms. Hosking, yeah. Uh, yes. Look, has she been punished for coming forward? Absolutely not. not absolutely not. not. Okay. And uh, I, I myself have reached out to Ms. Hoskins to give her that assurance. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And um, can I just come to a question on, on notice uh, that I asked that 1719 answered on the 21st of February? It was a strange answer regarding how many projects. Mm -hmm have Indigenous advisors engaged and at what cost? They sort of gave a long answer and said there'll be further advice. Surely Transport for New South Wales knows how many infrastructure projects have Indigenous advisors engaged and what's the cost of the organisation. So can I get that information please? Yes, we can table that information. You can table that information. And can I come to uh, Mr Carl on, on a separate matter? You'll be relieved to hear on, on to a, a different matter. And that is the... Um, what I thought was uh, unusual an announcement by John Graham, the, the minister, that um, he's asking Transport for New South Wales, I assume the Centre for Road Safety, to investigate cooker culture. Is there any evidence that uh, sort of political belief, you believe in chemtrails, that you're a worse driver than anyone else? Uh, I had to check the... Um Thank you for the question. I did have to check the terminology that it was the same as what I believed it was, which is the sovereign citizen uh, elements. And while I can't speak to the minister's comments, I can certainly report that in my time as secretary, I have been approached by a number of people who have sought to do things like return their driver's licenses, return their license plates, uh, and state that they are no longer uh, being uh, operating under New South Wales laws on the roads. Yeah, well, that's crazy. But does that explain the rise in the road toll compared to, say, the drug testing that shows that one in seven drivers uh, in New, S New South Wales are driving under the influence of drugs? No, I think the aims of the road safety forum last week were to table all of the high-risk elements that we're seeing drive up the road toll. Um, one of the elements explored on the day was um, cultural elements that may be present in the community and how do we get the right message across about everyone's responsibility for road safety. Thank you. Uh, Mr Farrow? Uh, thank you, Chair. Just back to Ms Drover, <coughs> with regard to the EIS for the proposed tunnel, can you advise if the interim or the draft report, um, the results of the submissions report was ever shared with the Commonwealth Government? I don't believe it was, but I'm happy to confirm that on notice. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Now, this one, I don't know who to ask, maybe Mr Hayes. It's regarding the upgraded Great Western Highway entry into Bathurst that has now been completed. 
uh, that, that, that piece of infrastructure, or maybe Mr Fuller can do this. It's who looks after the maintenance of the lighting on that state road uh, on the entry to Bathurst. I've had people come into my office in Bathurst and ask me that they use the pathway, the walkways, um, but some of the lighting is out. And it's a simple question if you can take on notice, who looks after that and, and can, can the, the processes within transport review um, obviously that for, for that street lighting for safety uh, with the new pathway that's been installed. Happy to look at that. I believe you're referring to the Kelsoda Raglan project. Correct. It's yeah. been let out of our maintenance and delivery area under Mr Groskopf. Um, and we will certainly go back and uh, look at what lighting needs uh, some maintenance. No problem. So I think I've only got two minutes left. So um, Ms Hayden, fixing country rail, before we go to the break. Um, the question is the Ms Hong and the Minister confirmed that no new projects have been announced since the election and there's $249 million still left in that fund. My question is how many projects does your department have ready to go with a business case of one, business case ratio of one, ready to go that you can invest in? Um, I'll, I'll just, uh, just put some clarification uh, in relation to the funds uh, for fixing country rail. Uh, Transport's been allocated $249 million um, from MINSW through that program. That is fully committed. So that's the funding that we actually have. We have 53 projects um, that have been funded under that, with 31 actually complete. We do have, as part of what was funded, um, a series of business cases that will be looked at as part of a future investment um, opportunities. How, how, how many do you have? I, if you, we can just take that on notice, yep, I fine. can do the count for you and come back this afternoon. Yep, that's what, how many have you got in train, projects in train being delivered now? Obviously you said you've had 53 funded, 31 are complete, do I assume that the balance is in train being built? Uh, there are a mix of some that are in development, so some yep. which are actually funded for business case, and there is a mix of projects that are actually in development. Are delivery. you able to take that on notice as yeah, well? Yeah, we can. Be able to I, I can assist Mr Farrow and say that uh, our understanding, according to our notes, is that 14 are construction projects. Okay, yeah. Okay, who looks after the Manila like viaduct? Is that Mr Groskoff on the CRN? Bridges and cross the it, viaducts. It's part of the country rail network, yep. non operational asset. Yes, yep. correct. Okay. So um, before I might come back to this, come, come Mr. Groskopf, but I'll ask another question related to you because I only have 20 seconds left. It is in relation to the, the CRN and it's in relation to vegetation management. Um, I have received correspondence and I'm happy to say from the Canoundra Historical Society. I've visited the society, um, great people, great facility. They have had some long running issues with vegetation management behind their museum um, that does cause flood issues uh, in the event of significant weather events. Um, uh, so, and I'll quickly read this out with my question. As you can see, uh, there's some photos that I'm happy to share with you a bit later, Mr. Groskoff, but um, completely failing to control weeds in the railway precinct immediately behind our museum and the adjacent H of Fisher's buildings. Can you take on notice um, to review the vegetation management um, and the, the control of weeds in that railway precinct and corridor? Yes. That's my time. Great. Thank you for that very short answer. That's wonderful. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, Mr. The, uh, Mr. Carlin, let's go back to road safety. The audit office report also um, found that the main source of funding for road safety, the community road safety fund, was underspent. Has been underspent since 2019. Um, the the COVID, uh, I think, has been uh, used to to justify that. Uh, my question is, with that underspend, has that underspend kind of accumulated, if you like, within that uh, funding envelope that means there's more now to spend on road safety? Uh, or, or, or did that has that underspend just gone back into uh, general? Uh, the revenue? community road safety funds are a protective fund within government, mm -hmm. and certainly wherever there are um, allocations to projects, most of these were infrastructure projects. Um, they've actually just been shifted into the years of funding, and so um, all the funding is secured and allocated to the um, road safety outcomes. Okay, so the community road safety fund then for this financial year was how much? Uh, if I can perhaps just grab that on the way. Yes, and, and, and so that, whatever that is, you're saying potentially are cumulative, cumulative and has um, built up over the years without being spent. 
as much of being spent, much of it being spent, um, has all of whatever you're about to tell me in terms of that amount, is that uh, allocated in terms of programs now? Uh, uh, yes, so that has been allocated and um, the um, financial year 2024, um, the including the federal funding that's been allocated is $669.2 million. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Latham, we've got a minute yes. and a half. Um, uh, to the Secretary or Mr <coughs> Carlin, uh, are you acting on the um, Minister Graham's uh, concern about cooker culture on the roads and, and, and how do you actually research uh, the impact? Do you find a um, sample group, a study group of uh, cookers who believe in chemtrails and post a lot of photos of Fauci and uh, other matters on the internet and then do you what monitor their road behaviour? Uh, How do you research this? So um, we have ongoing research um, around community attitudes and response to road safety issues and monitoring of our road safety campaigns in particular. So social research around um, the demographics of the community and where they are in terms of their attitudes toward road safety. Um, and so that's the work that's um, being done to see. And there has been other research published in other jurisdictions, Victoria, for example, um, where there is some examples of um, this sort of resistance to um, being law-abiding um, having increased in some parts of the community. Um, and so, you know, addressing that issue is obviously critical and the police have also identified in the forum last week that um, they've noticed um, as well some stronger sort of more aberrant behaviour on the road as well. Um, yeah, I, I, in, I was at the police estimates on Friday. The police seem to have a much bigger concern about the uh, need for the drug testing that they seem to link the alarming one in seven uh, drug drivers uh, to the increase in road toll rather than people who believe in chemtrails. Yeah, certainly like the behavioural issues around road safety are always um, the most dominant in terms of the risk associated with road uh, trauma, um, you know, speeding, um, impairment, fatigue, those, those issues, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now break for afternoon tea. We will be back at 3.45.
Thank you. Great. All right. Welcome back uh, for the final afternoon session. We'll go straight to questions from the opposition. Mr. Sam Barraway. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I just want to go back to Mr. Groskopf. Um, thank you for taking on notice the concerns of the Canoundra Historical Society and Museum for me. But I want to go more into obviously vegetation management. Uh, and we've had a pretty good season. It's been pretty, pretty wet. At some stage, things will dry off and vegetation management specifically i suppose with the with the rail corridors and precincts is there a plan to manage that more broadly so under our country regional network contract with uh, ugl regional links we engage them as an asset manager they have a three-year maintenance works program in which they have prioritized a variety of maintenance actions within there is routine vegetation management they will prioritise those actions based on need and they will uh, respond to that, uh, to those vegetation um, regrowth and, and fuel load levels across the network. That's what we engage them to do and that's, and that's the program that they have in place. We have had discussions with um, regional links about uh, that program of works and some of the directions they've received from the Rural Fire Service around that and have offered support, further support to undertake vegetation control across the network. Thank you, um, thank you, Mr. Groskopf. Um, and obviously, we'll leave the Canoundra stuff on notice, and I'll, yes. I'll let, let you. But want to move on to the the Manila viaduct. Uh, what is the status of the Heritage Asset Action Plan for that viaduct? So, we currently uh, that the Heritage Asset Action Plan is currently uh, uh, paused as we complete the Regional Rail Heritage Strategy. We need the strategy in place to then work out our prioritisation. So what was it? Regional Rail, rail Heritage Strategy. Yeah. So that is uh, in its final stages of development. That is a strategy that looks right across the whole of the rail network, looking at our heritage assets and prioritising them. When do you expect that strategy to be finalised? I expect that strategy to be finalised in the third quarter of this year. So essentially, at the moment, ongoing maintenance and repair of such structures are having to be essentially put on hold until that strategy is done? No, we, may, we continue to maintain those structures whilst, though, whilst that work is being done. We have an obligation to maintain <coughs> our heritage structures uh, right across the network and that work continues. It's really around the prioritisation of deeper rehabilitation, restoration works that would be be guided by the heritage strategy and what is the long-term future of the different heritage assets across the network. So will the uh, Manila Viaduct and Rail Bridge, they'll be included in that rail heritage strategy? Correct. Okay, yep. Um, uh, has Transport for New South Wales been in contact with anyone <coughs> from Heritage New South Wales in relation to that particular viaduct? Uh, we have had discussions with um, Heritage New South Wales uh, around that and uh, around that viaduct, yes. Uh, we have also had discussions with them uh, in relation to that viaduct and the re regional rail heritage. Has the heritage listing been put on that viaduct? Yes, it has. Right, okay. Um, so that is true. There is now a heritage listing on that viaduct. It is a state heritage asset, yes. Okay. Um, now that viaduct, I'm sure you've heard, is, a vi is vital vehicle access underneath that viaduct. Now that was closed two weeks out from the Manila show, which threw obviously that organisation's plans out the window with little or very little time to adapt. Um, is there a way where you have infrastructure like that that is critical to large community events? Is there a better way to try and manage that moving forward, whether it's that viaduct or another? Uh, we have a range of strategies available to us to maintain uh, critical access, but we always maintain that access only if it is safe to do so. Now, was there some issue with a lawnmower at the with the Manila viaduct or a lawnmower? I'm got, un I'm unaware of an issue. I'll we'll probably go look uh, look that up. Um, so, in terms of that particular viaduct and it degrading, um, is that is is there something in place? Obviously, once that strategy is completed that can be deployed where that, that, that particular viaduct is at the top of the list in terms of, of, of repair um, and in terms of managing it under those heritage um, guidelines? So what our regional rail heritage strategy will do is 
it will prioritise the assets across the state, mm. identifying the different um, maintenance strategies that we would have for some of these assets. I should point out that in some cases, and, it, and this wouldn't be the case for, um, for the Manila Viaduct, but those heritage strategies range from you know, significant restoration works through to manage as a ruin. Uh, so they, they, you know, depending on their context, their importance in the community, uh, we would, can use a wide range of so strategies. So once the strategy is done and you've prioritised the infrastructure, um, do you have funding in place to then implement the strategy? We have some funding in place, but a strategy of this scale would require further investment. How much? Until the strategy is complete, I can't give you a number. How much funding do you have now put aside? Um, I'd have to take that number. I'd have to take that on notice. Right. Okay. Do you have a current priorities list in this space, even though the strategy is not finished? But is there any priorities list that you have now of that infrastructure that uh, needs to be managed? No, I, I don't have a statewide um, priorities list. Uh, the way that we manage at the moment is to look at the heritage managed by heritage significance, and clearly those things that are on the state heritage register are a high priority. So that leads me to my next question about heritage management plans. Now, is the strategy the same as the plan? It's No. No, okay. So if we move to how can any contractor manage, and I've only learnt this recently in talking to community members and in different, uh, different situations, how can how can any contractor or government manage any of that infrastructure if there is no heritage management plan in place? Um, I'm not sure I follow your line of questioning. So, okay, so the first question is, is that a heritage management plan is completely different to uh, your regional rail heritage strategy, correct? So. I'm not quite sure what you're referring to in relation to a heritage management plan. I'm assuming that is for individual assets. Well, well, if yeah, yeah, it would be. You, you do, do viaducts like this and bridges, for instance, do they require a heritage management plan? Is that correct? Not, nec not necessarily, no. So we, there are some that have the um, heritage asset plans in place. There are those, and, and then we are building a regional rail heritage strategy. The plans for a specific asset will identify for that asset the key, the key actions, management actions that we would undertake. Um, we would, and, but we can also manage an asset simply by responding to its maintenance needs through our routine inspection programs. Right, okay, so in the event, do, with regard to this infrastructure and the regional rail heritage strategy, is there a concern that infrastructure across the state doesn't have a heritage management plan which will make it hard to respond or manage or invest or maintain some of this infrastructure? We, we clearly feel that there is more required in terms of having a clear strategy for the management of these assets. That's why we are developing the regional rail heritage strategy. That's probably the best answer I can give you in terms of what we believe is required in order to get more effective management of these assets. Okay, so, but do you, what happens, let's, let's say that the Manila Viaduct needs a heritage management plan. Okay, so you've got your strategy which you're working on, I get that. Okay, so you're working on that and you'll need more cash down the track, that's the Minister's job. But it's all well and good to have a strategy, but if you don't have the heritage management plan, that is associated with, let's say, the Manila Viaduct, the strategy is pointless. Correct, so what we would, from... So what's your involvement with heritage management plans? So we have a, we'll have our strategy in place. At the moment, our approach to the management of all of these assets is to continue to make them safe, to keep them safe and to avoid their deterioration. And to, which is, that is effectively our management plan around these assets in general. When it comes to a, a specific heritage management plan for a particular asset, I'll have to take that on notice. Okay. Um, so, will, with regard to your um, the, the regional rail heritage strategy, will it lead? If you identify in your strategy, and I use Manila as an example, that it requires a heritage management plan, what will you do then? 
develop a heritage management plan and implement it. Okay, that's fine. But so are you saying that that will need to be done on an individual basis with every piece of infrastructure across the rail network? Uh, no, some some we can do by asset class. Yep. Some will be some you know particularly high value ones. We would do specific so, plans. So right for. now, if you've got UGL regional links out there maintaining and running your network, the CRN, they don't have any of this in place right now. They don't have a strategy, and they don't have uh, uh, heritage management plans to refer to on how to manage those pieces of infrastructure on the rail network. They have some. Um, they have some plans and directions around what we want them to do. They build an asset management or maintenance works program around that, which is built to, to keep those assets in the condition that they, that they find them and to keep them safe. Okay. Um, moving on, because I've got heaps of questions. Another one for you while I have you, Mr. Groskoff, is Janolan Caves Road. So two mile, five mile. But so where are we up to with all that in Hampton Road? Okay, um, so work started on Hampton Road on the 15th of January. Um, two Mile has just closed tender and it's under tender assessment at the moment. And um, Five Mile is at a point where we are, just looking at my colleague, Mr. Hayes, I think we're about to let, the, yes. so to put that out to tender? Yes. So two, two, two Mile is going to, it's gone to tender, you're about to award a contract? We are in tender assessment at the moment. Right, okay. So uh, have you gone, so for Two Mile, have you gone to a specialist company or, or those that tended, have they got specialist skills for a road like Two Mile? In order to be successful in that tender, they would require those specialist when skills. When do you anticipate um, uh, awarding a contract? The tender assessment process will take another few weeks and I'd say we'd be out around April. April. Okay. And have you estimated or estimated how long that project will take to complete? It'll really depend on the construction method um, and we will, we've gone to market to get that sort of feedback about the way that the opportunities around construction and then of course we would engage with Janolan Cave's house around the access to the site, the ability to shut down, uh, all of those kinds of operational and delivery uh, considerations. So the house has been informed that they'll need to close for about 18 months though, haven't they? I'll have to refer to my colleague. Yes, that, that's correct. And they're yeah. planning some fairly substantial works to come Themselves, that is correct. So um, with regard to Five Mile then, where, where what's the latest update on that? Is that? That is a transport run repair and project, isn't it? You haven't contracted that? It is. A, it, it will be treated as a major project. And again, I'll refer to Mr Hayes. Yes, and we're, and we're um, currently you know, working with our infrastructure in place colleagues to assess the best way to, to attack five mile. Right, okay. With, with respect, Mr Hayes, the Transport for New South Wales have been saying that for some time. So it's, it's a big job. It is a big job. Um, what is the total grant and disaster funding that is attached to that road? It's hundreds of millions, isn't it? It's, it's a significant uh, it's, amount of money. It will be. That hasn't been finalised, the, the actual amount yet, because the design needs to be be finalised. Is there first. any discussions with the Commonwealth around any form of betterment funding yes. um, to, to build that road back better, to make it more flood uh, weather resistant? Or Yeah, discussions are underway with New South Wales RA right now to identify the best way to approach that. Is there a method that you can use both internal transport or expertise as well as uh, contractors to try and look at the, the, the best and quickest process to, to rebuild this infrastructure because the communities have had stop and go lollipop people with lights there for years now and um, they're beyond frustrated which is understandable. Yes. Uh, so uh, Mr Farrow I think you're are you assume are you referring to the Hampton area with the stop go? Yeah that's the Hampton Road. Yeah, yeah. so as I said we've, we're on we're on Hampton Road now. We've been there since the 15th of January. It is a significant rebuild. Um, it when, when is that estimated to be finished? September of this year. Yep. Um, we are looking at over 50 days of road closure, which will be um, very well communicated to the industries in that and to the local community in that area. We require that kind of access to the road because we need to rebuild the drainage infrastructure under the road and we can't do that without completely closing the road in order to cut right across. Back to Two Mile, will it have the ability to have coaches 
uh, when it goes, obviously, when you put it out to a contractor and they rebuild it, will it have the ability for coaches to be able to... I doubt the turning circles, the swept paths, would be suitable on yeah. two mile to allow coach access. So is there any, is there any uh, thoughts about a coach car park at the top of two mile before you descend down to the house? Uh, yes. Um, uh, as um, a former CEO of AAT Kings, um, used to spend a lot of time worrying about coaches in that part of the world. We have contacted the major coach operators and advised that even when repairs are done, um, we'd be um, very serious about not reopening the road for, for coaches and therefore we'd need a facility at the top of the hill to make sure that we could manage the process of transporting everyone down to, to the has, caves. Has there been any serious, con there's been lots of considerations for a long period of time around a gondola or around, uh, I remember these proposals, but now when you look back on it, it they actually could, possibly could be <coughs> considered. Is that part of any consideration around an alternative in terms of getting the least amount of disruption, moving people from the top to the bottom? Uh, I think my, my colleague, Ms Hayden, has, um, some of her team have, have looked at that. I'm not sure the investigations progressed very far. That's okay. we'll, I come, think. we'll come back to I, this. I think happens. in short, Mr Farraway, the, the answer yeah. to that is that primarily the teams are looking at road-based solutions yep. through shuttles and things because the expense of any other form of whether it's suspended cable car or the mm. like would be yep. very astronomical. No worries. I'll keep moving on because I've got heaps of questions still. Northern Distributor. So who's looking after Northern Distributor in Orange? Looking at you, Mr. Mr. Fuller, Mr. Hayes, Mr. Groskoff. I'm very happy to answer questions. Okay, so and, uh, that is obviously Carly. now correct. That is that was gazetted in 2022. It is now uh, under the care and responsibility and ownership of Transport for New South Wales. Correct. So the Orange Distributor Road was absolutely one of the ones in the priority yeah. round. Yes. Okay, so Transport for New South Wales now manage that, do they? Do they do they contract the works out to council or I to maintain the road? check on the absolute handover date. Have we I, I know we, uh, we're in the process of having it handed over. It, we have it now, don't we? March 23. Yeah, okay. Uh, just to confirm, yes, it has been transferred to uh, state management, um, and I'll get you the exact gazettal date, but yep. it was before March um, 2023. Um, I will need to double check just if we've actually got the arrangements in place with Orange um, for the RMCC, which was yep. proposed. Okay, thank you for confirming that. So it's in, it's in Transport for New South Wales hands. At March, I think you said it was officially transferred. Can I put on notice? Um, that a review of that road be undertaken by transport because I drive it nearly every day and it is in very, very ordinary condition uh, and it has a lot of freight movements and it is essentially a bypass for Orange. Um, I'm sure Orange Council will love not having to worry about that I, anymore. I think the answer to that, Mr Farrow, is yep. we don't have to take it on notice. We're, uh, we're reviewing yeah, that yeah. road at the moment already because uh, and certainly acknowledge that the state of the road uh, needs repair. No That's question. Fine. Will Arawang Station, I think, Ms Hayden, that might be in your sphere? Yes, yes, yes it is. Where are we up to with that? Because there was scoping works, there, there, there was money set aside by the, 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 the former or the, the previous government. Uh, where's transport up to in, in reactivating and opening that station? Uh, so yes, uh, you're correct. There was a seven million which is still uh, allocated um, for activation of that station to allow for the Bathurst bullet to stop. Um, we are currently looking at all of the requirements to open that, and that's not just around allowing the station um, to be accessible. Is for seven the train. million dollars enough now? In, in we are looking dollars? at what we can do within the scope with the seven million, um, which allows that activation as well as the broader needs of the station for the community as well. So we're we're actively looking at design do you, at the Do you moment. have a timeline of when this, this like th th these works have been going on for some some time now, Ms Hayden, like do we have a timeline of when those works will be finished, when transport will be in a better position to maybe, you know, notify the minister if you need more money or, or a timeline? Yep. So we're looking to finalise the scope uh, to one, reactivate, as well as look at community consultation around what that scope would look like. Um, and that would be this year to inform what we could do so with the seven million. So when will that community consultation take place? I'll have to take that on notice as to where we'll be up to, but it'll be sometime this year. Right. Um, will that station require enabling works for the new regional fleet? 
not based on how we operate. We plan to operate the same way that we're using the Bathurst bullets. So what is the most stage. expensive part in, in reactivating that station? Um, I'll have to take that on notice, but it was uh, probably in relation to um, uh, accessibility for the footbridge. Uh, is there any tentative timeline that you have in, in opening that station? Is there, is there any is there <coughs> end date that transport and government are looking towards to have that station reopened? I don't have a date at this point, but we're looking to make it active before regional rail so that it can be part of the current stopping pattern for the Bathurst bullet. Thank you. I just want to go back to the uh, the funding situation, uh, Mr. Carlin, that I was um, speaking to about before the um, before the break. Um, with the so you're saying that the 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 community road safety fund that there's the expectation that um, that that funding now is going to be spent and, and put towards initiatives over the next financial year, forward estimates, what, what's the expectation, what, what's the plan? Uh, yeah, so the, um, the 2026 Road Safety Action Plan actually has a funding profile um, to deliver those actions in the plan and certainly over the forward estimates, you know, the, um, the government announced in the the um, the budget the in um, 2024 2.6 billion over the four dot four years um, that's in the Ford estimates in the budget papers and certainly there's a program associated with that and includes all of the programs that you'd be familiar with to maintain um, the current level of safety on our network including things like the school crossing supervisor program. Um, which is funded by $24.9 million. Um, the licensing programs, our high pedestrian activity areas, education campaigns, uh, safer vehicles program, safer roads program. So they're outlined in that program. Um, and so there's a commitment to deliver those. Uh, and you know, that's subject to clearly, you know, uh, you know, on occasion, um, natural disasters, other impacts that happen, particularly in the infrastructure area. Um, but wherever that does happen, any reprofiling happens as part of the budget process and those, um, those funds are locked into delivering those road safety outcomes under the, the Road Safety Action Plan. Okay, thank you. There was also criticism around the, the transparency, um, I think, of that funding. They're, they're, I think the language used was um, no consolidated public reporting on total road safety funding allocated to regional New South Wales each year. So is, <coughs> are there changes being made to provide a more complete picture, whether that's a, yeah. a so, question for so you? The, the, yeah, the issue is, is that we do have a comprehensive um, annual uh, reporting progress, um, progress report that identifies the state level funding out of a community road safety fund and the concern was that we haven't specifically been reporting on the you know, the detail of what's allocated in the regional areas certainly That's right. um, and so we've accepted those recommendations we're working towards a plan to um, identify specifically the resources and programs that are funded in the regional areas um, and plan uh, to have a have that resolved and that plan in place by November this year okay all right, thank you. So, and back to the councils, and I mentioned this earlier with the minister here. The fact that with the the program, the local government road safety program, the the criticism that that was contained in the auditor general's report regarding the percentage of regional councils that participate and have participated in that I think currently that the, the statistic was the 52 percent of councils in regional New South Wales compared to 84 percent of councils in metropolitan areas and the Auditor General said that Transport for New South Wales has not undertaken any evaluations 
uh, to determine whether projects completed under this program have reduced road trauma at the local level. Let's start with the first bit. What, what, why the discrepancy there with, with councils, particularly in terms of how important road safety is to all councils but regional? Yeah. Um, look, I think um, uh, in the Road Safety Action Plan we actually do have a commitment to review and expand that local government road safety program to ensure every council has access to road safety officers to better resource their road safety planning and integration of road safety within their community um, plans and their um, strategic plans for local their local council. Um, it's a, you know, a voluntary program where we 50-50 fund the 50% of the salaries of those road safety officers in councils. Um, some councils have less capability, clearly, in the regional areas, um, and the review that we're doing and the Auditor General's recommendation was that we accelerate that review, and so that's taking place now, about how we can support those, particularly those local councils which um, don't have the level of staffing or expertise to be able to take on uh, people. But as well, we do know that there's um, issues in actually retaining people with that sort of skill set in road safety, safe systems management at a local level. Um, so part of the review is actually about how can we better resource councils, um, how can we support more councils to actually engage in the program. Um, and again, uh, as I said, we've um, started that review and um, would hope that we'd have recommendations for um, working with local government um, who will engage as part of that process to improve that program and get, um, we, we want every council that um, wants to have a road safety officer have the capability to actually have one and to do great work in you know, their community actually being safer on the roads. So uh, as the program stands at the moment, every council is able to um, to to access this joint funding to employ a road safety officer. Correct. Uh, is it the case, do you know whether the funding in terms of the second half of the, the, the salary for a road safety officer and everything else is a barrier to some councils? Uh, is it that That, that will be part of the review process is seeing where that is a barrier um, and seeing how we might address that, particularly for those councils that are smaller. Yeah. Um, we, all, we currently have um, designed in, in some of the reviews that we've conducted in the program over, year, over the recent years, flexibility for having, um, you know, uh, joint uh, RSO for covering a couple of councils. So we're also going to investigate what more flexibility we can put in place that actually supports councils um, in a way that means that they get better access. And also the project funding that's available and um, whether that needs to increase as part of that process. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to go back to um, speed limits. I mean, I asked about that. You did you um, mentioned the uh, 40 kilometer per hour in shared spaces and um, some inner uh, urban areas what about what's being kind of contemplated about speeding or actual speed limits sorry not even um, speeding but uh, speed limits in some of the non-urban areas uh, as to whether in terms of safety uh, some of the speed limits on uh, regional roads need to be reconsidered or whether, you know, safety in terms of uh, speed limits around corners, what is the research showing and what's the department looking at in that regard? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'd again, so the, the fact that we have issued a, the new um, speed zoning standard and that's being reviewed um, in its first sort of um, six to 12 months of operation to make sure that it's fit for purpose as well. Um, <coughs> last year we had uh, 156 fatalities uh, where speeding was a contributing factor and that was an increase of 42 um, lives lost um, compared to 2022. Uh, and we know that in the regional areas the um, proportion is higher and on average, in recent years, it's been around 40% of our fatalities, and last year it was 44% of our fatalities. So it is a critical issue for us to manage. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the significant increase was in the um, country urban areas, 
Um, we didn't have a, any significant increase in last year um, in the high speed, the non-urban, country urban um, areas, but at that you know, same time that is where the majority of the deaths associated with speeding happen. So um, that new standard is actually now reframed around movement and place framework um, consistent with our planning um, in New South Wales for the road network um, and certainly as part of the um, projects that are initiated in terms of those safer roads projects speed zones are always considered as part of the overall um, changes to infrastructure as well um, so I'd cite you know a, a Oxley Highway upgrade which happened um, around must be a little over six years ago um, which has seen a significant reduction in the trauma and it was a combination of um, you know, improving the curves on that route um, putting in barrier systems audio tactile and in um, high risk locations reducing the speed zones to 80. Um, so that combination of managing better infrastructure and speed zones that match the road environment is critical to achieving, continuing to achieve the outcomes of reducing trauma on those roads. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, I've got some questions just around uh, bus stops, bus stop infrastructure uh, in um, rural and regional New South Wales. Firstly, uh, we have heard a lot about, um, actually no, some questions about uh, accessible bus stops and what the rollout is there, what that's looking like in terms of providing, um, ensuring that more bus stops are accessible, safe, have shelter. I do understand that some, there's been some funding put towards that. Are there, is there data in terms of um, accessibility around, um, sorry, is there data in terms of um, targets for uh, making more of our main kind of regional bus stops accessible. I don't know who to direct that to. Mr Fuller, is it? Uh, I think oh. we'd, uh, Ms Fairman, I think we'd have to take that on notice. Uh, right. Most of those facilities uh, through our regional areas are council owned and led, but we do support them through a small grant program, which we could give you some more detail on. Yes, I mean, uh, yes, I'm aware of that in terms of the Yes, the council are uh, having um, largely being responsible for the infrastructure and often the backlog that many of the councils just talked about, uh, road safety, for example, and um, financial sustainability of councils being a huge barrier in terms of how much they can spend on infrastructure. And I think bus stops have probably come behind road uh, upgrades uh, in terms of local councils. So at this stage, I've got that it's the... Transport for New South Wales has got a, like a budget of something like $2 million. Is that correct? That's going to regional, regional it, it's New quite South small, Wales. Yes. I, I couldn't confirm that exact number, but it is quite small. It's is that similar. a new is that new funding or is that the, is that been this ongoing assistance to councils over quite some time? Uh, and, and it's not just for councils. Others can apply for it as well, but it has been in place for a, a, a number of years. Okay. Um. Thank you. Um, I've got a, just a general question about, I've, I've seen that in some previous kind of parliamentary inquiries, one back, actually back a decade ago into um, country link services that the lower house here did. One of the kind of strong recommendations out of that was urging Transport for New South Wales or its iteration back then to have stronger links with Destination New South Wales mm. in terms of promoting country New South Wales as a destination that you can get to on train, um, by train. It doesn't, when you look at the uh, uh, website, train link, that doesn't seem, that recommendation doesn't seem to have been picked up that strongly, I must say. Uh, it really does seem as though we don't promote uh, travelling around regional New South Wales by train. So what connections or links are there between Destination New South Wales and uh, Transport for New South Wales in, on, on this matter? I'm sure Mr Merrick will have, will have quite a bit to say on this, but we do in fact have uh, an MOU with Destination New South Wales, which is specifically, well, it started out specifically focused on tourism signage. Uh, 
um, you know, point, encouraging people to get off the, the highway to go and look at specific mm. tourism. People in cars, yeah. Uh, we now um, have um, regular meetings with Destination New South Wales um, to discuss opportunities, particularly for events, um, and you know, the Tamworth Music Festival and Byron Blues Fest, and um, it, you know, the list goes on. But but uh, you know, I would agree there's a huge opportunity to be working more closely in partnership with Destination New South Wales, particularly to get Sydney ciders out into the regions. It's a great opportunity. That's a bit that's been an identified opportunity for more than a decade that doesn't seem to have been taken up as much as it should be. Mr Merrick? Yeah, and thanks for the question. Um, I can't talk to the link to Destination New South Wales, but what, what I can do is um, confirm we've got an active campaign right across rural New South Wales for partnerships with events. There are the obvious ones around the Broken Heel, uh, Elvis, um, the Tamworth Music Festival. And if you go on the website, you will see you know, a very active campaign around uh, promotion um, for regional travel and regional journeys. So again, I can't talk to the link that you're referring to with regard to destination, but we are very actively campaigning in the regions to take up our journeys. And I think wh what I'd say if I look, if you look at the resurgence to rail travel now, um, d December just gone was, um, was the most amount of people that travelled on, on our regional services in the last eight years. So we've seen a, a real resurgence to rail travel. And um, yeah, yeah and, and before that it was back to uh, um, January 2013. So we're seeing a resurgence to rail travel and, and we're trying to partner or couple that with the promotions that you see on our website. Do you know out of that rail travel what the, the I'm sure you do, uh, the domestic uh, travel versus international travel, uh, firstly, do you uh, know the, I can the take breakdown that, of that? I can take that on notice. We, we, we know the, <coughs> the segmentation of passenger type, um, but I can take it on notice as to whether we've got the detail domestic versus international that you're So is to. there is there funding, because funding, uh, attracting uh, people to regional towns for events is one thing, mm. but ongoing uh, uh, attracting people to travel to the regions, you know, a lot of travellers come here and don't want to hire a car, for example, yeah. and therefore heading out to regional yeah. centres from Sydney, from people travel from New York or whatever, they just won't do it yeah. because it's so difficult. Is there, uh, there's no advertising campaigns or promotion campaigns or indeed a budget to uh, uh, promote travelling by train through regional New South Wales yeah. to the average visitor, not for events, just to, to go to parks, go to Warrange, go to Moree. Uh, yeah, I'd probably disagree um, to a point in that we have an active campaign, relatively small budget, but an active campaign and the, the New South Wales Train Link will, will take you there campaign is, is live. Um, it's, it's live at the moment. While what is might, that called? Uh, New South Wales Train Link will take you there, so right. that's our campaign and you may or may not have seen it. It's, it's, um, I, I looked, I actually actively looked, so I, I, I mustn't be, that. my socials yeah. mustn't be... Uh, yeah, picking that up in so terms of... Uh, we're in the middle of a dedicated campaign now um, around increasing patronage. What's that budget, um, Mr Merrick? I'd have to come back to you with, with, I'll take that on notice, but to your point around international customers, I'd have to take on notice <coughs> as to whether we're targeting specifically, but I know we are with domestic, both inter intrastate and interstate. And when did that campaign start? Again, I'll take that on notice. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. it, 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 has it been going for a little while or is it a new... Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't like to guess. I'll, I'll come back to you with on notice with when that started. Okay, um, that's probably me done. Actually, um, question wise, so I'll throw it back to you if you like. Thank Hold you, yeah. <coughs> Madam Chair. Um, Bathurst Bullet is that Miss Hayden? Back to yep. So we asked. Uh, I asked the the minister a few questions on this earlier. Um, uh, but I wanted to ask you some questions as well. So with regard um, to the Bathurst bullet, um, have you prepared a brief to the Minister on extending the one or both of the existing services to initiate or start in Orange? Um, we haven't prepared a brief as such, but we have identified that the opportunity to extend to Orange is part of the consideration of service improvements that we're looking at as part of regional rail rollout. Um, so as you're aware, regional rail 
project is essentially like for like, so same number of trains, expected same level of service, but we're also looking at what opportunities we can go further than that. And so there's no there's no brief, there's no workings or no thoughts or ideas uh, internally to to extend the their endeavours, aren't they? In, Endeavour trains uh, services through to Orange now, or to at least try and stable them overnight in Orange. And We've started. done preliminary work, but we haven't done a formal briefing up to the minister. Only that we are looking at it. It will require um, more detailed consideration, and so including consultation with the uh, unions and with uh, the crew that operate that fleet. If you were to do that, is there any way that the train can be stabled or housed in Orange overnight, rather than going back to Lithgow? So that would have to be the considerations, because again, how we would look at the timetable and operations would require, um, you know, essentially enabling... Have you had any there. discussions with the RTBU? With the I can't speak to that, no. I have not, no. Okay, no, that's fine. Again, we're in infancy and this is just one of the, let's say, service opportunities that we're, we're looking at for future regional services. Is it fair to say that the only way that this option would be feasible is that if the train was stabled overnight in Orange, so it could possibly leave at 6am Orange and then be in Bathurst by 7.30 to connect up to be the second service that currently operates there on the same timetabling. Uh, if you were referring to the same timetable, it would be uh, very challenging to do that without sort of some of, you know, capacity at Orange. But we're also looking at is there opportunities to improve the timetable as part of the election commitment that government has. Okay, but I'm talking about what's possible, um, not with the new regional rail fleet, but the existing fleet. So is it possible to have the bullet number two housed in Orange to initiate from Orange Station at 6am um, uh, rather than a coach connection to Bathurst and then call into Bathurst, which are, you know would do now at, at a very similar time that that second train currently leaves Bathurst? Um, I will refer that to um, Mr Merrick just because it is around operations and how, you know, if that is possible. Yeah, thanks for, Thanks again for the question. I think that's, as, as Ms Hayden has said, it would be part of our, but part of our, op, op, yeah. our optioneering. And is, is it possible, I it, suppose? I think anything is possible within, within, um, within reason, but as Ms Hayden touched on, the key um, considerations would be the safe stabling of the asset itself, um, facilities for crew, and the, and the crewing conditions that would support that service. Um, it's something that obviously we would, would be looking as part of our considerations, but um, yeah. Have you done any research in and around patronage or potential patronage numbers out of Orange on, on a dedicated train rather than a coach connection? Uh, train link hasn't. Um, I'm not sure whether Ms Hayden has seen any numbers. Uh, not uh, dedicated. It's a, assumed a level of patronage that currently exists, um, but uh, potentially, you know, we haven't looked at what's latent demand and what that might look like um, if that service was provided. At what stage of the new regional fleet rollout, and I know that the first train's here and you've got to test it, but at what stage is the Bathurst Bullet in the overall rollout? So the Bathurst Bullet uh, is uh, essentially will be a regional rail diesel intercity. Um, I will defer to um, uh, Camilla just to um, advise, but I understand that the intercities are the last on the production, um, so the changes to those services would be one of the last that were implemented with the changeover of the fleet. Yeah, yeah that's correct. Um, under the current, current deployment plan, uh, the intercities are um, the last trains. can always be looked at, but that's the current plan. The current Bathurst Bullet, is it still managed by Sydney Trains and not Trainlink? Operated by Trainlink. Yep. Um, Sydney Trains are our maintenance partner. Right, okay, so so it comes under you, Mr Merrick. Yep. Um, has it been like that since it started, or at uh, one stage it had a different operating model, didn't it? It's for the time I can remember, back to 2013, it's been with New South Wales Trains. Yep. Okay, so they're your, they're your staff, your drivers, uh, so you're responsible for, yep. for the stabling, for the crew, and the scheduling. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, thank you very much. School buses, school bus contracts. Um, what is the process currently in place to, or how often do you review a school bus route and contract based on numbers? Is that done annually, biannually, or, or at, at a request of an operator or community? 
So thank you for the question. Um, it, it's a mix of all of those. So we certainly do do an annual um, review in terms of school numbers. Um, in addition to that, in the event we were to receive overloads or have um, feedback from communities, then we would definitely look at um, look at those services as well. Okay, so you don't do it on a schedule or, or you're saying that it is done, obviously, if with the operator or when uh, the community asks for a review? So I'm saying that it's done certainly um, before the beginning of each school year. Yeah. And then in addition to that, on a case-by-case -case basis. So a question would be is, how do you manage a school bus route does every child need to have um, a seat? Is there any standing capacity or is there a percentage that is standing capacity on a school bus? So thank you for the question. Um, in terms of standees on a school bus, there isn't a set number. So it's actually set by the manufacturer. So it would vary in accordance with the manufacturer of that particular bus. Right, so with regard to over capacity, where, where you have Possibly, and I'll give you an example. It is um, <coughs> uh, Orange School Bus routes, basically from Orange to Molong. Yes. Um, which then will feed to possibly the Cum Cumnock and then Eucarina and other yes. smaller communities. I've been um, approached by several constituents uh, in the region who say that that school bus, uh, the bus itself, and that route is over capacity, yes. and that there is the provision uh, for the Orange Anglican Grammar School um, where they have an overflow bus that they use on a separate contract mm -hmm. but that overflow bus is only available depending on driver availability. So okay. how does that work? How, how can you have an overflow bus that is, that is dependent then um, on driver availability? So thank you for the question. I am aware of those additional services that were put in. Um, my understanding is they came into place in May um, for, for that community. Um, I'll have to take that question on notice. That service should be operating, and so I will take that question on notice. But I am aware that we did put an additional service in um, for those communities. Can I ask, if possible, is that I've been approached by multiple constituents um, on this. Is it possible that you can um, take this question on notice and re re-review the Orange to Molong school bus routes and offering uh, and what is put in place. Yes. Okay, excellent. excellent. Yep, the community will be happy with that and I'm happy at a later point to share any of this information but there essentially is concern uh, obviously over the interchange there at Molong railway station just so you know um, around uh, where the kids obviously get on and off but the biggest concern um, that, uh, that I do need to say is that driver availability on that overflow. Um, mm -hmm. By all accounts, it's not working, and uh, that is the part, if you could obviously take on notice in the review, that would be uh, most helpful. Do you also, and I've, I can't see, I'm sorry, oh, sorry. sorry, sorry I'm sorry, um, uh, Ms. Taylor. Um, do you look after the procurement um, for panel four of school buses as well? Um, thank you for the question. No, I'm not directly involved in bus panel four. Okay, so who is? Um, we would have to take those questions on. It's managed out of the Coordinator General area now in transport under right. uh, Mr Collins and formerly it's been a service that's been provided out of the Sydney team. So, Right, okay. So uh, under questioning, and I, and I note Mr Murray maybe if you want to take these questions as the Secretary, that uh, Minister Halen, uh, we discussed this in her estimates last Friday, to confirm, um, you know, regional I suppose, inquiry and, and, and budget <laughs> estimate session, uh, that panel four should be finalised. Was that the end of March? Was that the commitment given? Uh, again, I just have to take <coughs> that on notice. I recall that the question was answered last week, so I'll make sure we get the latest to you. Yeah, okay. Josh, I can answer. It's, it's the 1st of March is the um, date. Yeah. Um, so with regard to panel four, will it include uh, both uh, diesel, you know, diesel operated buses in regional New South Wales and also zero emission buses? Is zero emission buses included in panel four? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. All right. Excellent. Uh, Mr Fuller, Great Western Highway, um, do you have on hand through Freight Branch or, or Traffic Management Centre or 
anything, um, where you have the freight numbers that are moved along the Great Western Highway, by road freight obviously, um, for the years 22 and 23, um, and, and the projection for the next two years? What we do have is the current heavy vehicle counts along uh, that section of the highway, which generally on average are about 2,750 a day. Um, I don't have a projected outlook other than broader uh, general freight movements uh, statewide, and that's some of the uh, detailed work the team's doing at the moment, just to um, reproject both the dollar value contributions, the freight uh, expectations. That, so uh, does Transport have any data on hand of what the freight value uh, and quantity would have been over the past few years on that highway? Uh, I'd, I'd have to check on the freight value per such. I think what we've focused on is uh, vehicle movements and, uh, and what's happened there through traffic modelling and, and counts. Uh, I don't know that that would have extended to a dollar value, but uh, we can take that on notice and check. Uh, we are doing broader work on the overall dollar value of, of the freight sector and, uh, and what contribution it makes to state productivity. Is the Freight Transport Advisory Council still active or was a new advisory council um, uh, commissioned by the, the government 11 months ago? So the Freight Transport Advisory Council is absolutely still active uh, and I know even in the last couple of days Minister Halen has uh, met with the chair of the Freight Transport Advisory Council uh, and I know that it's their intention to continue with that council. Um, it is largely the same with the addition of uh, three union representatives from the Rail, Maritime and, uh, and Road Transport Workers Union, so uh, the former um, you know, constitution of that committee is uh, is pretty much intact, as I said, with with additions. Um, so, has other than the three additions um, with union representation, has the representation changed at all in the last eleven months? No, the members haven't changed. No. Yep. Okay. No. Which minister oversees that advisory council, or who, who does the advise? Who whose jurisdiction does it come under? Minister Halen is, yep. uh, has the freight portfolio, and so she's the person who uh, attends and uh, and and uh, uh, at, with with uh, the chair, Mr. Duncan Gay, who, yep. who remains in. So yes. So how do they still meet quarterly? Uh, I'd have to check the last meeting we had, but I know it's minister's intention to have a meeting uh, in the next couple of months. Okay. <coughs> Excellent. Um, now I've just asked the secretariat just to Mr. Murray may be able to help. Mr. Murray, I think this one's best too. Um, this is regarding, I'm just tabling or, or, or producing some correspondence for you, Mr. Murray. So one is a reply from uh, Minister Aitchison to Mr. Ray Carter uh, in the Central West um, regarding a uh, development control plan that relates to his property and a piece of correspondence in 2017 by Andrew uh, McIntyre uh, to Bathurst Regional Council regarding a development control plan amendment. Uh, now, as you can possibly see in, and I've highlighted bits of it, um, in the Minister's correspondence, uh, she accepts and regrets the confusion and frustration with the word submission, um, and also goes on, obviously, to say uh, or clarify transport's position. What is transport's for, transport for New South Wales' position on these development control plans and how often would you review transport's position on such a plan? Uh, thank you for the question and for providing the correspondence. Uh, this isn't a case that I'm aware of. Obviously, as you say, it dates back to original correspondence in 2017. I'm happy to check into that and inform the committee. Based on, and that's why I've tabled it, uh, Mr Murray, um, not to play tricks on any, just because genuinely you probably need to see what the Minister has replied with, but could I suggest that you take on notice a review of Transport's position that it took on the 24th of October in 2017, because it doesn't seem to um, obviously marry up with the Minister's uh, reply and possible improvements to that road infrastructure in recent times and I note the Kelso to Raglan section this is bang smack on that new piece of road infrastructure um, and it appears that um, I don't know if transport really want to get involved in DAs and and processes around these control management amendments and plans 
um, when they've just built new road infrastructure. I'm happy to take on notice and if we at Transport can clarify with Mr Carter we will do so. Okay, that'll be, uh, that will be good. Um, Great Western Highway again, you'd be surprised, I've only got a bit more time, how many people come and talk to you about this? Um, this is regarding uh, safety uh, and entry to uh, properties around Waylang, so not too far from where uh, um, we're referring to that previous piece of correspondence. My question is, how often, or how do you review processes where someone's entrance uh, to their property, which has been there for a significant amount of time, is bang smack out the front of a Form 1 or formation of one lane, and what safety considerations or reviews are done uh, consistently to ensure that traffic, additional traffic flow and movement, what safety, uh, what safety considerations need to be taken constantly to ensure that uh, people can enter and exit these property, properties safely. Um, Mr Farrell, I'm happy to um, certainly ask if you've got any information from landholders. We'd be very happy to engage with them directly just to ensure that uh, any concerns about safety are looked at. But um, obviously primarily when we're doing works on highway corridors, we engage with the adjacent landholders and, uh, and look at opportunities to ensure that their access onto highways uh, are in fact safe and to look at whether they can be made safer. So um, it's something that happens pretty routinely as works are undertaken, but um, if, if you've got uh, knowledge of particular concerns, we'd be very happy to engage with those landholders. Yep, okay, I might uh, work out with the Secretariat how to do this. I think Mr Lunn, Alistair Lunn, your team has been... Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's fine. Um, I, I will just try Just one sec, I'll just, yeah, yeah. Miss Hayden is happy to go. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I'll, work, I'll work out how to table it or work out just with the constituent about this, but I, I believe Mr Lund's been involved in this, probably knows about it. Um, so if we could look into that, that would We'd be... We'd be happy to follow up. That would be uh, fantastic. Um, with regard to renewable energy zones, um, I don't know who wants to take this one, but um, how much involvement... Um, oh, so, sorry, what upgrades would be needed uh, for the Golden Highway in regard to the continuing development of the Central West Arana Renewable Energy Zone? Yeah, look, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, at the moment, there's a, there's a lot of work being undertaken on renewables uh, and on the energy transition, not just around the Central West Arana Renewable Energy Zone. Um, and of course, the Golden Highway is one of the corridors that will facilitate that. Uh, there's been a recent announcement about private investment uh, near Dubbo and Wellington. Uh, we anticipate more private investment in, in renewables. So uh, there's a lot of work being undertaken. Um, I'll refer to Mr Hayes in a moment, but um, one of the things we have done is uh, enter into an MOU with uh, Energy Co, which is the, obviously the uh, organisation within government that's responsible for the development of the renewable energy zone. Um, and what that's done is established a uh, team within transport to undertake the full feasibility that's required to look at all of the uh, corridors and routes and amendments that need to be undertaken for whether it's the swept path of the blades which uh, are going to be up to sort of 95 so 100 I suppose, Mr. Fuller, while I've, I'm not trying to be rude, I've only got limited time, but specifically with the New England and Golden Highways, um, <coughs> There is talk due to the change of timeline for the Musselbrook bypass that that the turbine blades and the oversize over mass requirements due to these renewable energy zones will require uh, transport's involvement to push these oversize over mass loads onto country roads uh, and to essentially go around Denman, is that correct? Yeah, there, there's absolutely investigations and discussions with the local government areas on regional roads and making use of alternate routes. Um, and with that, discussions about uh, how transport would potentially either, you know, look at reclassification of those roads, but absolutely committing to so the is, ongoing is, maintenance. Is reclassification and, part, or is this issue part of the MOU you have with Energy Code? Oh, look, it's absolutely part of the yeah. investigations we're undertaking with local government. We want to ensure that, uh, you know, there is obviously a very considerable load that is going to be undertaken during the energy transition on roads generally, uh, whether they be state roads, regional roads, uh, and we want 
to make sure that working with Energy Co, we're able to understand properly the maintenance requirements do, of those roads. Do and, you and believe that transport for New South Wales will be able to uh, develop a, an agreement with Energy Co to have this <coughs> infrastructure in place before the turbines uh, and the blades arrive at Port of Newcastle? That's absolutely what we're working to with uh, construction commencement and being undertaken through the course of 2025. Have you got any initial or any projected costings of what it will cost government um, to reclassify, transfer um, uh, uh, and then build or build capacity into these regional roads um, to make this happen? That's the detailed assessment that's being undertaken now. Is there no way that rescheduling the Musselbrook bypass would actually allow for the more efficient movement of these turbines rather than pushing them on to local and regional roads in local but government areas? You probably need to just clarify the Musselbrook bypass won't aid the central west Arana zone. Uh, it's more about a the longer New range yeah. for the New England. Correct. So part of what is being considered at the moment, as the Minister said this morning, the both governments have committed to the delivery of Musselbrook Bypass. It is about the conversation about capacity within industry and how it lines up with the other work that we're undertaking, not just in the New England, but in the Hunter more broadly. Uh, and also, as you rightly point out, the connection and how it supports or, or may interrupt uh, the transition of energy and uh, movement of oversized vehicles. So that's absolutely part of uh, what's being investigated at the moment. Okay, thank you. I am out of questions officially, so a few more. You've right. got more. So, just continuing on that theme, Mr. Fuller, um, have you has Transport for New South Wales been approached by a company called Res Group regarding a 63 turbine wind development in around Kerr's Creek in the Central West? I'm not aware, Mr. Hayes. Are you uh, aware I'm not aware, but we are in um, constant engagement with Energy Co. And normally, we would refer refer people to Energy Co. Having said that, the the challenge with the oversize over mass, um, particularly out of Newcastle Port, it is much bigger than than just Energy Co. So we're viewing this as a much broader project to make sure that we're supporting the growth of renewable energy. So. With regard to this, with regard to this uh, Res Group um, uh, wind development in the Central West, uh, they may need to bring the blades um, across the Golden Highway to Dubbo, then down the Mitchell Highway, and through Molong, which will mean that the blades are 80 metres, you know, 80 metres long. Yes, they're 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 smaller when they're transported, but they're still like 50 or 60 metres. Um, what happens with things like the Molong Pool that may need to be moved in order to allow for the movement of such oversize over mass loads? Who bears that cost in part of all this? And I suppose one, who bears the cost? Two, what is included in your MOU with Energy Co to address these types of enabling infrastructure where projects get approved and the taxpayer and transport are left holding the can to upgrade the road down the track? Can I um, say in the outset, I think um, we shouldn't assume that uh, we would move a local Olympic pool um, <laughs> in any sense. We would avoid that at all costs, um, and that's why... They want uh, a new pool. So the the example that you've used yeah. for the Central West of Rana is a really good one, where there are really viable regional roads and where those discussions are being uh, undertaken with the local government areas that are the road managers of those roads uh, to ensure that we look at what's the most viable, uh, what has the least interruption on the community. Um, so that's both a decision around infrastructure investment but also about how you operate those movements. Um, so in, in, in regard to this, this view and proposal looking at regional <coughs> roads, um, uh, councils, do councils as part of this proposal have to stump up any cash uh, from their from their position to upgrade these roads or this is purely paid for by state government? I think what we do with any proposal, um, particularly if it's a developer-led proposal, uh, is we line up with councils, we have those conversations and understand what's appropriate um, and whether those costs should be uh, borne by developers or whether they are government-led initiatives and supported by government investment. Um, 
is there a mechanism and is there a trigger that that transport for New South Wales must be consulted by Energy Co or the developer about potential future enabling infrastructure on the road network before these developments are approved? So Energy Co is delivering the projects that they have responsibility for. Uh, we have the normal planning processes through the Department of Planning uh, where they would be consider other proponent propositions and um, traffic management, uh, transport plans are absolutely part of those and are normally um, you know, uh, actually stipulated as part of their conditions of consent. So with regard to Merry War, last time I checked there's like 9,000 movements or something that I think are required to go through the main street, is that correct? I'd have to check on the absolute numbers. Right, but you would be having quite a lot of dialogue, hopefully, with what the local member and the council Absolutely. there around, because that is a significant amount of disruption, and I suspect uh, quite a bit of maintenance on that piece of road network will be required in order to, to facilitate that oversize over mass. You've Definitely. actually outlined um, the the broader conversation and the the, the MOU with Energy Co. It, it identifies infrastructure requirements, it looks at operational requirements, it looks at ongoing maintenance, it's, it's, a, it's a broad relationship that we're trying to build because this is not something that's going to be over in a couple of years and once the, once the energy zones are built we also are aware that there's going to be ongoing renewing of you know, the equipment etc. So it's, we, need to, we need to be organised and if it's, you know, 10 per night, whatever it happens to yep. be, we need to manage that the best way to not disrupt so the community. With, with regard to your MOU with Energy Co, um, is agricultural production and stock movements part of the MOU and do you, uh, do, do, does Energy Co need to take that into consideration around the disruption to possibly those movements and the growth in agriculture in the region using the same road network? From memory the MOU doesn't specifically call out agriculture. What, it, what we have, what we are doing is having ongoing like, weekly conversations with Energy Co. It's not about getting this equipment from the port to the end destination. It's also understanding the impact on the communities and the road users in the middle. Um, so there are discussions about overtaking lanes, um, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that, that we are really respectful of the fact that this is, um, this is very important. We get this right for the communities in the middle. Okay. Um, do we have any numbers of, uh, of move projected movements that would be going through Musselbrook to the New England Renewable Energy Zone? I think it's probably, a, um, we, there's been some early assessments, but uh, I would like to quote specific numbers. I think Are that's you, the work that Energy Co... Have you notice maybe any projected I, numbers? I, I think that's something that's uh, being worked up, given that that project is uh, beyond the existing um, Central West Arana. Um, that's that's detailed work that Energy Co are doing at the moment, uh, which we will obviously work on with. The have priority you, we've been looking at recently is on the Central West Tirana area. Yeah. So with regard to, you mentioned discussions with local governments around the reclassification of local roads, have you had to reclassify any to date for uh, the movement of oversize over mass? So Energy Co are leading those conversations, but the the, the commitment that we've made to, to those key councils is that whether it's a formal reclassification or whether it's us um, just picking up the tab you know, to, to make sure that we are paying for the maintenance and the upgrade of those roads. Either way, um, we've made it very clear that, that the state has that responsibility. Where do you get the pool of money from for, to do that? Ed. That's a discussion we're having with Energy Co at yep. the moment uh, as to how they, uh, you know, they've got a range of um, you know, financing structures in there in the way in which they've been constructed, um, and that's really, um, you know, down for them to resolve and then to, um, you know, negotiate with government on what's the best path forward in terms of that investment. Will there be doubling up um, of, of cost in and around when the New England renewable energy zone takes off? Because you're going to have to find alternate paths and routes to move these oversize over mass loads um, when the Musselbrook bypass is only a few years after 
you've done all this work in reclassifying roads and investing and pushing these loads onto regional roads? No, I think what we're talking about is two separate things. So what we're talking about for the regional roads is for the Central West. <coughs> um, Musselbrook bypass right. would support the New England. Yeah. And but at this the stage... Will we, the timing work, though? Will, well, will, that, will that's you have that bypass finished and the agreement with the Commonwealth by the time that the projected turbines and the blades need to be pushed up into the, the uh, New England res? As I mentioned before, the, the timing of that is what's being considered at the moment. Okay, um, moving on, um, with regard to local council roadblock grants, are they currently or still frozen in terms of the amount? Um, are they still being expanded by CPI or...? Uh, I wouldn't refer to them as frozen. There's a uh, the, we we have a, uh, a forward outline of, of has, block grants. Has the amount of money uh, per council based on road network has that increased in the last budget? The the same formula that's been used in the recent pass uh, has been utilised to allocate to it's it's down to the proportion of regional roads that a council uh, has within their portfolio. So is the percentage they're getting? based on the size of regional roads and how many regional roads they have, has that funding been static for the for in the last budget or has it grown per, per council, per roadblock? I'd have to check uh, the examples. I mean, there would have been natural shifts where councils have had regional roads reclassified back to the state. Um, you know, the uh, um, Southern Connector Road in Orange is one that you mentioned before that potentially would have influenced the amount that that council received. Um, so it's really down to the calculations on what regional roads they manage, but the amounts haven't moved materially. What has shifted materially is the fact that the councils have been given an allocation of the $390 million through yeah, the regional that's, that's separate emergency the repair fund. That's separate. To the it, it is separate, but it's also an important allocation yeah, for councils yeah, to be able to manage their local and form. regional road network. It is separate. Um, with regard to roadblock grants, if what happens to underspend with roadblock grants? Uh, I'd is, have to take is, that on is, notice is, and just is check. Is the council allowed to, to roll it over to the next financial year? Um, are they allowed to roll it over to the next financial year and allow um, essentially an extension to, spend, oh, to, to use think it? The short way to answer that question is it really depends on the circumstances and obviously in terms of a lot of the grants and the considerations we've had with local government in the last couple of years have been influenced heavily by natural disasters mm -hmm. and their ability to undertake work so we've had a high degree um, of flexibility and been very transparent with councils about that so um, but I would have to take on notice the general policy so position is any on council disadvantaged um, with roadblock grants where they may not have the capacity to deliver them within the year the roadblock grant uh, is is allocated to? I'd take on notice the specifics, but I don't I wouldn't say that councils are disadvantaged. No. No, no, any council they could be disadvantaged because of their lack of capacity, as you said, if they um, if they had natural disaster repairs. Um, to, to oversee, so you're happy to take that on? As I said, the general principle we've applied to all of our grants uh, is to make sure that we give councils the greatest amount of flexibility where it has been warranted yep. um, around other externalities that have impacted their delivery. Thank you. Um, can I ask Mr Fuller, you, are you able to table for the committee uh, a list of the roadblock grants per LGA for the current financial year? Yes, we'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Um, a question for Ms Hong. Um, with regard to the Great Western Highway and the East and West sections, that was uh, through the Federal Government's infrastructure review then cancelled by Minister King, there was a percentage, 20% uh, was quarantined for that project um, from the, as, as the state's contribution. Can I, can I ask where was that 20% that was quarantined in the Ford estimates? Um, where was that money redirected to? Which projects? Can I just um, maybe clarify what you mean by the 20% that was quarantined? Well, it was an 80-20 funding split. The Commonwealth had $2.03 billion committed to east and west sections, with the exception of Cox's River Road and Medlow Bath. Uh, where did the remainder of our 20% commitment, where, where was that funding redirected to? To which projects? For Great Western Highway yep. or just the two? 
projects that you were well, no, you're, you're putting in your, your 20 percent to the two projects it's what was left over right so you're talking about the rest of the great western highway Correct. funding so that was redirected to a number of projects in the regional space and the road space which projects though were they redirected to so they were re redirected to fund the regional roads fund as well as the urban roads fund amongst other things okay so the former government had 2.5 billion dollars committed through its budgetary process and the ford estimates towards um, the Great Western Highway. Not all of that was obviously allocated specifically to contracts um, because there was a leftover. Other than the funding that was put into the Regional Road Fund and the Urban Road Fund, where did the remainder of that allocation in the Ford Estimates, where was, which projects were they, was that re um, redirected to? I'm unable to answer that question because when government decided to bring or cancel the project, the money went back to CONFUND and then obviously the government then decided how they wanted to reallocate that funding within the CON fund. I do know that a portion of that was reallocated to both the uh, Regional Roads Fund as well as the Urban Roads Fund. Was, was a portion of that funding redirected to roads in Western Sydney? There were funding uh, within obviously the recent budget for roads in Western Sydney whether it was specifically from the Great Western Highway, uh, I'm not sure. As I said, Are the money went back. Are you able to take that on notice, Ms Hong? Well, I think I'm happy to take that on notice, but at the end of the day, as you're aware, um, money goes back into the CON fund and it is gov up to government then to reallocate the money that's sitting in CON fund. So yes, I can confirm that there were money allocated to Western Road, uh, Western Sydney Roads, came from CON fund, but whether it came from the Great Western Highway or not, I'm unable well, I think to. it was quite highly publicised um, by media outlets and also the now Treasurer that that's what happened. So he, I, I just wanted it from the agency's perspective to be able to, to, to quantify it, I suppose. So if you can take it on notice, I, that would be Happy to. much appreciated. Um, uh, I think this might be Mr Fuller. Um, how much funding has been rolled out since the 1st of July, so this current financial year, from uh, the new Regional Road Fund? I'd have to take that on notice. I know there's been a number of projects where deeds have been entered into um, with so the local not, government. this is not the emergency road fund? That's no, no, I understand the, yeah, the program yeah, that you're yeah. talking about. There's, uh, there's commitments there uh, for both projects that transport will undertake uh, and then there's also uh, projects that local government will undertake. If, so if you can take that on notice, would you be able to um, come back to the committee with um, the amount and the project, the, the list of what has been issued by transport uh, sure. from that fund since the 1st of July? No problem. Um, how, do you know how many potholes uh, or heavy vehicle, uh, heavy patching works have been completed as part of the $500 million uh, regional, uh, regional and rural road um, rollout that was announced in January 2023? I'd have to take on notice how many potholes have been uh, um, undertaken. I think it was also heavy patching too, wasn't it? it was well, correct, yes. Yeah. So um, I'd have to have a look. I mean, I know in the last financial year across the state roads that our teams have uh, been repairing uh, nearly 28,500 potholes across the state, but I, I uh, don't have a figure on hand across all of the local government areas. No, that's right. Are you happy to take that on notice per local government area, Mr Fuller? Uh, we can take it on notice. Mr Hayes has just uh, alerted me to the fact that on the last count we had, uh, since December 2022, five, over 527,000 potholes had been repaired under the local and regional road so network. So is, is that just on state roads or that includes the council roads? That's across the local and regional road network. Right. So they is, are the council owned. Do councils still report quarterly on their patching and potholes? Uh, I think in terms of the requirements under those programs, uh, I think the answer to that is yes, but I would just take that on notice to just double check. Okay, no, that's fine. Um, how much of the 334 million regional roads fund, how much of that 334 million is going to be spent in this financial year? 
Uh, Mr. Faraway, I might take that uh, while Mr. Fuller updates his note. Uh, as at February 2024, 236.4 million of the Regional Roads Fund is allocated to be spent over the next four years. 97.6 million of the fund is yet to be allocated. So, <clears throat> 230, what did you say, 236.4? Yep. So that's allocated uh, as of February, this, as of this month, yes. um, over the next four years? That's correct. Okay. So are you staging those projects over four years? Uh, the funding is staged okay. against the commitment. So how much will roll out the door in this financial year? I'd have to get a latest count on the commitments to the end of this financial year. We can take that on notice. Right. With regard to the $390 million emergency road fund, uh, has there been any underspend or what will, how will Transport for New South Wales manage underspend or delays from councils that cannot expend that money due to capacity constraints? So under the Regional Emergency Repair Fund, all councils have had the full $390 million uh, deposited uh, to them and they have four years to deliver that program. So uh, one of the things that uh, Minister Aitchison was very clear about was the fact that uh, we wanted that program to allow councils to deliver that work at their own pace and to enable them to prioritise those works and where they needed to build that capacity to ensure that those works could be carried out. So uh, we have a high level of confidence that, those, that the funds that have been made available to the local government will be able to be invested because they have an enormous amount of flexibility through till October 2027 to undertake the delivery of that funding. Thank you, Mr Fuller. Mr Murray, of the $334 million regional roads fund, uh, is there a business case required for those projects? Uh, I need to take that on notice. Okay. Is there, is there the possibility that some local government areas will miss out on funding from that fund? Again, unless my colleagues can assist on that, uh, we'd have to come back. I can confirm though that 24 million is the current financial year's allocation. Back to you. Okay, all right. Um, Eight minutes. It's like torture for the rest of you, isn't it? Um, uh, you got that on the record. <laughs> <laughs> no objection. Oh, dear, oh dear. Um, with regard us, to... Sorry. Okay, with regard to that fund then, Mr Murray, how much... Um, okay, w when will the $97.4 million be reviewed for allocation <laughs> that's left over in the Regional Roads Fund? Will there be an application process where councils can apply for that funding? Uh, yes, it's not. Uh, sorry, just for the record, 97.6. Uh, those projects will be under consideration and be announced in further state budgets. Right, okay. Um, with regard to that $97.6 million and the 230, uh, well, and the, the already allocated 236.4, that is done on an application basis, correct? So that funding is not, uh, dis, you know, is not dispersed or distributed or allocated based on LGA. Uh, my understanding is it's allocated to councils for works on local or regional ro roads, and other funding is allocated to Transport for New South Wales to conduct that work directly. It's only for new projects, though, isn't it? <coughs> That's my understanding. So new road projects, I've, I've been told that in many instances it is for roundabouts and intersections, it's not actually for repairs to existing roads or the upgrade of roads, it needs to be a new piece of infrastructure. I think what um, what the government was very clear about in the election commitment was that the Regional Emergency Repair Fund would be utilised for asset restor restoration and ongoing maintenance and the Regional Road Fund is used for uh, efficiency upgrades, uh, productivity upgrades and other upgrades that support uh, either economic uplift, housing, uh, other propositions in different areas. They uh, were all made as very clear election commitments. There hasn't been an application process uh, to uh, seek funding from that fund um, and they were prioritised on the basis of uh, commitments the government took into the election. So with regard to the 236.4 million that's been allocated, is that uh, 
Uh, are they those allocations? Have, have they been made public? Yes. Yes, they have. So, uh, is there a list on the Transport for New South Wales website that clearly outlines which projects um, that two hundred thirty-six point four million dollars is going towards? I I'd have to check that they're on the website, but uh, they've certainly been made very public. As I said, they were very firm election commitments yeah. uh, with a so, full outline so of what projects. In in the event that in the event that they are on a website, can you provide or notice the link to sure. where they are? Uh, and if they're not on the website, can you please provide that list to the committee? Yes, that's fine. And. Uh Certainly in looking at some of the projects that I have here in front of me, it does indicate, of course, that the policy is for new road projects. Some of those include uh, planning and design works for Gosford Bypass, uh, Bulleye Bypass, uh, Thornton Rail Bridge, Cutterjee Bridge. So there is a range of new project funding that's gone through that fund. Thank you, Mr Murray. Um, Waterfall Way, I don't know whether Ant or Mr. Weeks, I'm not sure. What is the um, current status of the Betterment Project MR76 Waterfall Way? Um, and that is that project, to my knowledge, for memory, is to improve the slope stability and slope stabilisation. Um, do we have an update on, on where that project is up to? Uh, by coincidence, I have um, a very good friend that lives at Thora who asked me exactly <laughs> the same question earlier, <laughs> earlier in the week. There, there has been some frustration that um, there, there continues to be you know, traffic management, lights, etc. Um, again, a very complicated job. Um, if you bear with me for one moment, I'll just look at my notes here. Um. That's right, whilst we're doing that, Mr. Murray, regarding road reclassification, there was $250 million that was quarantined towards the priority round, which I suspect has, oh, well, it would have been expended on transferring a handful of roads in 2022 and possibly 23, including the Orange uh, Northern Distributor. Can you advise how much of the $250 million that was quarantined was expended on reclassification and transfer and how much was then left over and not expended out of that priority round? I'm going to ask Mr Fuller to come in on this question, thank you. Sure. Um, the government was very clear during the election and part of the election commitment was to transfer uh, money from the road reclassification fund and to put that in the hands of local government, i.e. through the uh, Regional Emergency Repair Fund. So uh, part of the $390 million that that fund is uh, was <coughs> some of that money that was sitting, as you say, uh, quarantined, waiting uh, for works to occur. So that's been transferred. I would have to take on notice what we've spent to date in terms of those transfers. So in terms of that uh, that answer, Mr Fuller, the 250 was essentially put into the 390 fund, is what you're saying? Uh, no, the government was clear on the amount and I, I just double check, I think it was about 193 million, but uh, I might just um, have, take the opportunity to clarify that if we can. Yeah. So, okay. so my point is is that um, did all of the 250 million get transferred into the 390 million emergency fund? Uh, and if it was, who foot the bill to transfer the roads? Uh, no, it transfer? wasn't all of it. And there was an operational component retained by transport to consider some of those uh, early transfers. So a road like the Northern Distributor in Orange, it was the cost associated with transferring that road back to New South Wales, the cost in that and whatever arrangement you came to with Orange City Council, the cost was taken out of that $250 million. So we have an operational component that's been allocated. I believe Ms Fung might have the uh, details as to what went across into the Regional Emergency Repair Fund. I can confirm that $193 million went into the Emergency Road Repair Fund. Okay, all right. No worries at all. So any roads that were transferred, any roads that were transferred, and the funding throughout the priority round on that handful of roads, they're paid for, they're done, that's the end of it. I wouldn't say that's the end of it. As you identified earlier, oh, there's works that yeah, are required to bring those roads to a standard, and that's something that we will operationalise through our but standard that, that maintenance That will become budgets, an operational business as usual indeed. activity into the future. Okay. Um, with regard... Uh, Mr Murray, have you seen the road reclassification report? Uh, no, I have not. All right, I suggest you read it. Um, it's good reading. 
Um, with regard to the uh, Kempsey Armadale Road, um, there was originally obviously being undertaken by Armadale Council, but is there still a dedicated transport for New South Wales representative helping project <coughs> manage that project with council? Uh, there's been a lot of dedicated resource and effort to assist um, Armadale Council who have the larger chunk of the natural disaster recovery works, that's correct. Yep, so do you, th that person or that resource is still allocated to that project? Uh, we've had that individual uh, utilised and his skills um, a Andrew, little more broadly, it? yes, yeah. uh, on, on the northern rivers, uh, given the other impacts in the area, but he's, uh, he and others have certainly been supporting council. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is the end of uh, today. Our oh, government questions, yes, no. They are going to do that. Mr Donnelly. I just one. Thank you, Chair. Um, <laughs> so I just have one question through you, Chair, to Ms uh, Drover. Um, in answering a question earlier today, you said you had uh, instituted uh, some changes uh, on projects following the Coffs Harbour matter. Uh, can you please clarify your answer with respect to uh, the changes you mentioned? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think it's fair to say there's a range of different initiatives that we have implemented and are implementing across our infrastructure in place and also across the enterprise transport for New South Wales more broadly. Um, there are obviously um, initiatives that were done in relation to the, uh, the exact incident and of course there was a safety investigation and out of that came seven actions. I can confirm that all those actions and all the corrective action has been uh, closed out. Um, there is a program at Transport for New South Wales called Respect at Transport. Um, it's an enterprise-wide initiative. Um, it was actually rolled out a few days after um, this matter came to the attention of the project, um, completely independently of the incident. It was a pre-planned initiative. We are rolling that out right across transport and uh, particularly in my division, Infrastructure in Place. That program um, is about uh, bringing to people's attention um, the need for good behaviours, um, both within transport and with external stakeholders. And it also reinforces the need to report um, and take action when this occurs. So that initiative is being rolled out right across the organisation. Um, there's also been an engagement, a community engagement review um, that has been undertaken um, both for the Coffs Harbour project, but with broader implications for my division. Um, that's also been looking at setting behaviour standards um, that need to be uh, expected and maintained. Um, we're also, um, and look, it's fair to say that many of these initiatives um, are in train and, and obviously Miss Hicks is not across many of these initiatives because she's been on leave. Um, but I do want to reinforce that we are committed to making changes so that if this was ever to happen again, we mitigate the impacts and we manage, uh, better manage how we address um, incidents like this. Um, part of that engagement review um, has also included the fact that when we engage with stakeholders, and we need to recognise for many of the projects that we do, we are in putting our staff in situations um, that can be um, emotive. And whether that's dealing with community, um, Indigenous stakeholders, or property acquisition matters, we accept that this is often a difficult situation for our staff. Um, as the Secretary or someone mentioned earlier today, psychosocial risk is, is increasing. Um, there is now reporting across transport for New South Wales. Uh, along with our normal safety reporting, we also have now psychosocial reporting across the organisation. And it's at the divisional level, so each DEPSEC now knows um, which incidents are occurring within their division and can take action to, to address the rising. But there is in place um, a psychosocial uh, hazard management project. It's something that I initiated um, and raised with the Chief People Officer when I became aware of this incident. Um, we had conversations about this prior to the Australian um, article, so it wasn't in response to media. It was something that we needed, uh, we, we realised we need to do because of the rising risk um, in society and particularly um, impacts on our people at transport. 
So that project is uh, being developed. Um, it will go right across uh, transport for New South Wales, but with particular focus in my division uh, where we deliver projects. Um, I mentioned the community engagement review. Um, one of the things that I was particularly um, concerned about is that we're seeing in other industries statements of respect at the start of um, uh, interactions with, with stakeholders. I would like that instituted across Transport for New South Wales. And the thing that I have asked for is also a hold point. So at the end of any engagement with an external stakeholder, that there is actually a hold point where we check that there have been appropriate behaviours displayed through that engagement. Um, and uh, again, a hold point, a check, a very deliberate check that if there is any action that has arisen out of that engagement, it is documented and action is taken uh, against that. So that is something that we will implement uh, in my division, but hopefully uh, more broadly across transport. Um, earlier last year too, uh, we were looking at uh, various initiatives um, that address the culture in the construction industry more broadly. And this is a conversation that we've been having with uh, the Australian Contractors Association, but also Consult Australia. We are very, very committed to moving um, the, the culture in our industry. We accept it is not satisfactory and has been this way for too long. So in that regard, we are implementing what we call a 360 a project health tool across all our projects in infrastructure in place. And uh, importantly, the Coffs Harbour Bypass was actually one of the first projects that we trialled the new tool on last year, and that continues. And we are receiving some really positive benefits um, from that tool. We use a tool not just to test the health of the project from the, the client's perspective, Transport for New South Wales, but we're also doing it with our contractor and also the consulting, um, the design team on the project. So that we rolled out across all projects and infrastructure in place. We have trialled it though on a number of mega projects uh, already and that uh, was in 2023. Um, the other thing that we've been doing in the last year is working with the Culture um, Task Force, which is an initiative um, again that we're doing with industry. Um, and we're trialling that new pilot on one of our road projects in Sydney. Um, and uh, it's the first, uh, one of a few first trials uh, of that new culture standard uh, across Australia. So I just want to reiterate, there are many things that we are doing to address this incident. We appreciate and acknowledge and accept that many failings in the way the matter was dealt with. Um, but if I can give a commitment to Rochelle that we will fix the problem. Well, thank you for a very thorough and detailed answer, Ms. Drover. Thank you. Th thank you, uh, Ms. Drover. Is that the end of government questions? No. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for appearing today. Uh, as usual, the Secretary will be in touch in terms of any questions you've taken on notice and any supplementary questions from members. Thanks again. Uh, that's the end of our hearing today. Thank you.